Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to get the meeting underway. Uh, we've got a, a, a very busy schedule <clears throat> today and a very packed uh, two meetings or two days of meetings for uh, the Board of Regents. Uh, before we dive into this, I just want to uh, make a note that the, the board met earlier uh, this morning on a personnel matter. And as chair, I determined that the individual's right to privacy clearly exceeded the public's right to know and closed the session. Uh, additionally, uh, we did take roll call uh, at that time in an executive session, so we won't be doing that uh, here this morning. Uh, first, I wanted to, to start with uh, thanking President Cruzado and uh, her staff and her team here at Montana State University for uh, putting on uh, this this Regents meeting. Uh, the campus obviously looks very beautiful uh, and we know that there's a, a lot of work that goes into um, preparing for the, the Regents to come to the meeting and, and preparing for uh, what a lot of people are excited about, the Brawl of the Wild this weekend. So uh, thank you President Cruzado <laughs> for uh, welcoming us to your campus. I. Yeah. I also wanted to uh, welcome the Legislative uh, Education Interim Committee, which is uh, meeting alongside us uh, today and tomorrow here in the sub. Uh, they'll, they're having uh, their reoccurring meeting here on campus, and um, we will be spending some time with them tomorrow for, uh, for a couple hours. Um, in a joint session discussing a wide, wide range of different topics um, that I'm sure that will be productive and informative, uh, particularly talking about uh, resident student access, uh, something that this board has been working on uh, in partnership with uh, our legislators. We'll be talking about two-year education um, and some other initiatives that are, that are critical for uh, u university system and uh, some shared goals with the interim committee. Uh, we do have uh, a very full agenda ahead of us, but I wanted to make um, one announcement. I saw a, a former member of the Board of Regents uh, was here, uh, Regent uh, Major Robinson, if he could stand up. Somewhere. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, a presentation this morning from Ochi on uh, the 2019 fall enrollment numbers uh, across uh, the university system. Uh, and Ochi will also be uh, unveiling uh, the early part of the college and career access portal, as well as uh, do, sharing some updates on the academic approval process, a process that we've been working on through uh, through the ARSA committee and in partnership with the CAOs across the system for quite some time. So we're excited to see that this morning. We'll also hear a presentation on career and technical education through our two-year programs. Um, that was actually given uh, to the MUS two-year study commission, uh, legislative commission uh, for this interim period. Uh, but before we really dive in and get started, I'd like to take a moment to to recognize a couple individuals who exemplify the mission shared by all of us here today. And as all of you uh, know, collaboration with our K-12 schools is essential to what we do at the college level. And that boils down to what happens in the classroom. So I ask you all to please join me in passing along the board's congratulations and gratitude to Linda Rost, of Baker, Montana, who was recently named the 2020 Montana Teacher of the Year. <clears throat> Linda isn't with us here in Bozeman today, but I want to tell you a little bit about her. As a science teacher at, at Baker High uh, out in Fallon County, Linda is passionate about college and career readiness. She is also committed to ongoing professional development. Linda has a master's degree in science education from MSU and is working towards a, a PhD currently. 
Teachers like Linda are critical to our state's future and we thank Linda and all the teachers who serve our rural communities for the essential work uh, that they do. This board discussed uh, the crisis in rural education uh, a couple years ago up at Haver and what we need to do as a system and what we need to do as a state to prepare teachers to go out into our rural communities to be high quali highly qualified teachers. And I want to congratulate MSU Bozeman on a new exciting program that, that they brought to campus to bring more teachers like Linda out to rural Montana. MSU and its partners, including the Office of Public Instruction, were recently awarded $6.2 million for an innovative online program to recruit, recruit train, and mentor dozens of high quality educators to work in K-12 schools across rural Montana. This includes a $3.1 million grant from the U.S. Department of Education and more than $3.1 million in matching funds and services from nearly a dozen partner organizations across the state. The five-year project will educate a total of 78 teachers targeting individuals who live in a rural area, already have a bachelor's degree, and are motivated to make a career change to become a teacher. And one of the things I think is most exciting about this program is that the participants will have their tuition and fees paid and will receive a living wage stipend, allowing them to study full time and to complete a semester of student teaching to earn their master's degree. The participants must commit to teaching for three years in high needs rural school in Montana. Please join me in congratulating all who worked so hard to bring this important opportunity to Montanans. And this includes MSU education professor Ann Eubank, Tricia Seifert, head of the MSU Department of Education, and co-principal investigators for the project, Jennifer Lubeck and Jane Downey. A big thank you also goes out to uh, Superintendent Artson and the Montana Office of Public Instruction and your project team. We look forward to seeing the fruits of this project come to life in our rural schools. And finally, I would like to offer the board's congratulations to Dr. Beth Weatherby, Chancellor from the University of Montana Western. Dr. Weatherby was recently named the Montana Ambassador Mike Malone Educator of the Year. The Ambassador Awards honors individuals who made an outstanding contribution to economic development in Montana. And as most of you know, Dr. Weatherby championed and has stewarded Experience One program at the University of Montana with much success, uh, which allows students to take a single course at a time in a condensed block of three hours a day for 18 days. This flexibility makes returning to school more feasible, more for non-traditional students and allows for intensive hands-on courses where students gain experience in the field. Thank you, Dr. Weatherby uh, and all of your team who are bringing this unique and innovative opportunity to Montana students. And with those introductions, um, we're excited for a, a very productive uh, couple days, and I wanted to turn it over to our, our host uh, this week, President Crusado. Yes. Thank you so much, um, Regent Lozar. Good morning, everybody, and good morning um, again, Mr. Chair, Regents, Commissioner Christian, Governor Bullock's representative, Provost Harvard, um, our faculty leaders, the colleagues from all our campuses, good morning and welcome to your university, Montana State. It has been a very busy two years since we last welcomed the Board of Regents to our campus, and we have many exciting achievements and highlights to share with you today. If you remember, in 2018, we celebrated our 125th anniversary 
by inviting the people of Montana to join us throughout the year at events marking that milestone, including lectures, open houses, and of course, our festive uh, Bobcat birthday bash. And here's to the next 125 years of excellence. Also two years ago, we underwent reaccreditation with the Northwest Commission of Colleges and Universities. MSU has been accredited with the commission since 1932. And among the commendations that MSU received, one was the campus-wide adoption and adherence to our seven-year strategic plan. This year, MSU adopted a new seven-year strategic plan, choosing promise, and we have left on your desk copies of our new strategic plan. It sets forth three intentional focus goals and our plan, we decided to title it Choosing Promise because it reflects our commitment to our land grant values. At Montana State University, we do not chase prestige, we choose promise. So the first intentional focus of our strategic plan centers on transformational learning experiences and creating outstanding educational outcomes for all students. Outstanding outcomes for students begin with welcoming them to MSU in the first place. Notably, we have seen records in enrollment and other key student performance indicators, and this false enrollment of 16,766 students is the second highest in university's history. But this is what we have learned. It is not about recruiting students. If we do not commit to them staying in school, and graduating on time, we are not doing our job. MSU this last year awarded a record 3,362 undergraduate degrees, up roughly 500 degrees over this time just 500 years ago. When we break down the numbers by degree type, this is what you can see. We're heading in the right direction. Not only we have all-time highs in terms of, back, of bachelor's degrees, at the bottom of the chart, you'll see that MSU has doubled the number of doctoral degrees, which is a huge lift on the part of our faculty. Our graduation rates are also increasing. Our six-year uh, graduation rate has moved up to 56.1%, which is up more than seven points in the past decade. But I call your attention, the most exciting part for me is the gains in the four-year and the five-year rates, which register an impressive 10% increase uh, in each of those categories. How do we do that? In large measure, we have been talking about uh, our signature uh, program, the Freshman 15 which incentivizes students not only to add uh, pounds to their waistline, as I tell them when we welcome them, but to add rigor to their schedules, to take more credits per semester, to graduate sooner and with less college debt. Freshman 15 is also working. We have seen consistent growth in the number of credits taken by each student. MSU's increases in graduation and retention rates have come without restricting admission standards, which fills my heart with joy because it means each and every one of our campuses can do the same thing. Consistent with our mission, your land-grant university promotes open access to higher education, welcoming the sons and daughters of the working families of America. This is what choosing promise means. On the topic of student debt, MSU seeks to educate our students about responsible borrowing, repeating the advice to borrow only what is needed, not all that you're eligible for. And back in 2014, we decided to launch a new effort, which, uh, as you can, uh, which we call the Know Your Debt Letter. Um, here's a model that we used back in 2014 for that um, student, Clay Christian. Um, He's persistent, he's been here since 2014. But, um, but we, 
We want, we send him this letter to that end, right? We want for you to know your debt and, inf and to be informed of important programs and options at MSU and at the federal stu uh, student loan in terms of conditions. So this is what we, what we have seen, that um, students, because of that, are taking out less money or borrowing less than their peers, about $800 less than, the, than their peers, and they default less or among the lowest in the nation. So what you see in the graphic is about 51% of all graduates borrow, right? Not all of them, 57% in the nation. They borrow less money, about $800 less than the nation, and then they are really committed to paying back those dollars. Um, because of the Know Your Debt letter, just this last week, uh, Karina Beck was uh, invited to a group of, uh, of institutions that attended a, a meeting at the White House um, to discuss the future of financial success um, in the nation. I will also mention the Know Your Debt letter that Montana State University has been using is not copyrighted. Other institutions in the nation are taking full advantage of it. And if uh, any of our peers uh, or any of our colleagues here would like to learn more about the letter and how we uh, uh, work with it, we'll be happy to help. Of course, no program exemplifies MSU's commitment to access as the Hilleman Scholars Program. This year, we welcomed Hard to believe. We wel welcome our fourth cohort. And come next spring, we will graduate our first cohort of Hilleman Scholars this coming May, with the exception of three Hilleman Scholars who will not graduate in May because they will be walking this December, completing their degrees in 3.5 years. As you know, the Hilleman Scholars recalls Maurice Hilleman's own story by providing an opportunity to Montana students who might not otherwise have considered college. The students receive guidance and financial support in exchange for their grit and their commitment to mentoring future Hillemans. And thanks to the partnership with MSU Extension, we have found no shortage of promise and potential all across the state. That was our first cohort second cohort, third cohort, fourth cohort. Also, the Hilleman Scholars Program was the beneficiary of a $1 million endowment this past year, courtesy of Hilleman's widow, Lorraine, and his former employer, Merck Pharmaceuticals. So MSU this last year has been ranked on a number of lists, including earning a spot on Forbes list of America's top colleges and best values colleges, and we were ranked among the nation's best universities by US News and World, Support, and World um, Report by focusing on transformational educational experiences for all our students. Which then brings me to some specific cases, like for example, Trishina kills pretty, uh, pretty enemy, steps up, uh, to her family and her culture by um, making outstanding contributions to her communities, just as Lila Brown was recognized as one of nine African-American leaders in Pacific Northwest. Other students have been, that have been recognized with national awards include our latest Truman Scholar, uh, Zariah Tolman, a major in cell biology, neuroscience, and biochemistry. Our UDL scholar for this year, Brianna, Brianna Bullshows, a major in microbiology and pre-medicine. And of course, what to say about our four Goldwater scholars that uh, were announced this last spring. Ellen Brooks and Brendan Pelkey from chemical engineering, Carter McIver from mechanical engineering, and microbiology ma major, uh, Garrett uh, Peters. I want to for the audience to understand, on any given year, four nominations is the maximum number that any institution can submit. 
This is the second time in the last five years where Montana State University has scored four out of score gold water nominations and recipients. Because of that, MSU is among the top institutions in the country for the number of Goldwater Scholars it has produced with 74, which puts us in position number nine in the nation, tied with Johns Hopkins. And we are third among the Western states, just behind only Caltech and Stanford. Here are some of other scholarship totals for the past decade. 27 Goldwater Scholars, three Rhodes Scholarships, eight Udall Scholarships, six Truman Scholarships, 19 Fulbright Awards, two Gates Cambridge Fellowships, 40 National Science Foundations Awards, Schwarzman and Marshall Scholarships, and other information that right now it's embargo, but it's more good news for Montana State University, and thank you so much, Ilse Marie Lee, for the hard work you do with these students. Of course, great students need outstanding faculty members, and that's exactly what we have in two of our wonderful faculty members, Tracy Duggar and graduate teaching assistant Jeff Pashnik, who were both recognized with national awards by the North American Colleges and Teachers of Agriculture for their excellence. Well done, and thank you. Intentional focus number two, the second intentional focus of our strategic plan, focuses on improving lives and society through MSU's research, creativity, and scholarship. What we're challenging ourselves with this second intentional focus is not just research for the sake of research, right? We're asking ourselves what is the relevancy, right? What is that research, that scholarship, that, that creativity that can have a positive impact in our communities? This year, MSU set a record for expenditures on research and scholarly activity of $138.8 million. That marks a 9.5 increase over the previous year's expenditures and the six years in a row that MSU research expenditures have topped $100 million. Last December, we were informed that MSU regained its Carnegie designation as an institution with very high research activity, the highest of high of Carnegie classifications. MSU is one of just 130 universities nationwide and the only one in the region to be included in that category. In January, we welcome Shri Kalabachwa as our new Vice President and Dean of Agriculture. Dr. Bachwa comes to us from North Dakota State. She's an expert in precision agriculture, and in her role, Dr. Bachwa provides leadership to the College of Agriculture and also to the Montana Experimental Stations. And just a few weeks ago, you heard me introduce uh, um, Dr. Jason Carter, our new Vice President of Research, Economic Development, and Graduate Education. Dr. Carter came to us from Michigan Technological University, and he already, <laughs> in just those few weeks, he has already brought vision, energy, and excitement to MSU's research and graduate education. We are so excited to have him on the MSU team. He's with us here today. Earlier this month, Talking about research, MSU was one of 10 universities to be invited to the White House Summit on the Joint Committee on the Research Environment. And as part of this effort, MSU will provide feedback and help to shape the country's policies on research relative to safety, inclusivity and integrity, and workload. Our new strategic plans, as I said, calls us to focus on impactful, and relevant research with a specific emphasis to address what we call the grand challenges of Montana. Here's just a sample of some of those. A $20 million award from NSF EPSCOR to advance research in water quality. A 
$1.5 million grant from our statewide IMBRI program. This is a program, it's a network uh, that includes all the campuses, including our tribal colleges, and we make investments in biomedical research capacity and workforce development throughout the state. MSU was included in the iChange network, an APLU-led effort to help universities recruit and retain more inclusive, diverse faculty in STEM fields. A $10.7 million grant to help reduce health disparities in native and rural communities. And pioneering work examining the very origins of life on Earth by studying the hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. Say what you want, but those two researchers are having fun. Right? <laughs> our faculty has received many national honors, just like our students, like Eric Grumstrom, who earned the Presidential Early Career Award, Sharon Neufeld, who won an NSF Early Career Award, Ian Van Collar from the School of Film and Photography, whose photographs illuminate the world's diminishing glaciers, and Eric Fund, a legendary figure at Montana State from the School of Music who received a special citation in the American Prize for composition. Our faculty in the Jake Japs College of Business and Entrepreneurship are showcased in MSU's latest television commercial, which debuted earlier this month. Here's Brent Russo, who literally transforms the proverbial elevator pitch into an innovative pedagogical tool. My mission as a professor in the Jake Jabs College of Business and Entrepreneurship at Montana State University is to train students how to take their passionate ideas from elevator pitch. We want to build an app that completely eliminates scalping and fraud from the ticket buying experience. Ascent Montana is here for good. We are a lifestyle brand that gives back to our U.S. military. To product. to people. We teach them to think outside the classroom and the traditional boardroom so they can innovate, inspire, and accomplish their ultimate goal, success. So cheers to these entrepreneurs and kudos to MSU filmmakers and the marketing team uh, for creating this commercial. Thanks to the support of the regions, um, two of our faculty members received the highest designation last year uh, of the MUS. Um, Neil Cornish for his contribution to the Nobel Prize in physics for the detection of gravitational waves. And Kathy Whitlock, who was elected as a member of the Distinguished U.S. National Academy of Sciences for her work on vegetation, fire, and climate history on the Western U.S. And because of our emphasis on research, I'm very happy to invite you uh, to join us to this wonderful event. This March, March the 26th through the 28th, Montana State University will host the National Council on uh, Undergraduate Research. This will be a major event that will bring more than 4,000 undergraduate scholars and, and uh, faculty members to our campus and from across Montana. We have reached out to every campus of the Montana University system. We have reached out to all our tribal college partners. We have reached out also to our private uh, universities in the state. We want to see them all here. In conjunction with ANCHOR, MSU has designated this as the Year of Undergraduate Research. Understand the acronym there? How clever. Year of Undergraduate Research, uh, or YUR, where what we are doing throughout the year is that we are celebrating events, uh, major gatherings, and all of this will be culminating in March. Which then brings us to our third intentional focus, which is on expanding mutually beneficial and responsive engagement for the advancement of our state. How do we do that? With the approval of this board, we named our center 
focused on the American West in honor of the late Ivan Doig, a Montana native and the Dean of Western Writers, whose papers are housed in the MSU library, where they have been joined by other notable acquisitions, including the collected papers of conservationist Frank Craighead and from the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, making available to the public vast resources for the benefit of the people of Montana. Another example of engagement also approved by this Board of Regents was, is the Life Scholars. The Life Scholars program provides a fully inclusive post-secondary college experience for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities is one of our most inspirational programs. MSU is reaching farther across Montana than ever before. Also, thanks to the approval of this board of programs like the newly established Dan Scott Ranch Management Program, which will help sustain the agricultural heritage of the Northern Great Plains. And what about other examples of engagement uh, from our state's American Indian communities with whom MSU has been collaborating to develop truly equitable research partnerships with our tribal collaborators? From Montana communities where MSU's efforts are helping to develop housing for rural teachers and fill rural teaching jobs as we were just discussing. From our own faculty who organized the inaugural Dyslexia and Innovation Symposium, a two-day symposium designed to raise awareness and change the narrative around dyslexia. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Conger and Sarah Pennington. And, of course, when we talk about engagement, the world is our campus and, and the MSU College of Arts and Architecture students help build a much needed kiln for a community arts center in the city of Curitiba, Brazil. And Dean Adams is with us also this morning. Thank you so much for helping us with that. We get to the world, but we also want to make sure that in terms of engagement, we take the next steps toward expanding our university shared governance model with the creation of an all staff council this fall. It's the combination of the MSU professional council and the MSU staff council. It's 33 members promote a positive and collaborative work environment, professional development, and effective communication. These are our partners. And we also take time to recognize the incredible work that our staff uh, accomplishes. We have, of, in the last uh, few years, uh, inaugurated new programs like Celebrating Milestones in Service, where we celebrate individuals who accomplish a five-year anniversary. This last year, we recognize anything from individuals who have been with us for five years to uh, Jerry Marks, who just celebrated 50 years of working at MSU Extension in Missoula, nonetheless. <laughs> and of course, our Pure Gold program, which is a wonderful opportunity where every Wednesday we sent out an email to faculty, student, and staff in all our four campuses, seven agricultural centers, and all Extension offices, telling them about one individual who has proven that uh, they have excelled. And perhaps, one of the most uh, important events for me and that I'm very fond of in terms of engagement is this tradition. Each summer now for eight years, MSU administrators, including the commissioner, faculty, students, staff, and alumni have traveled across portions of the state by bus to meet people and to learn about the communities that we serve. Just to give you a glimpse of the last two years, in the summer of 2018, we traveled to northeastern corner of the state, learning from community and agricultural leaders along the way, from Lewistown and Jordan to Plentywood and Fort Peck, and all the way, I cannot see it there, but we got to Freud, Montana. <laughs> <clears throat> that was the follow the arts and the history of northeastern Montana. Here we are with some of the leaders there. And this past summer, we visited the northwestern corner of the state learning about the communities and economies of the mountain region. It is a long road, but the people we meet and the things we learn about Montana's communities make the trip well worth it year after year. This trip is always a valuable opportunity for us to tour our state, 
to get out of Bozeman and to learn more about Montana's people, culture, history, and economy. This is over eight years. We have been able to be all over the state. As you can see, there are just three counties we have yet to pass through. And don't worry, Beaverhead, Tool, and Liberty counties know that we're working on getting up there to see you soon. Talking about engagement, next week as the nights become longer, we will celebrate another annual tradition, Lights on Montana Hall. The campus community and our friends are invited to gather around the spirit statue on Wednesday for festive music, holiday treats, and the lighting of our iconic Montana Hall for the holiday season. We light Montana Hall on three special occasions for these um, the darkest nights of the year, as we like to say. We also light Montana Hall uh, every February 16 on Founders Day, and we light Montana Hall every time the Bobcats defeat the rivals across the divide. <laughs> Another form of engagement comes through our, foundings fund uh, our foundation's fundraising efforts. This past year, the university completed its capital campaign in grand style, far surpassing our original goal of 300 million. Our campaign, what it takes, it took you. We raised $413 million. <clears throat> And every dollar goes to the benefit of our students, our faculty, and our staff. I'm very proud of that. Now, the past two years have also brought significant change to the physical appearance of our campus. As you may have noticed, just outside the doors of this building, in December, we inaugurated the Norm S. Bjornsson um, building, made possible by Norm's generous gift of $50 million to this university. It is only one of of 10 buildings in Montana certified lead platinum, and it uses half the energy per square foot as many other buildings in campus, in spite of its 100, 110,000 square feet. We have a new construction zone, site of our future American Indian home, a $20 million project made possible by generous um, donors for the benefit of our um, native um, students. And I want to publicly recognize the incredible help of former region major Robinson in helping us reach out to the state and consult with our elders as to what will this building should look like and accomplish. Our rendezvous, our new rendezvous dining pavilion, which opened last summer, has become one of the busiest uh, places on campus, especially around lunch hour. Rendezvous has already won many awards for its design, its cuisine, serving many foods from Montana farms, ranches, and featuring incredible bacon and pork meat from healthy pigs raised by our very young 4-H Montanans. <laughs> Nearing completion is Highlight Hall, our newest residence hall, which will be open next fall. The six-story residence hall will house up to 510 students. And finally, my goodness, we wrap up the tour just a few steps west of here with Romney Hall. Have you heard those words before? <laughs> Thanks to the support of many, many, many people during um, the years. And I want to publicly thank Commissioner uh, Christian, Governor Bullock, our legislators, and so many of you who will help transform this beautiful building into a classroom facility that will serve about a thousand students every hour. So with the weekend fast approaching, I want to finish my presentation, uh, giving you uh, a little bit about Bobcat Athletics. The first highlight, do you remember our Board of Regents in March where I was not able to attend the breakfast because we had a collapse, right? Our roofs collapsed in our um, north and south um, uh, gym facilities and now those have been temporarily replaced by some domes. Um, our students, faculty and on staff have a place to exercise well, a large committee is thinking about how should we rebuild this facility in the future. 
Our university will come back. Bobcat great Danny Sprinkle as head uh, basketball coach. And already our men's basketball captured the number one spot on ESPN Sports Center when we played against Greensboro this last weekend. Here for you, the last five seconds of the game. Bobcats in blue. They get the ball into Miller's hands. He sprints up the floor, down to five seconds. Miller driving inside, shoots and scores! Oh, get back on D, get back on D. Great finish with his left hand. They're not gonna call timeout. No Here fouls. Frey for the win. Oh, yeah. you're kidding me! Makes it in! Oh my! Harold Frey makes it in oh, from my half court. Goodness. Montana State wins it! <laughs> that Harold Frey, good and gracious. Oh. Because our students are, are special, we want to talk about the future with this Bobcat Athletics Complex. Uh, thanks to the generosity of many, we raised $18 million to raise this two-story addition to the north end of the Bobcat Stadium. The Bobcat um, the Stadium addition is expected to open ahead of the 2021 football uh, season. Our student athletes have Gardner academic honors from the NCAA for our men's um, skiing and women's tennis squads, all American honors for football players, Troy Anderson and Lewis Kitt, and all Big Sky honors for Tyler Hall and Harold Frey uh, from men's basketball. Bobcat track and field standout Alex Lewis was one of 126 student athletes nationwide who received an NCAA's postgraduate scholarship, and Alec Nuring and Chris Bianchini were named to the Google Cloud Academic All-American Division I cross-country and field teams. From our volleyball team, Aliza Rizzo and Kelsey White, along with assistant coach Cole Ayasi, were chosen to participate in the 2019 U.S. Women's National Team Open Tryouts. They'll compete against more than 200 other athletes for a spot in the national team programs. And on March 20, I mean 11 to 14, MSU will host the 2020 NCAA Skiing Championships uh, at Bridger Bowl and uh, Bullhart Ranch. And then of course, the brawl, the brawl of the wild. That was an incredible um, game last year. And on Saturday, we will all be there to cheer for our team, and we will wish our competitors good luck, and we know it will be a very exciting game. Go Cats! <laughs> so I want to finish here. This is our freshman class this year. Over 3,300 students that have put their hopes and their dreams in Montana State University. But that doesn't happen without the support of this Board of Regents the Commissioner of Higher Education, and the people of the state of Montana. So with that, I just need to say my gratitude to each and every one of you for helping us be in the university that we are. But the most important part is welcome to your university, Montana State. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you, President Cruzado. Um, Boy, much to say about a, a fantastic presentation, but I just want to take just one more minute. Um, we could highlight the highlights of your highlights, um, but I think let's give President Cruzado one more round of applause. <laughs> We're going to move on. Um, to approve uh, the minutes from our last couple meetings. But before we do that, I just wanted to uh, make note that um, we are joined today, this morning, um, by uh, Dr. Austin um, from MSU, the Faculty Senate Chair. So welcome uh, to the meeting, Dr. Austin. Uh, so at this point in time, we want to approve the minutes. Uh, and I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, the minutes as noted, September 11th and 12th and October 16th. So moved. moved by Regent Sheehy. Any discussion uh, from the members of the board? From the campuses? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. All right, we're going to hand this over to 
uh, Commissioner Christian, but before we do that, we have a, a special uh, guest with us uh, today, and I'd like him to, to come up to the podium. This morning, we are joined by Major General Matt Quinn, the Adjutant General for Montana, for uh, a special announcement. Commissioner Christian, um, board members, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for giving the Montana National Guard an opportunity to spend a couple minutes with you. Um, I'm Brigadier General Jeff Ireland, the director of the Joint Staff for the Montana National Guard, and I'd like to introduce our Adjutant General, Major General Matt Quinn. We are here today to uh, provide a special recognition to the Commissioner for all of the support that he's provided for the new tuition uh, waiver. So we have a uh, medal to present to the commissioner, and I will read the citation. Department of the Military Affairs, State of Montana, Office of the Adjutant General. This is to certify that the Adjutant General of the State of Montana has awarded the Adjutant General's Distinguished Patriot Medal to Mr. Clay Christian for exceptional support provided to the Montana National Guard and the Department of Military Affairs. Mr. Christian's leadership, dedication, and commitment to furthering secondary educational opportunities directly contributed to the Montana Board of Regents approval of a tuition waiver for all Montana National Guard members. The waiver assists the Montana National Guard with recruiting and retention efforts, increases career opportunities for soldiers and airmen, and helps promote enrollment into Montana educational institutions. The support and dedication Mr. Christian provided to the Montana National Guard exemplifies his recognition of those who serve and also his strong belief in Montana's higher educational programs. The singularly distinctive accomplishments and dedication of Mr. Christian reflect great credit upon himself, the Montana University System, the Montana National Guard, and the great state of Montana. Given under my hand in the city of Helena this 21st day of November 2019, Signed, Matthew T. Quinn, Major General, Montana National Guard, the Adjutant General. Would you like a picture with the three of you? Oh, sure. I have some more to do, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And as a further recognition, General Quinn is now presenting a challenge coin, a two-star challenge coin, to each one of the board members. Uh, this is a pretty coveted uh, piece of uh, metal that signifies the excellence that individuals provide in support in their, for their military. And I'm not sure if you really fully understand the significance that this waiver brings to our organization. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to uh, further extend a benefit to those who serve our great uh, state and our nation. It fulfills a gap. It encourages more of our soldiers and airmen to get further on their education. It helps with our recruiting. It helps with our retention. And most importantly, it gives back to Montana. It allows us to educate. It allows us to give more opportunities for jobs. It allows us to keep people here. And most importantly, it allows us to recruit and retain soldiers and airmen in your National Guard. Without soldiers and airmen in our organization, we are not able to fulfill our state and our federal missions. We stand the chance of losing force structure. We stand the chance of losing full-time jobs. We stand the chance of losing uh, for Montana. So I can't tell you how much this means to all of us, and we are so appreciative of what you've done for us. And this is a legacy that will live on and complement our state and our National Guard for many years to come. So on behalf of the entire National Guard, the men and women of the Montana Air and Army National Guard, uh, we salute you for your continued commitment to Montana's service members. Thank you so much. Thank you, General Quinn. 
I'm sure you weren't quite aware of that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you have opportunity to give a very long speech about your award, or you can do the commissioner's report. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm speechless, which usually doesn't happen to me. Um, I don't love surprises, so I thank my staff for that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, truly, I'm, I'm humbled. Um, thank you, and I, I do believe um, in the cause. This will uh, help not only uh, the Guard, but the Montana University system. So I, I'm very, very appreciative of the honor, so thank you. Um, I will go into the Commissioner's Report, though, because I think it's probably time. I um, want to uh, first start by uh, saying thanks to you, uh, Chair Lozar, and, and uh, Vice Chair Tuss for all the, the extra hours uh, of late. Um, I really appreciate the dedication and I want to thank the entire board for uh, their time and attention to public higher education in the state of Montana. I, I really honestly don't think uh, the public can ever truly appreciate the hours, time, dedication that uh, you all, all give us uh, as part of this system each and every week and uh, we thank you for that time and attention very much. So I will dig in. We've got a lot to cover today. Uh, we uh, talked a little bit about uh, what's on the agenda for tomorrow. I think that'll be very productive to have uh, the interim legislative committee here. Looking forward to that. I uh, want to also extend my gratitude and thanks and honestly congratulations to President Cruzado. Uh, I was going to mention some of the highlights but uh, there's uh, that, that, that uh, presentation uh, really captures the spirit of what's going on here at uh, Montana State and congratulations to you and your team for all the, the hard work. So I want to dive in uh, on the sort of bulk of what we're, we're going to address over the next few days. Uh, you know at the heart of what we've talked about over the last few years now has been the uh, resident student access um, initiative and how do we get there. I think we've talked a lot about uh, the notion of a portal. We've made uh, promises at the legislature. We've talked a lot about uh, that idea with this committee. We've talked about it on campuses. So why do we need to do it, I think, is the fundamental question that we, we tried to ask ourselves. We're, we're not at the state office in the business of trying to uh, roll things out just for the sake of doing something. We want to add value where we can and when we can to the state and, and our student population around the state. Um, I think we've talked over the last few years about the economic need to see more students in the Montana University system. I think uh, even linking back to the governor's future ready workforce uh, proposals, uh, numbers we looked at at one of our last meetings. We can't meet any of those workforce needs if we don't capture and retain a larger percentage of Montana students. Um, we've talked a lot about the demographics across the country. Um, We've talked about them certainly in Montana. The, there's less students coming out of high school and that, that will continue. Um, and it doesn't line up well with the needs of our state and our country. When you look at uh, all states uh, around the country saying we need, we have workforce shortages, we need more workforce demand and yet uh, less students coming into higher education. I've said anecdotally over the years that uh, the last few years, what, a, what an anomaly Bozeman has been, and uh, some recent data would would uh, put some credibility behind that statement. Um, which he reported at our last meeting that across the country, higher education has seen for the last six years, semester over semester, decline. Um, and that's remarkable given the workforce shortages that we have. Some of that's driven by the economy in itself. Um, people can come out of school and find higher paying jobs in a 2% unemployment market than maybe they could otherwise. But it will have long-term effects that we need to deal with. Um, and, and, and I guess back to my other point, it, Bozeman is an anomaly. Uh, recently recognized uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Education as one of the top 25 institutions in the country for growth over the last 10 years. That uh, really sums up uh, what's happened here. And I think that presentation this morning tells you how it's happened here. Uh, and so we embrace that, but that doesn't mean that we're done. We've got a lot of work to do across the system and we've got a lot of work to do around the state and we've got a lot of work to do helping students uh, meet their hopes and, and dreams moving forward. While we've done a lot to reach the sort of normal college seeking students uh, in our state and across our region, 
there is still a lot more that needs to be done to reach what I've referred to over the past as this 45%. The group of students uh, that stop out after high school with almost no contact with higher education, no on-ramp. Um, that cohort alone this year is 3,700 students. Those are students that we need in higher education, but they're also students that we need in Montana's workforce at higher skill levels. And we can't get there unless we truly attract more of those students and we find a path to help them succeed. So back to the portal, because I think it's a critical link in how we can reach that 45%. You know, it's sometimes been uh, referred to as the hidden curriculum. We actually talked about it at breakfast a bit, sort of the morass of what it takes to get into school and, and succeed through that freshman year and beyond. That, that goes to things like ACT testing, obtaining your transcripts, getting through the admissions process, FAFSA, scholarships, course planning, registration, vaccination records, the list goes on and on and on. And in Montana, for our high schools around the state, they really have 24 options out there that they can choose from, public and private, uh, tribal, uh, and, and part of the Montana University system. And for some of us uh, and, and, and some students that have a network that can help them through that, uh, it's possible. But I also think that there's a lot of students, maybe first generation students or don't have the parental support uh, staff behind them that can help them uh, get through that process. And so what we hope to do with the portal is really try to level that playing field, to reach a broader section of students have a spot where they can come to start to find out information about what interests them. If, if they find interest, where are they available in the Montana University system? If they want to pursue those, how do I do it? What financial aid is available? What resources do we have to help them succeed? And I think we can do that. And I think that the portal uh, really has, has a hope of simplifying the process, both for high school counselors, which are overwhelmed, um, for parents and for students to find sort of that one-stop shop uh, that they can look for these advantages. And so what we are working on, obviously this has been uh, a pretty monumental effort from OCHI. I honestly think it's one of the most important things that we've undertaken, certainly in my time in higher education, and I appreciate all the tireless hours of our, our staff, your staff at the commissioner's office, um, working with partners around the state. And I want to mention just a few of those. Uh, of recent, we have uh, rekindled a, a long-standing partnership with uh, Reach Higher Montana and the Student Assistance Foundation, something that we've been intertwined with for a very long time, but we've entered into a, a new MOU uh, where they will help us with sort of the backbone of this portal process. They have the expertise, uh, they have the planning, the research, research, the marketing, and the communication staff to help us achieve a project of this scope and size. Um, and so I'd like to, if I could, welcome uh, our Deputy Commissioner Brock Tessman and President of Reach Higher Montana, Kelly Creswell, uh, up to the podium and they will give you a little sneak preview of where we're headed with the portal. And we hope it's a little more exciting than that one at the Legislative uh, <laughs> Commission a couple weeks ago that <clears throat> Tyler did. <laughs> he looks away. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, you stole my joke, uh, but at any rate, uh, Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, absolutely an honor to be here. Uh, I, I get to stand here with, uh, with uh, Kelly Cresswell, and we'll, we'll chat with you for just a couple minutes about the portal. Uh, however, as you mentioned, this really does reflect uh, countless hours, a lot of time and energy uh, on behalf of a number of folks. and, and Truly, the team was big, but in particular, I would like to recognize my colleague, uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, who really drove this and got us uh, to this point. So, uh, Tyler, uh, thanks for letting me stand up here, but I, I appreciate it. Uh, this is a big deal. Uh, this is a really big deal. Resident student access, um, I don't think we have a higher priority uh, in this state. And, and in my opinion, this is about... Uh, believing in the potential of every part of this land, of this state, and in every kind of student that we can serve. Um, it's about the ability of higher education to transform a student's life, the life of their family, their community, and, and actually ultimately to drive the next chapter in Montana's uh, economic life as well. So there's transformative power here, and you might ask, well, how does a college and career planning 
portal accomplish that. It's not a silver bullet, it's not a magic bullet, um, but it's an important part of the recipe. And in my opinion, this gets more information in front of students and their families earlier. It makes that information easier to access, and importantly, it makes that information easier to act upon. And this is just a start. We have everything, if you can scroll down just a little bit, uh, Heather. We have everything uh, uh, laid out into broad categories, all the way from tools that would help you plan your future in general, identifying specific career options through Montana Career Pathways, partnerships with the Department of Labor and Industry. Importantly for us, outlining all of the academic options across the entire state of Montana, from advanced degrees to associate's degrees to certificates and credentials. And then ultimately, we know that we need to explain to students and their families how to pay for school. At the center of all this uh, could be some additional tools down the road. A tool that helps students transfer from one institution to another. A tool that helps students sign up for dual enrollment courses while they're still in high school. And I think perhaps at the center of it all, a centralized application process. You may hear about it a little bit later, but I'll take this opportunity to, to mention that we have reached uh, the end of a pretty extensive process, uh, an RFP process, a competitive process, and in liaison, uh, a company with uh, a great deal of experience in really complex systems, the California State University system, uh, the Hawaii University system, uh, has been identified as the vendor that will help us build this centralized application process that will again be a way for students to access information and opportunity uh, in one place and make it easier for them to understand how uh, the Montana University system can serve them in their next uh, academic and, and professional steps. So we're extremely excited about this, not just for students who are thinking about pursuing a bachelor's degree, but this is also really about that set of students that may not understand that in their neck of the woods, there's a two-year institution that offers an associate's degree or a credential or certificate that helps them on their way towards their next career goal and may make a tremendous amount of sense, both in terms of the return on investment and the way it fits with their personal and professional life. So this is truly about access to students and we have a great deal of belief in its potential. How did we come uh, to this point where we have uh, a, a portal that I think looks terrific and is increasingly functional? Well, if you do zoom back to November 4th uh, and you uh, were at the uh, Montana University System two-year commission meeting, you know that we started essentially with a Microsoft Word document that had a circle on it and about six or seven lines of basic text. Um, <laughs> A good start, but in order to make this work, uh, we needed to partner with folks who've been doing uh, this kind of work for a very long period of time. And it is a privilege to stand here uh, with Kelly Creswell, Executive Director of Reach Higher Montana, the mission of Reach Higher Montana, right? right? To help students strategically pursue educational opportunities. This could not be a better match, and I'm really proud to hear what you have to say, Kelly, and to continue working with you on this portal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Lozar, Regents, Commissioner Christian, and guests. Uh, as Brock said, our mission very much aligns with the work of the Montana University System and all of our education partners statewide. And our partnership with all of you is not new. Um, we have partnered a lot over the years, uh, both Reach Higher Montana and Student Assistance Foundation. We share a board member, Bree Rogers. Prior to that, Casey Lozar was our shared board member. Um, we have a, a long-standing memorandum of understanding that guides our work. We used to share space. Um, as we move forward on the portal project, we've already formed some collaborative teams with staff from the Commissioner's Office and the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, there's lots of room for additional voices on those collaborative teams to build out the content for this site. I think the strength of Reach Higher Montana as a nonprofit organization is that uh, we have spent all of our work being student and parent friendly and student and parent facing. This site at its current uh, point would not be where it is without having worked with students right here at MSU. Last year we consulted with students in MSU's marketing department to help us frame the things that are most important to students as they're figuring out what their next steps might be. We also conduct conducted extensive user experience testing with high school students across the state and with parents across the state. So we're very eager to continue this partnership to build out the college and career access portal 
and to share the goal of helping more Montana students have opportunity to pursue their higher education goals. Thanks, Kelly. So thank you both. Uh, th this, this is exciting work, and uh, I, I am just uh, thrilled to, to bring this effort forward. Um, I think it can do a lot for Montana. I think it will do remarkable things to help us attract that 45%. And I've often said, you know, about 20 some percent of students go out of state um, for their college careers. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, we also have a vested interest in this state to try to keep some of those best and brightest students right here in Montana uh, being educated and, and entering our workforce here. And so. Uh, you know, that this has a broad focus on how we can help all students across the state. Um, at the same time, um, you know, I think one of the, the underlying principles of this work moving forward is to do no harm. And we're cognizant of that, and I want to share that message with the campuses because the last thing we want to do is get in the way of successful processes. Um, what we want to do is augment the good work that's going on try to reach a broader section of Montana students and rise boats for all students uh, moving forward. So the work of the portal will continue. Um, it's making leaps and bounds. Uh, the addition of liaison, liaison will uh, uh, move us uh, to the next generation and we'll have more to say about this as we move uh, forward in the future. So uh, a, a couple other kind of briefing things that I, I think is important to share with the board. Had the opportunity to participate in some national meetings uh, over the last few weeks. Um, one with the Assistant Secretary, Bob King, uh, with the U.S. Department of Education, and uh, another with the uh, Deputy Undersecretary, uh, Department of Education, uh, Diane Jones. And there's a fair amount that continues to sort of move through the process. They've taken a pretty aggressive stance uh, with the uh, negotiated rulemaking process, something that's required in, in changing federal edu education policy. Uh, still waiting for the, the rules uh, around Title IX, uh, but they did release some rules around accreditation um, and state reciprocity agreements. The reciprocity agreements aren't that unique. Um, it's a 512 page document, which I haven't fully digested, but there are some really interesting things in there about accreditation. Um, and the undersecretary says that they will, their proposal is to remove the concept of regional accreditors from the federal requirements. And I think that could be a, a pretty uh, major shift for higher education because now all of a sudden you can seek accreditation anywhere with anyone uh, it's not regionally bound. Um, you know, I, I don't know what all the ramifications are, of, of that will be. In, in some ways, there's some concern that now institutions sort of shop for the best accreditation. That may not be productive. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it, it would lend itself well for institutions of similar scope, size, and, and mission maybe to accredit, accredit themselves uh, at a national scale instead of uh, a regional scale. It also suggests uh, in, in the language that they will uh, allow multiple accreditations, maybe opening the way, paving the way for faith-based accreditation uh, was certainly one of the topics she discussed, um, but has some, some interesting things moving forward. We'll continue to watch those uh, on, on all of the system's behalf uh, as we move move ahead. They also spoke about uh, Section 117 reporting, something we've been looking at. It is where uh, any institution that receives more than $250,000 of foreign gift has to report that to the federal government. They are talking about broadly expanding that language to include uh, tuition, research, other things. So if there's foreign dollars that help sponsor uh, whether it's scholarly or research activity on campus, they may have to be uh, reported at a much different level. Um, we have our compliance officer, uh, new to her job, but uh, definitely engaging, Jessica Weltman, who is uh, trying to figure out what this means, what we're doing. Uh, I will tell you, across the country, they say about 3% of the institutions are currently reporting. Um, maybe that's all it needs to. Maybe there's a gap there that we uh, need to fill in, and I think that's certainly on the priority uh, table for us to try to see. There are some institutions 
um, that they have started to investigate. And we uh, aren't anxious to be on that list, so we will try to get up to speed as quickly as we can. Um, and then a couple other things that I want to talk about on a, a much uh, closer level. Um, maybe it's fitting, given it's uh, Cat Grizz weekend, that I end on these two. I don't think it was intentional, but uh, a, a couple things that have hit of late. California passed uh, a law this spring to allow fair pay uh, to play, which is essentially something the NCAA has pushed back against for a long time in amateur athletics, receiving some compensation for endorsements for your image. Um, the NCAA talked a bit about uh, resisting it in, in a legal challenge, um, the constitutionality of it, the rest, in a pretty abrupt reversal. Uh, about uh, three weeks ago, the board of, the, uh, of trustees for the NCAA um, have voted to adopt that into uh, the rules and they will work, uh, they, they anticipate rules could come out uh, early in 2021 around it. So uh, it certainly will have an impact on college athletics and something we will need to do uh, within our own state uh, to prepare for. And then finally, uh, uh, another change brought on in 2018 by a US Supreme Court ruling that would uh, no longer allow states to prohibit betting on uh, sports. Uh, has sort of opened up the, the door for uh, conversations in Montana. I will tell you, in the legislative session, there were 60 bills relating to uh, gambling, anything from fishing derbies to horse racing uh, and everything in between. Two of them that hit closer to home for us, though, uh, were uh, uh, bills that directly talked about betting on college uh, athletic competitions. And... Uh, the two bills that ultimately came out of the legislature, one uh, by Mark Blaisdell, 330, Senate Bill 330, um, and a second by uh, Ryan Lynch, one put the uh, sports betting in the hands of the private sector. The other, uh, Ryan Lynch's bill, placed it uh, in the rulemaking authority in the Montana lottery. And the governor uh, so chose to veto the uh, private sector one and place the sports betting one he signed, uh, putting than the rules and guidance with the, the Montana Lottery. Um, they are still working on rules. They anticipated maybe as early as July that those would be out. They're now uh, hopeful that maybe in uh, early January they would have rules. We have your staff uh, engaged with uh, the lottery uh, people trying to uh, work through this as we go. Um, and, and we'll do what we can do. It, it's uh, not foreign to us, but uh, it certainly goes without saying that we need to be careful that we put in place the necessary steps to uh, uh, discourage uh, improper behavior from uh, college athletes, uh, faculty, not faculty, staff, uh, athletic departments, and uh, administration that have some form of oversight in this. And so we are bringing forward uh, that for your uh, uh, look, first look, a draft this afternoon or might be tomorrow uh, at some proposed rules that would dovetail with the NCAA rules and the NAIA rules around uh, what and who is allowed to bet and who is not allowed to bet uh, or place wagers, provide information, other things around uh, uh, sports betting. So uh, stay tuned for that one as well and we hope to adopt uh, some, some policy at a board level that will embrace what we need to do to keep uh, that uh, in, in the right perspective and as pure and as, as uh, positive moving forward in Montana as we can. Uh, the last comment I would make, I just uh, attended a meeting last week with your inner benefits, um, inner benefits unit committee, which is our group uh, led by Mary Lockenbaugh that does uh, our health insurance plan and some of our retirement benefits. I would like to tell you that they have successfully implemented a new system-wide software um, BIBA, it's referred to, Benefit Enrollment and Administration, uh, that now has uh, everyone from across the system participating. That was a monumental task that took uh, a huge effort uh, from the campuses as well to get all of this in there. It's something that has been mandated uh, through various audits along the way. It's something we need to do. It is the first time that we've had uh, our ability to look across the system and see who's actually on the plan from a system level. 
uh, so something that's very important in managing the plan. Uh, but I would also tell you that uh, we had the actuarial team there, and I'm, I'm proud to report that our health insurance uh, and benefits plans are doing exceptionally well. I feel very confident in the leadership that is there. We are managing uh, with sufficient reserves, sufficient cushion, um, a plan that I think provides rich benefits for all within the MUS. It uh, has relatively low um, deductibles. It has relatively low out-of-pocket when you look at other private sector plans, and so I'm very pleased with the work that they've been able to do. Uh, and we've done that uh, now for uh, uh, going into three years without any increase to premiums. So I'm, I'm very pleased with uh, the management of that plan. So uh, to get to the end of this, um, the next thing that is on our agenda is uh, a quick enrollment update from uh, John Thunstrom, who will walk us through some numbers. And we'll continue on. Thank you. This mouse is going to work. It seems to be. Let me switch that over. Oh, I guess I can do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is John Thunstrom. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm here to present our enrollment picture for fall of 2019. Uh, we'll be looking at census figures today, uh, which, as a reminder, are gathered at the conclusion of the 15th day of class for each campus, and we'll be utilizing a variety of dashboards that we have published on uh, the MUS website uh, to go over those figures. At the end of the term, we'll update our FTE figures to take in the totality of our ads and drops that occur over the course of each semester, uh, examining only the finalized payments with those. Now, those figures will be slightly different than those that we go over today, but at our May meeting, we'll present the complete picture of those end-of-term numbers in our year-end uh, enrollment report. Now, what you see on the screen over here is uh, the system FTE totals for fall census over the course of the past nine years. Uh, we're currently excluding the community colleges, as you see here. Um, and they're broken out by resident populations. Uh, recall that FTE, our full-time equivalents, are calculated by summing the undergraduate credits, dividing that number by 15, and the graduate credits, and dividing that number by 12, and then we add those two together, and that becomes our FTE totals for the year. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference between that and the headcount shortly. Uh, as you can see, and has been previously noted in uh, uh, your early presentation and previous presentations to this one in, on enrollment, the population of resident undergraduates represented by the dark blue bars that you see here oh, has been uh, slowly in decline over the past several years. Uh, we've now reached a current level of 20,154 resident FTE in uh, fiscal year, in fall of 2019. And that represents a decline of 5.5% over the previous year. Um, also, as been previously noted, uh, these declines coincide with the declines in Montana high school graduates as well as a number of other factors. Uh, current projections from WICHE that you see here indicate that we have reached the trough in high school uh, graduate populations in Montana, which is uh, this time period right here. And we are expected to uh, increase those numbers again over the next eight to 10 years, as you can see going up right over here. Now these figures were most recently updated in 2014, um, but we also have figures from uh, the National Center for Education Statistics, which are updated annually. And as you can see on this slide from Deputy Commissioner Trevor, there's an agreement that we've reached the low point, and those graduate figures are expected to, again, cr uh, climb over the next eight years. Now, importantly, this coincides with our Resident Student Access Initiative, which we just spoke, uh, spoke about at length uh, with Dr. Tessman. Uh, and that, the goal of, the, of that initiative is to increase both the percentage of Montana high school graduates that are entering the M MUS and the number overall. Now, it's obviously going to take time for these changes to be reflected as those high school graduates come in, and the numbers will increase over time as, those, as we slowly increase the, the number of our freshmen uh, that are matriculating to MUS institutions. Uh, we're going to flip back here to look at, again, our uh, system overview. And looking at specifically fall of 2019, 
we can see that there have been declines from fall of 2018 uh, for all of the populations aside from WUI. Though one thing that we do want to note is that the populations of our out-of-state students, including WUI, uh, our non-resident undergraduates, and then again our non-resident graduate populations have all been uh, significantly increased over time since 2011. Uh, with the largest increase by percentage here of our non-resident undergraduate population at 31.4 percent. Uh, we're looking now at FTE enrollments by campus, um, hovering over the individual data points along the line. We can see that uh, we have additional insight into uh, different things of the populations of each campus. Uh, you can note that the pie chart below shows the percentages of each uh, residency category that make up the total, and again, the percent of change that we see over time for each, uh, for each campus. We have the ability over here to filter by uh, a number of different things. And what we see here is uh, we've filtered by um, uh, campus and by our resident populations to narrow it down to just the uh, regional four-year campuses. And you can see here that, again, we've seen the decline in those residents over time. Uh, and both the regional four-year schools and the two-year schools have greater percent of resident students as a total of their population. So that you've actually seen those decreases uh, certainly affecting those campuses a lot over the last several years. Uh, we also have the ability to look again at just the two-year schools, and I wanted to point this out that we're now including the community colleges, and the reason that I had excluded them from, uh, from those uh, uh, totals that you had seen before is that we only have information in our warehouse for Flathead Valley Community College going back to 2016, as you can see here. Uh, when we include those community colleges, that, that bump can sometimes throw off those bars, so they're not generally included when I go over the system totals, but I just want to note that they are out there. Uh, you can go out and look at all the two-year schools individually or uh, in conjunction with all the uh, community colleges as well and, and, and look at that in the dashboard as you see here. Uh, I'd like to move on to look at our headcount dashboard. Um, and as noted, while FTE represents an important method for compiling information on our enrollments, the actual number of students served at any given time can vary fairly significantly from our FTE numbers. Uh, what you're seeing here is uh, our system headcount going from fall of 2010 all the way up through fall of 2019. And again, we're excluding the uh, community colleges here. Uh, selecting any of the bars here will affect the demographic information that you see below. So if you wanted to see fall of 2017 demographic information, you can certainly click that and it will be reflected in the uh, charts that we see down here. Um, looking at the numbers, uh, you can note that for fall of 2019, our total is 39,236 is our total uh, headcount. Now, if you'll recall our FTE charts, that complete total for the system was only 32,417. And that's obviously a significant difference when you look at the number of students each campus needs to devote resources to versus the FTE count, which is obviously much lower. Uh, scrolling down to look at the demographic detail, we can see that uh, the, re the, the main reason for this difference is that about a third of our students represented here are only attending part-time. We can also see that resident students still comprise about 70% of the total uh, population that we serve, despite the increases in non-resident enrollment over the years for, for several of the campuses. The population of female students represented here is about 53% of our total, and this is slightly less than the national average of 56% female as of the 2016 National Center for Education st Statistics figures. Um, below that, we see the traditional age population represented by the blue here. And we see that the uh, population of 18 to 24 year olds uh, makes up about two thirds of our enrollees. And this number is slightly higher than the national average of about 60%, again, as of those 2016 figures. Finally, you can see over here that our population is predominantly white, with the largest minority population being uh, American Indians, represented here by about 5.5% of our total. Now, taking a closer look at just the two-year schools, we can really see a difference in the full-time, part-time mix, as I scroll down here, with about 60% of, uh, of our enrollments at these campuses uh, enrolled only part-time. You can also note over here 
that the population of dual enrolled students is up to about 31% at our two-year schools. Now, if I click back on, say, fall of 2012, you can see that the proportion of these students is actually much, much lower. And as I continue along the line in time, those enrollments increase dramatically until we get up to that, again, 31% uh, figure that we've that we've got today. This has been a big goal for the MUS over the last several years and uh, it gets those students familiarized with our with our MUS campuses and been a big goal for us to increase those numbers over time so uh, good to see that that's happening. Again Montana residents make up the vast majority of our two-year population seen here at about 95 percent and they again uh, just to make note that our female population makes up 59 percent of our two-year schools which is higher than the uh, four-year average. Uh, looking out just the four-year schools, the numbers track much closer to the system as a whole, which you would expect given that they make up the significant majority of the total population. You can see down here that those numbers match pretty close to the system overall. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this dashboard, only to make note that it's there so you can view uh, all those populations, those demographic populations over time represented across each of the institutions. Using the filters on the side, you can see what the trends have been over the years. Uh, for anyone who's interested in seeing those numbers, you can certainly go out and look at those. Uh, and finally, what I'd like to do is just take a brief look at our first time freshman dashboard, which you can see here. Um, the top bars up here represent the system over time, uh, while we break it out by the individual institutions here in the middle, and then down below you can see those numbers in tabular form uh, represented down below. So all of this is uh, available over time. You can filter over here to see if, uh, if there are specific populations that you want to look at or specific campuses. Additionally, with this dashboard, we have the ability to look over our retentions over time. Now these are system retentions, meaning that if a student matriculated at any MUS institution and then transferred to another campus within the system, that will be reflected in these totals. The tabular data that you see down below uh, includes both the institutionally retained numbers and then the system uh, numbers retained as well. So you can make a comparison between those two things. And then just of note, the system as a, to as a, as a whole, you can see that we've had some pretty good uh, increases in, over time in our retention rates within the system. And that reflects, I think, a lot of the good work that the uh, campuses have been doing over time to increase those, those retention rates. So that in the, uh, with that, that concludes the information that I was hoping to cover today. Uh, the last thing I will show is just that uh, out on our mus.edu slash data slash dashboards page, you can see all of these dashboards broken out by various categories. Go out there and look at the dashboards that I presented today as, long as, uh, as well as a number of others. Uh, for anybody who's interested, this is out there. You can play around with it. If you have questions, certainly get in touch. Uh, and with that, I would certainly uh, stand for any questions that uh, you may have as a board. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any, any questions on the enrollment update from members of the board? Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. Thanks, Thanks John. I, uh, very thorough report, and I think it demonstrates a lot what we've been talking about. We need to get more students in the front door. That's the portal. That's our recruiting efforts. And we need to see more students retain. And I'm very pleased with where some of these retention numbers are going. I think that is a direct result of this board's intentions of, of uh, making that a priority across the system. It is being heard uh, throughout. Uh, retention and completion is not only what we need in the system, but it's the right thing to do for students, and I'm very proud of the work that's going on there. That's where our students, that's where we find them all. That's where, uh, frankly, Bozeman's found them, either in uh, uh, retaining students. Yes, that's, that's one avenue, but that's only a part of it. Um, recruiting students a part of it and I think those things combined uh, will get us the numbers that we need and ultimately uh, that work combined with uh, the conversations we're going to have uh, in Region Nice Students Committee and beyond around two-year education those those are the pieces of this puzzle that I think uh, give us uh, at least a path and a vision for how we get to some of the workforce challenges and the workforce shortages that we have in Montana. So, campus reports are uh, posted for you. Uh, again, I encourage you to look at those. They have some great information. Um, we are ready to go to uh, any further uh, introductions or acknowledgments that we might have around the system. 
we've introduced everybody. I know we saw President Gamble uh, come in the back room a minute ago. I, maybe he's went back out, but yeah, must not be in here either. Well, I, we can't find anybody to introduce, so that's, that's a good thing. Uh, I think with uh, that, unless there's uh, further questions for me, Regent Sheehy. I was thinking you should wear your medal for the entire meeting. Okay. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, signify. <laughs> Okay, I'll put it back on. Thank you. I am very proud of it, so that's uh, that's fitting. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe that concludes our uh, report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Any any questions for uh, Commissioner Christian? Uh, I want to be able to move us along. I know we've got a very tight schedule um, and a number of different things to fit in today. So before we uh, move on to taking a, a break, I want to... Uh, offer the opportunity for um, Governor Bullock's designee, uh, Education Policy Advisor um, McCall Flynn, to offer any remarks from the governor. Thanks, Chair Lozar, and I'll be brief. I realize I'm between you all and a break. So, um, and last time I joined you, I know that I didn't give um, a report. Thank you for that, Commissioner Christian. Um, so I'm gonna take you back briefly just to Labor Day. Um, governor and Lieutenant Governor Cooney um, met and presented the 2019 Labor Day report to Montanans. A lot of really good information in there about education and economic development in general. Uh, 46,000 jobs have been added to Montana's economy since um, the end of the last recession, 5,000 in the last year alone. Um, we're the sixth fastest growth in average annual wages um, among states from 2008, which is um, great and up by 3.2%. Um, and we also rank third in the nation um, for the percent of the population over the last 25 years of age with a high school diploma or equivalency. So we know that there's a lot of really great things going on um, in economic development and economic growth in general, um, but we know we still have a lot of work to do. The governor has really focused on incentivizing apprenticeships with Department of Labor and Industry, you know, encouraging employers to offer work-based learning opportunities to our students. Um, and one, um, I think, pilot to note is the Become an Alum program, which is the pilot program um, between the University of Montana and Department of Labor and Industry, and already they've been able to contact over 3,000 former students to assist those who have some, um, some form of school but no degree, and really trying to get them back into the system. I know the Commissioner's Office has done a lot of work on that front as well. Um, quickly wanted to also talk about um, a grant that Department of Health and Human Services has been able to, um, or has received, to help educate our youngest learners. Um, January 2019, DPHHS was awarded a $4.2 million planning grant. Um, they did get the grant and they were awarded that um, in September, which was, or they got that grant and then their needs assessment and strategic plan were both adopted in September, which was very exciting. Um, and then after that process, they were quickly told to um, put in for the renewal grant and did so. Um, that was actually, um, sent in at the beginning of November, and that really just uh, talked about improving the work that they had already done around childcare and how they can um, really focus on issues of access and quality, uh, workforce coordination, family engagement, governance. Um, and once the renewal grant was posted, um, I knew that there were a lot of other state agencies that have been talking around the issues of childcare and workforce. So we got a group together from the Governor's Office of Economic Development, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor and Industry, and then the Department of Health and Human Services to really talk about ways that we can support businesses as they're looking at um, you know, supporting their um, workforce, but then also how they grow. And some strategies related to childcare that we came up with um, to really help some of these existing groups um, is to you know, increase childcare grants, increase increase child care quality, um, increasing support for those underserved populations, um, and then you know business support for child care providers as well. Um, so assuming and hopeful, we will know in December if we receive that renewal grant, um, I know Department of Health and Human Services is already planning on working with a lot of these state agencies to um, you know, work with businesses and to grow these opportunities. 
Uh, Commissioner Christian stole my thunder on Future Ready Cabinet, so I won't talk too much more about that, but I do want to thank you all for adopting that resolution. And, um, you know, we're continuously looking at ways that we can help students um, and mid-career workers, you know, access some form of credential that can help them um, in their uh, education. Um, so thank you all for that. And I know the governor is going to be here tomorrow for the Board of Education meeting to talk more about dual enrollment and apprenticeship partnerships that we have had um, in the state, so I won't touch on that today. Um, and then briefly, high set. Um, if you all can remember the last legislative session, Governor's Office and Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education worked together to secure $350,000 to um, help pay for high set access and attainment in our Indian reservations. Um, so just recently, uh, the Governor's Office reached out to each of our um, tribal colleges to draft a plan. Um, each one sent in their plan, so Ochi will distribute $50,000 to each of our reservations to help with personal development, testing centers, um, covering the cost, travel, study materials. Really, it's very broad, and um, we were really excited to do that this year. And then lastly, I um, wanted to touch briefly on the census. Um, I know I'm sure all of you have at least heard about it once, um, but Department of Commerce is leading the 2020 census for Montana. Lieutenant Governor Cooney is our complete count committee chair. Um, and we'll be asking a lot of folks in the education community to really be involved um, and to help us spread the mes message of how important um, the census is to our federal dollars that are directly you know, attached to education. Um, and I actually pulled up some of those areas, uh, Title I programming, Head Start programming, special education grants, our national school lunch programs, career and technical education are all tied to the census. Um, so it's really important that we get a clear and accurate count for Montana um, and that we can you know, do all we can to support Department of Commerce and their efforts. Um, and with that, I know I talked very fast, but I'll take any questions if folks have them. Thank you, McCall. Does, any, do you, does the board have any questions for Ms. Flynn? Thank you. Thank you for the report. Thanks. We look forward to um, um, being with the, the governor tomorrow at the Board of Education meeting. Um, with that, let's, uh, it's about 10.10. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll uh, meet back up and uh, transition to the Budget Admin and Audit Committee at 10.20. 10.20. All right, if we could get everybody to have a seat. All right, we are going to begin our uh, committee meetings. Uh, first committee of the day is our budge budget admin and audit committee chaired by Regent Tuss. Chair Tuss, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, do, we do have a fairly full agenda this morning for the Budget Administration and Audit Committee, and it's certainly my intent to be as efficient as possible with our time, knowing we're a little behind time uh, at this point. And so at this juncture, I would ask uh, the committee members and the broader board to take a look at those items under the consent agenda. Uh, they've all been properly noticed. And I want to now ask if there is any desire to remove any of those consent agenda items and put them under the action agenda items. If there is not, we will move uh, expeditiously toward our action agenda items. I see no, okay. Let's move on to the action agenda for the committee and the first uh, item of note, uh, item A is a commitment to lease land for a state laboratory facility and uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, can you take that? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. This item, uh, as stated in its title, is a, commi a commitment for a future lease um, of MSU land to the Montana Department of Administration. And I give you just a few bullets here of some backdrop and some history and know that uh, our colleague uh, Vice President Tracy Ellig is on call here to help me along the, along the way and answer questions as he's been uh, very much uh, a part of this for the past three years. 
And so um, over this three to four year period of time, the state of Montana has explored and analyzed options for upgrading state labs on the MSU campus. There are, it turns out a variety of different state labs that reside on campus and they all have a little bit different history and have been here over time um, through different leases in different facilities. There's the uh, vet diagnostic lab, there's the FWP wildlife lab, an analytical lab uh, by the Department of uh, run by the Department of Ag, as well as some labs that are actually uh, a part of um, the extension uh, services here at MSU with the wool and seed labs and uh, pulse crop diagnostic laboratories um, that are a part of MSU. Um, there's uh, been, uh, in each of the last interims, advisory committees or commissions to look at um, how best to upgrade these facilities. Some of them are in um, worse shape than others and a need to uh, improve these facilities is uh, a state interest. Um, a current legislative advisory committee, in fact, prescribed by House Bill 586 this session um, is charged with developing those plans um, for the development of this, what is seen as a possibility for a co-located laboratory facility that would pull in um, at least some of these entities into a single facility. So what the state, this commission or committee of legislators and uh, individual interested parties um, are, are really looking for is for um, to be able to move on with the next step is uh, very important to them to uh, figure out where this facility could be located. And so this is what this item does, is facilitate that process by giving uh, the state a commitment um, that there would be land on the MSU campus uh, that is appropriate to the size and scope of uh, this facility. And, um, and then let that group and the legislature figure out the financing and the, the plans for the building and then bring that back to the Board of Regents um, for ultimate approval like we would with any other facility. So um, this commitment is uh, hinges on a set of contingencies, and I just quickly run through those. Uh, um, once a funding source and financing plan have been identified, a no-cost lease will be brought to the regions as well as the approval for a facility. In that agreement, uh, of course, MSU will retain ownership of the land. Prior to the construction of the facility, um, as I mentioned, the Montana Department of Administration, that's who the lease would actually be with, um, must obtain Board of Regents approval for the construction of the facility, just like any of the other facilities that we uh, construct on um, university property. If the construction has not begun by September 22nd, so a year after the end of the legislative session, uh, this resolution would be shelved into moratorium. And then finally, um, one of the key facilities here uh, on uh, the MSU campus, McCall Hall, which, ha which houses the Montana Department of Ag Operations, um, must be uh, vacated and uh, moved into the new facility. So um, those are all contingencies that uh, the advisory committee in one way or another have addressed. Um, I, I think at this moment I would just pause and see if there are any questions from uh, the Regents Committee and uh, see if I can answer those. Committee members, are there any are there any questions about this? Are there any questions? Okay, um, I, I do know that the as I understand it, the uh, the chair of the advisory council of which you spoke, Rep Representative Kerry White, is here. Um, Representative White, if uh, if if you if you don't mind, uh, cer certainly would invite you to the podium to 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 say just perhaps a minute of uh, uh, words about this particular item. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, I'll try to keep you on uh, schedule. Uh, serving my fourth term in the House, three terms as chair of the Natural Resource Committee, four terms on the Environmental Quality Council. I was appointed at the Lab Study Committee in uh, 17 sessions, so I've served three years on the Lab Study, uh, working with Mr. Ellig, uh, the university system. I appreciate you considering this important, uh, this important matter. Um, those five labs 
consolidated on this campus would be a huge benefit to uh, agriculture or wildlife industry, uh, Department of Livestock, um, Pulse Lab, Seed Lab, all of those. I think it could be a state-of-the-art facility. We're not looking for any funding uh, budget tight, general fund money, university money. But I think there's uh, private dollars out there. There's also federal dollars that can partner uh, to create a facility. Uh, we're just looking for a commitment from the regions. Uh, regions, uh, five acres, I believe, is in the proposal uh, for that new lab facility, and then a remodel of the Marsh Lab for those other labs. It would free up a building on the campus for additional space for university. And I think there's a huge um, opportunity for a teaching component within this new lab facility. And a land grant university, Montana State University, agriculture are our number one industry in the state. I think it's critical that we have a, a facility to deal with these new diseases, uh, chronic wasting disease, brucellosis. Um, we do have anthrax, we do have uh, another swine disease coming in. So I think it's, uh, it's critical that we have something within the state to do those testing. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Representative White. Are there comments or questions from members of the board? Yeah, Regent Lozer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, just a comment. I wanted to, I want to thank um, Chair of the, the Study Committee, uh, Representative White, for very clear and consistent communication with the, the Board of Regents, um, particularly uh, since the legislative session closed, and, and for the folks and leadership on, on campus and uh, within OCHI, trying to find a way in which to make this uh, a reality. And we really look forward to um, seeing this strategic vision come, come into place and your financing and funding model to come in front of the board. And uh, we look to see where this goes. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions, comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Seeing none, we'll move on to action item B, which is the Montana Resident Undergraduate Student Financial Aid Policy. Deputy Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm proud to bring this item to the committee uh, for a couple of reasons. This is a long time coming. Uh, we have a series of historical um, uh, resident undergraduate financial aid policies uh, that relate to a variety of different programs that have been either currently utilized or uh, now are defunct um, that we're taking the opportunity to uh, establish a brand new policy um, that would uh, first and foremost uh, address some of the new funding streams that we received for new financial aid programs. Um, one of those being the Montana Access Scholarship, another one being the revitalization of the STEM scholarship. And um, with that, uh, with the advent of those two programs, uh, we're taking the opportunity here to consolidate all resident undergraduate student aid policies of the Board of Regents into one policy, uh, bringing them from uh, what is two separate areas of board policy in the 500 series under uh, student affairs and in the 900 series under financial affairs into a single area, um, eliminating old policies uh, and old programs that are now no longer in effect. Um, and, um, and an important point here too is that um, we are then establishing board policy uh, that mirrors a structure that was established by this last uh, legislature for um, the statute on resident undergraduate student aid uh, that talks about a continuum of aid a, a, or a, a three-pronged stool where on one end we have merit and the other end we have access aid and in the center we have targeted incentive aid. Um, and those three areas are built into this policy through the MUS Honors Scholarship on the merit side, the, now the Montana Access Scholarship on the need-based access end of it. And in the center, we have the STEM Scholarship, which is our targeted incentive aid. So um, this pulls them into one, as I stated. And then the operational procedures, uh, those detailed eligibility criteria and um, kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how the program works, um, aren't going away, but rather we house those, um, and they will be housed in the new portal as well, but uh, on our website, 
where uh, you can, a student or parent can easily find out the criteria without going through board policy to find the source of it. Um, so uh, we keep those updated and in line with the program. This policy enables us to administer those programs. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there questions or comments from members of the board on this particular item? Um, I would just emphasize the fact that this is indeed consistent with the wishes and desires of the Montana legislature as, as related to us through this past session. And I think that's important as we talk about access merit and the incentive part of this particular program. Um, additional comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, we will, uh, we will move on. Uh, action item C, uh, student-driven fee request from the Associated Students of the University of Montana Western. Deputy Commissioner. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, under policy 940.12.1, um, the Board of Regents allow for off-cycle approval of student-driven fees, student-driven fees only. And uh, those are the, the fees that are brought forward by uh, uh, the student, uh, associated students of a particular campus. Uh, they are um, fees that are voted on by the uh, student body, either through the leadership or the entire student body. And uh, they are also fees that are um, under the purview of the associated students on that campus. And uh, this is an item um, that is uh, reflective of all of those criteria brought forward by the University of Montana Western. Um, uh, typically, uh, we would like to group off-cycle fees into, um, or, or any fees, into a May Board of Regents meeting just to remain consistent over time. Uh, this uh, particular request has some uh, particular nuances uh, that demand that it come to you immediately. Um, I would uh, like to turn this over to the uh, student body president from the University of Montana Western to just briefly describe some of those nuances. All righty. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner Trevor. Uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Ethan Powell. Like uh, Trevor had mentioned, um, I'm the ASUMW president. Um, so I'm just going to start off with uh, the process that we took uh, to get to this, this point and the rationale uh, for renaming and restructuring uh, the radio station and recycling fee. So ASUMW was interested in investing in and acquiring a, uh, a mobile application uh, this past spring. Um, we, we talked with our vice chancellor of finance. Uh, we had uh, discussions with our communications director. However, at that point, uh, they were just discussions. They were not acted upon. And so this summer, our communications director, Matt Rafty, uh, was able to find a grant called the Student Engagement Mobile App Grant. And this is an excellent opportunity uh, for ASUMW and UM Western as a whole. The grant would provide uh, $81,000 over the next five years. And the app would then cost the student $17,000 um, in year one. And then in the years following, it would be $9,000. Again, the app provides an extraordinary opportunity uh, for the students in the university to save money while advancing our technological position. Uh, it, it's going to cut the cost in half, uh, uh, basically. So the deadline for this, at, or for, or for this grant was in July. However, we were awarded an extension um, till the end of November. And so that is, so we had a chance to approach this committee and approach the Board of Regents uh, to gain some more funding for the app. And so that is, that is the, the sole reason, or one of the reasons why we are here out of cycle, um, because we have this great opportunity to, I mean, $81,000 for a, a university uh, like Western is, is going to be huge. So, um, and, then, and then the other part of this was that the students were really driving for it. Every student that we've had uh, talk to us about it uh, really supports the app. It's, a, it's an all-in-one app called the Communication Devel Development and Technology um, Fee. And so uh, the student government initiated it. The university adopted it and uh, gave us the resources uh, to do this and find funding for it. And finally, the, the student body uh, took a survey and showed vast support for it. And uh, the support can be shown in our third attachment and the, the rationale for it. Uh, the University of Montana Western would like to thank you for your time and consideration. I stand for questions. 
Thank you, and thank you for being here. The one question I have, and I yeah. apologize if you said this and I missed it, but uh, the, the Student Senate has acted on this, and, and could you talk a little bit about the outreach to the student body, probably via the Student Senate? Yeah, yeah. So um, as a Student Senate working with the administration, we voted unanimously um, uh, 14 to 0 uh, to approve a $5 fee, and then what we did is we worked with the Dean of Students to send out a, a random survey of the student body at large, and they showed vast support for it. Does that, does that answer your question? It sure did. Thank All you very right. much. Right. Thank you. Uh, additional questions? Comments? Additional questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, and anything else on this particular item? Seeing none, we will move on. Um, we will now go to uh, staff items. And uh, Deputy Commissioner McRae, are, are you up for this particular part of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board. As the item uh, is titled, this is a uh, deferred compensation plan item for the position of the University of Montana president. Uh, the, the board and, and Montana are very familiar with the concept of deferred compensation, uh, but it's my hope that the following background perhaps will be useful for the board in your deliberations and, and your action. This item is essentially the same as uh, deferred compensation items that the Board of Regents approved in 2010, uh, 2012, 2015 uh, for uh, senior system executives, so the positions of the Commissioner of Higher Education, and the two university presidents who report to the commissioner. In a nutshell, deferred compensation is a, a method that is used. We've used it in Montana. It's used in many states, um, most states, for university executives. It's a method to help uh, an organization, a university, a system, recruit and retain executive level leadership at the lowest cost possible in a highly competitive market, and in our case, where Montana is in any given year the, the lowest paying or uh, among the lowest paying states in, in terms of the salaries that, uh, that we offer. We recognize and we're proud that in Montana we offer a heck of a lot more than, than salary in terms of uh, quality of life, quality of people at our institutions, quality of students, and we're very fortunate that that is a, a, a good draw uh, to, to help us recruit and retain executive level leadership. For executives, uh, typical deferred compensations at, at universities, most states use some type of deferred compensation uh, as a, an arrangement to defer income, uh, defer salary uh, to a future date to help reduce upfront costs and then on the employee side, it also provides some enhanced options from a tax standpoint uh, for future earnings. So the MUS has uh, used deferred compensation as is described in this item since 2010. So, so as the item says, in this particular case, if the board were approved to approve this item, the University of Montana president then, uh, if the president completes five continuous years of service from November of 2019 to November of 2024, he would then be eligible for a future benefit uh, equating to uh, $50,000 a year for 10 consecutive years uh, upon reaching the age 65. So that, that's how this benefit is crafted and that's the, the same as um, the, the president uh, deferred comp packages that this board approved in 2010. Uh, we've done this since 2010, and, and most earlier arrangements, uh, past boards have entered into or implemented deferred comp uh, immediately after hire. So, so in 2010, within just a few weeks of hire, um, the board approved deferred compensation at this level. Um, time has passed, and it was communicated to uh, candidates for the, the president position in the presidential recruitment um, on your behalf. 
that um, deferred compensation is a possibility in Montana. It's something the board has experience with and familiarity with. And at, at this time, uh, what, what the board is interested in is in providing that new University of Montana president with an opportunity to come on board and put a team together and start to make the types of uh, decisions, establish the, the type of vision and focus that will situate the university in the positive direction that this board would like to see things go. And, and you communicated, we communicated on your behalf that then um, after having that opportunity, um, when the board is comfortable with uh, in the overall scheme of review and the direction the university is going, that, that the board would be willing to come back and talk about deferred compensation. So, so now is, is that time. Two years ago uh, is when the board approved the contract uh, in, in Bozeman at this November meeting. And uh, it was publicly stated then that deferred compensation was a possibility um, in the case uh, for the University of Montana president. The, uh, aspects or the financial wisdom at the time in 2010, it was really uh, innovative and, and we thought we exercised some ingenuity in, in the following way. That, that this particular proposal um, that is outlined here, uh, while it would provide a benefit if you were to take the $50,000 a year times 10 years between the ages of 65 and 75 of total $500,000 over that time, uh, by deferring it and, and giving uh, investment time to work, the cost of that benefit will be substantially less. So in our estimation, um, it'll easily be uh, as low as half of that total cost, uh, depending on whether there is potential assistance, as the last sentence of the explanation says, from the University of Montana Foundation in uh, contributing to the investment and funding of it. Um, the, the cost in terms of university funds could be as low as maybe one quarter. So it is uh, to, to remind or refresh the, the uh, innovative way that it tries to help position the board, Montana, to be competitive in a highly competitive market where we don't always um, have the, the highest ranking base salaries. Um, it's, it's something that, that you're familiar with and, and that has worked. Um, the next steps, if the board were to approve this item, would be your commissioner and commissioner staff would move forward with then um, creating the documentation and establishing everything that's necessary to put this plan in place, including um, continuing to reach out to foundation leadership. We have had good conversations with UM Foundation leadership. Um, the, uh, Executive officer indicates that the uh, executive committee of the foundation is very interested in uh, what you are considering and uh, our next steps would be to put it in place upon approval. So that's a, an overview of this item. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, for the description of this particular item and for the primer on deferred compensation. That's much appreciated. Are there, are there comments or questions from members of the board? Comments or questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Regent Sheehy. It's really difficult to negotiate these public compensation things, and I understand the difficulties of that. I think we are creating expectations, and we have done so in the past. Uh, I think we, uh, when we re-entered into another round of, of these deferred compensation agreements, we've set our course. I would be more comfortable with a different kind of review process on how we compensate our presidents. I do understand how difficult it is to not explain the past to candidates, but I, I, it gives me some heartburn, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I think that uh, this is an appropriate measure given our past and uh, given the situation we're in today. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Uh, additional comments or questions from members of the board? Seeing none. We will move on. Um, Deputy Commissioner, I believe that you're also going to lead us in the conversation about uh, staff item E. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Regents. This item is uh, essentially implementation of the, the Montana University System pay plan for positions that require board approval. The Montana University System pay plan that has been established through budgeting and through collective bargaining uh, 
that's, that's a, a big piece of it, through collective bargaining. So on your consent agenda, uh, there are a couple of labor agreements, like there was a labor agreement on the September agenda, and we anticipate more labor agreements on the future agenda. Uh, those agreements would provide for salary adjustments in January of 2020 and January of 2021. And, and the adjustments would be for 2% both Januaries. The Januaries correspond to the, the timing of the uh, state employee pay plan for employees in other branches of state government and other agencies of state government. Um, for staff whose annualized wage, full-time annualized wage is lower than $52,000, uh, the raise would be greater than 2%. It would essentially be 50 cents per hour. So that's kind of a threshold where our bargained agreements provide for 2% raises. Um, however, if, uh, or, or uh, two percent or fifty cents an hour, whichever amount is greater. So the threshold line is that fifty-two thousand people below fifty-two thousand annualized would have a, a greater than two percent. As the item says, the authority to implement the pay plan raises comes in the form of the collective bargaining agreements that you approve, and it also comes in the form then of the delegated authority that you provide to the commissioner through policy 711.1 for the commissioner then to issue pay instructions to the campuses for faculty and staff and professional and administrative employees who are not in collective bargaining units to then uh, implement the, the same raise. There are a few employees whose uh, compensation always comes to the board for action and those employees are uh, the commissioner, presidents, chancellors and deputy commissioners. They're the employees who are listed on the attachment. So what the attachment essentially means is implementation of, of this pay plan for those employees. Uh, there is another item on the attachment as we've described in the uh, item statement that you are also going to consider um, bit of a change in the deferred compensation arrangement for the Montana State University president. So uh, I've described for you the uh, past of the uh, deferred compensation arrangements in terms of the five years of service and the types of future defined benefit. The item that is listed for deferred compensation for the Montana State University president is essentially or almost identical to the item that this board approved last November for the Commissioner of Higher Education. And what that is, is a slight conversion in philosophy away from that defined benefit structure that I just described that says in exchange for X number of years of service, you will get a future deferred amount. This goes more as we discussed last November with the, the commissioner's uh, compensation to a, a defined contribution concept where uh, the board decides how much annually the employer's contribution to uh, the employee's deferred comp will be and then from that point forward there's no minimum service or, or vesting requirements um, there is no specified outcome on what future income would be but rather there's specified definition of what the employer's annual contribution will be going forward. And uh, in, in that regard, then, the employee has investment options uh, through our 403B or uh, other university system uh, mutual funds and other types of options. The employee assumes the risk going forward. Um, that's the, the primary change. Uh, it, you know, the dollar amount is listed on the item. It's essentially the same as uh, s slightly larger, maybe a couple thousand dollars annually larger than what the commissioner's item was that the board approved last year. Commissioner? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have a, uh, a third item that I would ask you to consider with regard to the uh, MSU president's compensation, and that is an item uh, directed toward retention. Although we didn't orchestrate it, I think uh, <laughs> the uh, presentation this morning demonstrates a lot of uh, the leadership that we've seen on this campus and the results that we've seen on this campus. And 
uh, I would subscribe to you that uh, that doesn't happen by accident. It takes dedication, it takes commitment, it takes vision, uh, and it takes a dedicated leader that has the foresight to not only uh, provide that direction, but also to create a team that can carry out that mission. And it is my belief that it is not the time to disrupt that team. You also can't achieve those sorts of results without uh, catching notice around the country from peer institutions. And we have a president here that uh, has certainly caught that notice and has been recruited a number of times over the past to look at other opportunities. Uh, more recently, recruited again and an offer placed in hand uh, to look at another opportunity. Uh, we've asked that uh, our good president consider staying here. And uh, while we can't match the offer of other institutions in many cases, uh, I think we can do something to help close the gap uh, somewhat. And I'm asking you to consider a retention item to do just that. Uh, I would also say that I think uh, it is the fiscally responsible thing to do. There is no way that we can uh, look for a new president without uh, incurring costs associated with the hire, costs associated with the recruitment process, time, energy, and ultimately, I think what you saw today, momentum. And that uh, is something that is hard to replace. And so uh, I bring to you uh, an item today for you to consider uh, that would somewhat close that gap uh, and, and put uh, some, an additional compensation line for retention on President uh, Cruzado's pay. Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Regent Sheehy. I just wanted to comment first about the process. This, these things happen really quickly. And I want to thank the leadership for recognizing the uh, two different things that are at issue here. This item involves both privacy interests of our President Cruzado and other institutions. And it also involves a very important public interest in the right to know of an expenditure of, of some significance. So I appreciate the fact that the way this was handled and want to say to everyone that this was handled by keeping the confidential information confidential in the, in the very process that's allowed by Montana law. We had a personnel meeting this morning. The private interests have been kept private. We will now discuss the public interest, the expenditure of the funds publicly and uh, with all transparency. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Are there, are there conversations uh, with regard to this? Regent Miller. Thank you, Chair. Um, as a past student of Montana State University under President Cruzado's leadership, uh, I have seen this university, this university, our university, excel to unprecedented, unprecedented standards. Um, President Cruzado is an extraordinary leader. She has led this university and our system into a whole new era of higher education. I'm so uh, proud to support this compensation plan that values one of our leaders to, to the level that she deserves to be valued. Um, I hope that we all support this. And um, again, as a student, I'm, I'm really excited to see this. Thank you, Regent Miller. Regent Langston. Thank you, Chair Tuss. Uh, I rise in support of uh, all the items, including the, the previous one with regards to President Bodner. You know, when I look at the group of folks that are behind me here, the CEOs of these uh, campuses, Commissioner, you and your, your senior leadership team, I just think of leadership all over the place. And 2% um, these days um, is, is a minimum. You know, I know what goes on in the private sector. Uh, the demand for talent in, and retaining talent only escalates by the, by the year. And I am extremely supportive of, of this, uh, President Cruzado's additional retention stipend, and uh, wish we had an open checkbook to do more, my friends. So thank you. Thank you, Regent Nystuen. Regent Sheehy? Uh, I have uh, nothing but great respect for President Cruzado. And we all have nothing but praise for her work. So that part of this analysis is pretty darn easy. 
The financial aspect is difficult because we are dealing with public funds. So I spent a great deal of time in the limited amount of time that we did have to think about it. And uh, I agree with Commissioner Christian's assessment that this is the fiscally responsible thing to do. I think that we are looking at great changes. We, we look at where President Cruzado sits in our system. We've heard about changes on the national level to accreditation. We know we're going to have some changes on the state level. We'll be in a new administration, regardless of what happens next year. And we also have to put President Cruzado in line of not just MSU, but she's also serving MSU Northern and Great Falls and Billings. And those institutions also uh, deserve some stability. So uh, with the thoughts of the context of the entire thing, and of course the performance, uh, I would support this item. Thank you, Regent Sheehy. Additional comments? Regent Lazar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I concur with my fellow colleagues' uh, assessment and perspectives on um, both uh, the action items that we have in front of us regarding um, President Bodner's uh, deferred compensation as well as the three items that we have uh, in front of us on this particular item. And I, you know, I, I think obviously the, the presentation this morning by uh, President Cruzado was very telling that there has been incredible, incredible success here and momentum built and energy and, um, and, and there were several items that uh, she brought to the table, most of them uh, being student focused and the outcomes uh, of the students. And I think um, certainly building the, a, a strong team that have a student focus um, has allowed for this level of success. And um, I think what we have in front of us uh, today or for action tomorrow is a, a, an extraordinary measure that we haven't taken to this degree for uh, an extraordinary performance uh, for an extraordinary leader in the, in the university system. And uh, I see our decision very similar to the vision that uh, President Cruzado mentioned in her, her uh, opening points about choosing promise. I think that's, that's the choice that we have in front of us as a board is that we have the opportunity to choose a, a promising future for this institution. And uh, as Regent Nystuen mentioned, I, I stand in support of this extraordinary action that, uh, that we're deliberating and we're, we'll be considering tomorrow. Thank you, Regent Lozar. Additional comments by members of the board. Regent Dombrowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say we have spent, uh, in my first six months here, talking about retention, retention of students. And I think this gives us an opportunity for retention of leadership. Great point. Regent Rogers. Uh, I just want to echo the comments of my colleagues here. Uh, I've been born and raised and lived about a mile from Montana State University my entire life and President Cruzado has truly transformed not only this institution but also our community, our region and our state. Uh, I just truly appreciate your leadership and I feel fortunate that we have the opportunity today to continue to retain you here in Montana. Thank you Regent Rogers. Regent Lazar? Yeah, uh, just one other uh, thing I wanted to mention is just uh, as uh, Regent Sheehy mentioned, um, you know, this week we've had a number of conversations around a personnel matter. I just wanted to thank the board for being available for um, those conversations in a pretty short period of time and then uh, extend my gratitude to the commissioner uh, for um, sort of man managing conversations, expectations, and um, ensuring that we have a, de a good decision that we can make uh, as a board as a relate particularly as it relates to President Cruzado. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Lozar, and I would like to second that, Commissioner. Thank you for your uh, quick action on this and engaging the board in a meaningful way in this particular uh, item. Uh, I would ask if there are any additional comments before we move on from, from members of the board. Uh, I do have a technical question, Deputy Commissioner, if you don't mind. Um, the, the overall list here, um, as I recall, having served now on, on this board for some time, um, is a little shorter than it has been in the past. I know that this board has taken action in the past to make that a shorter list. Um, could, could you remind us about, about that transition to, the, to this list versus the expanded list that we've seen in the past? 
Yes, thank you, Regent Tuss, uh, members of the board. Um, until 2006, every board agenda at some point in the year would have salary or other types of personnel staff proposals for all administrators in the system, all faculty in the system, all professional contract employees in the system. So probably more than 2,000 uh, employees and their salaries uh, f and then requests for particular actions would come to the board. In 2006, the board reduced that number by delegating the, to the commissioner the authority to approve individual employment contracts and uh, salary adjustments for uh, contract professional and administrative employees and, and faculty. Uh, and the number was reduced in 2006 from some 2,000 that would come across the agenda to approximately 35 or 40. So it, then it was between 2006 and uh, November of last year. It was uh, all presidents, vice presidents, uh, all chancellors, vice chancellors, uh, and, and a number of others. So uh, in 2017, the board further delegated to the commissioner the authority to approve uh, contracts and terms and conditions for all administrative and, and contract employees except for uh, commissioner, presidents, chancellors, deputy commissioners, and the dean CEOs of independently accredited institutions. So that last definition that I just gave you, the roughly 13 or so, uh, are the, the ones who now still require board action. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. I appreciate that. Um, seeing no further comments from members of the board, uh, we'll move on with uh, the Budget Committee agenda. And this, we will be voting on this item, obviously, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, uh, if we can move on to the facility items. Uh, the first one is item number F, request for authorization to design and construct campus core infrastructure improvements at MSU Bozeman. Yep. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, the next uh, three items, uh, Ron Muffick, Director of Operations and Administration, will uh, introduce. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Trevor. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, action item F is a request for authorization to design and construct campus core infrastructure improvements at Montana State University. MSU intends to perform maintenance work on the core of campus to improve existing utility hardscape and landscape systems. Concurrently, MSU will perform the requested infrastructure improvements, which will increase the cost effectiveness, energy efficiency, and decrease future disturbances in the core of campus. Over the last decade, MSU has gradually increased the use of geothermal wells to heat and or cool buildings, such as Leon Johnson Hall, Jabs Hall, Teats Hall, Wilson Hall, Normaz Bjornsson Hall, and eventually the new American Indian Hall, which is currently under construction. Of note, uh, MSU uses nearly 20% less energy now than they did uh, in 2007 due to uh, a good portion of this due to these wells. Uh, the use of geothermal wells in this plan will allow additional multiple buildings to be heated and cooled using this low-cost environmental respons environmentally responsible technology. This project will install additional wells in the core campus, and it'll also connect this asset to the South Campus Energy District, which serves multiple buildings. Project will be funded with 2.5 million of non-state funds. There will be no additional O&M as a result of this project. Uh, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Muffet. Questions from members of the board? Questions from members of the board? Seeing none. Uh, let us move on to the request for authorization to implement steps to construct new Montana Heritage Pavilion at the University of Montana. Mr. Thank Muffet. you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Action item G, uh, this is a long time coming. This is a request for authorization to implement steps to construct the new Montana Heritage Pavilion at the University of Montana. Uh, the University of Montana uh, has the Montana Museum for Art and Culture, the MMAC, on its campus. The requested authority is for a total project cost of $6 million. The Montana legislature in the 59th session, which I want to say is 2007, approved the $6 million in spending authority. We finally have the uh, private funding secured for this project. The MMAC is one of three state museums, along with the Montana Historical Society and the Museum of the Rockies. It is the only one without a permanent home for its collections, which will now be remedies. Uh, the collections consist of close to 11,000 artwork and artifacts. Current gallery space only allows for displaying 1% of the collections. 
The new facility will provide 11,500 square feet, obviously providing much more ability to store and display the collections. As I said, private funding for this project has been secured, so no additional state O&M is required. Now stand for any questions. Mr. Muffick, I have a question for you or perhaps somebody from the University of Montana. My recollection is, knowing the campus like I do, I believe that there is a building that I, is probably a historic building that is used for campus purposes right now, um, Native American studies or perhaps other, other uh, purposes as well. Can you talk about what, what's going to happen with that building? Absolutely, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, the building is the Barry Tremper House. It will be removed and relocated. It is west of Knowles Hall along Arthur Avenue. Uh, as you mentioned, it was the former residence of the uh, academic home of the Native American Studies Program. Uh, currently hosts the O'Connor Center for the Rocky Mountain West, provides office space for a small number of uh, Ameritai faculty. The building, the plan is to move the building uh, come back to the board, uh, get guidance from the board, the State Historic Preservation Office, and the Missoula Historical Preservation Commission. So uh, that, that will be one step of the process. Certainly come back to this entity to discuss what is the appropriate uh, location for that to be moved to. Okay, thank you. Um, additional comments or questions from members of the board? Seeing none, uh, let's move on to uh, facility item H. Request for authorization to program and design a multi-phase renovation of Rankin Hall and to complete a portion of the initial renovation phase from the University of Montana. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, as, as the XIM states, U of M is asking for approval to proceed with programming and designing. It's a multi-phase approach to Rankin Hall, uh, mostly designed for the multiple phases, but to complete the initial portion to address uh, ADA compliance, fire alarms and sprinkler systems, fire doors and other safety, life safety and code issues. Uh, other than minor repairs and minor remodeling, Rankin Hall has not had an extensive res or re renovation since it was uh, originally built in 1909. So a long time coming on this. Uh, additionally, uh, there will be classroom upgrades. There will be uh, data connections throughout the building to provide a much more uh, modern teaching facility. There will be no additional square footage, uh, so there will be no additional O&M, so no concerns there. So I'll stand for any questions on this project as well. Thank you. Questions from members of the board? Questions from members of the board? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Muffick, let's come to the next item. Request for authorization to implement steps to renovate and upgrade Panzer Hall renovations from the University of Montana. Mr. Chair, uh, items I through K are facility projects that are related to the University of Montana's recent uh, bond refinancing. And with your uh, approval, I will defer to Paul Lassiter, who's Vice President of Operations and Finance for um, U of M for these three items. Please. By the way, Mr. Chair, well, Paul's coming up, uh, so there's no mystery in the room. Our, uh, our fine president at the University of Montana decided that, oh, he's here. I was going to say decided that United and Denver made sense to get here. <laughs> and uh, it was a little delay, but welcome here. Welcome, President Bodner. Mr. Please. Chair, members of the committee, it's my pleasure to be in front of you today. Um, the next three items that we'll be discussing are really a part of a transaction that you approved back in uh, July of this year when the University of Montana undertook really a historic uh, bond refinancing transaction. Um, we refinanced substantially all of the university's debt, dramatically lowering the interest cost dramatically lowering uh, the annual cash flow required to service our debt, and setting aside over $63 million in currently available funding to deploy in campus improvements. Uh, this item that uh, we'll be discussing now, item I, is um, the first project uh, coming before you seeking your approval. The magnitude of the transaction that we undertook um, is very significant. I just want to put a couple of numbers in front of you before I move on. Uh, first and foremost, the, the weighted average interest cost for the, the total debt is 2.95% um, with an average term of 19 years, really historically low rates. Um, if we had kept the same shape of the uh, distribution of maturities uh, of the portfolio that we had before we entered the transaction, 
and then obtain the rates that we achieved during that transaction. The, the total interest savings on that shape of cash flow is over $8.8 .8 million. So very, very significant. As a result of those savings and that low cost of capital, item I before you today is uh, the renovation of Panzer Hall. The University of Montana is seeking the board's approval to update and modernize the on-campus living experience at the University of Montana, beginning with the renovation of the Panzer Residence Hall. Panzer offers suite style living, providing a combination of private bedrooms along with shared living room spaces, as well as 15 single rooms with private bathrooms. This style of living is in high demand by current students, as well as new students seeking to make a decision on where they ultimately want to attend college. Proposed updates for individual bedrooms, common suite areas, and common areas throughout Panzer Hall include updated flooring, furniture, countertops, appliances, shower and bathroom surfaces, shower heads for accessibility, window dressings, and LED lighting, among other things. Um, my basic instruction to our facilities and, and auxiliary folks is Panzer Hall is going to be a showcase residence hall for the University of Montana. Um, in addition to aesthetic improvements, safety and security improvements will also be undertaken. We will be upgrading the entire uh, fire and security system in the building. Um, and finally, the technological infrastructure of Panzer Hall will be absolutely state of the art. It will be the fastest, most uh, easily accessed wireless access point on our campus. And um, we know students like that. In the increasingly competitive landscape of higher education, students are demanding and deserving of modern and well-appointed living spaces to enrich their educational experience. The renovation of Panzer Hall will provide our students with the opportunity to live in a contemporary environment while enjoying the conveniences and benefits of on-campus living. The Panzer Hall renovation is the first project in which we seek your approval in creating a fresh look and feel for the University of Montana campus. And with that, I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you for that presentation. No, knowing some of the dorms on your campus, it seems like Panzer Hall was built last week. Yeah. It seems like it's such a new, a new facility. Um, are there additional comments or questions from members of the board about this item? Okay, seeing, seeing none, can we move on to the next move item? Move on to item J. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, the University of Montana is also seeking the approval uh, to invest in our student-facing infrastructure to ensure that our students are provided with well-maintained and appointed environments for not only optimal living, but also learning space. We're seeking your approval to engage uh, prof the professional expertise of firms knowledgeable in the design, creation, and implementation of a student life campus master planning process. Uh, we seek this advice and counsel in to ensure that all of the resources that we deploy will be invested strategically to provide the maximum benefit to our students at the University of Montana. It's our goal that every student at the University of Montana will benefit from every investment that we make. Our auxiliary and instructional infrastructure is desperately in need of refurbishment updating and maintenance. The investments that we propose ultimately as a result of this process uh, will be critical in charting a positive path forward for our institution. The University of, Mon Camp of Montana campus is without question located in one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And we seek to ensure that our physical infrastructure that our students experience is on par with that natural beauty. Our campus is our students' home for a large portion of the year, and as such, the experience that students have on our campus is critical to their enjoyment, learning, and thriving as scholars and citizens. It's our hope to bolster our students' sense of pride in place, participation in a community of caring, and to be a catalyst for student well-being and achievement. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I do have a question. Please. I, I'm not overly familiar with, with student life master planning process. Um, when, I think, when I think of that, I think of infrastructure, I think of buildings. Is, is that really what we're talking about, or is, is it 
does it go into other aspects of student life? It will go into other aspects of student life. We left off the word academic uh, infrastructure planning because we're still undertaking um, the review and decisions on those projects that will ultimately bring, be brought forward in that regard. We do know that outside of the specific academic needs of the institution, there are living needs, living needs and basic infrastructure needs that can be addressed currently, and we can begin planning for those things now. As we get further down the road, uh, in consultation with uh, Provost Harbor and our faculty, um, we will be coordinating this effort with um, uh, the academic side of the house as well in future planning efforts. Okay, th thank you. Um, President Budner, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Regents, I uh, apologize for, uh, I wanted to stay in the back and not disrupt the, uh, the flow of the meeting, so I apologize, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, I did make it in after some, some travel adventures, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I just want to make one point on this item because Vice President Lasseter makes a, a good point about the important uh, action that we took back in September to enable us to, to free up the capital to, to make some pretty important investments in our campus. But we take very seriously the, uh, the responsibility we have for future generations uh, to have the University of Montana campus maintain the historic field it has. We are very blessed with a campus in a, in a, the, in a, in a place of beauty, but also in a place uh, with a, with a very thoughtful uh, and, and special design. And so we have this capital, but we want to make sure that we conduct an inclusive process where we have our community members uh, across the campus engage in that. And then we make the right decisions about where to invest this capital so that 100 years from now, our, our successors thank us for the foresight. And that, that does take some investment, that takes some time. And that's really what is at the core of this. We, don't, we, want, to, uh, we want to move quickly. Our students need uh, the, the infrastructure to, to, to best serve them, but we also want to move forward thoughtfully and with the fact that, uh, that we're making decisions and investments here that will have impact for quite a long time on, on quite a historic piece of property for the state of Montana. Thank you, President Bodner. Uh, additional questions, comments? Members of the board, Vice President, don't go very far. Um, <laughs> we have item K, request for authorization to engage with an energy service company to assess feasibility of a combined heat and power system from the University of Montana. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, we're seeking to find ways to improve not only the operational efficiency of our campus, but also to reduce the negative impact that we have on the environment. And this project, the exploration of the feasibility of a combined heat power plant on, the, on our campus is, um, is, serves both those needs very, very well. Uh, this project includes replacing some of the oldest equipment that we have on campus, literally dating back to World War II, um, and introducing turbines to our existing gas burning Steve uh, steam generation system that is anticipated to produce substantially all of the electricity that we would need on our campus. So effectively we'll be taking natural gas that we're burning right now already and getting a double bang for it. We'll not only heat the boilers on campus but we'll also generate the electricity that we need. In addition to significant cost savings, expanding this cogeneration capacity on our campus will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions footprint by approximately one third in support of our emissions reduction goals. We estimate that the amount of fuel use in its entirety attributed to the University of, Mon of Montana will also be reduced as a result of the increased efficiency of generating electricity on campus, which can be up to 70% more efficient than generating it off campus and then all the transmission costs uh, in, in moving that, that energy to our campus. As a re result of these upgrades, our new steam and power generating plant will be a permitted, regulated source of emissions that will produce much lower levels of emissions on a per BTU basis compared to our existing plant, which is operating under grandfathering. The new turbines will be dual fuel capable uh, and able to burn biogas. So when and if that becomes uh, more readily available in the future, the plant could eventually become a non-carbon based source of energy 
uh, which would reduce our em energy emissions footprint even further. We understand that uh, this is not a perfect solution uh, in being 100% green, but it is an absolutely economic solution and one that does move us well along in helping to reduce our carbon footprint. And so based on where we are today, we think that this is a win-win investment, not perfect, but substantially positive uh, on both of those fronts. And because of the low cost of capital that we're able to, re to achieve as a result of our bond refinancing, um, this steam plant will be immediately cash flow positive. Um, we'll be using the bond proceeds to fund the investments in this plant, but the debt service payments on that plant relative to the energy savings could be a cash flow positive as, as much as a half a million dollars a year, uh, ranging between 250 and a half a million a year, depending on what ultimately happens and based on our initial estimates. Of course, what we're asking you for is um, the ability to really fine tune and um, in, make absolutely sure that the savings estimates that we're coming up with and the impacts that we are projecting will in fact be realized. And our ESCO partner uh, will be guaranteeing that fact. So stand for any questions, thank you. Thank you, Vice President. If, if I understood you correctly, and, and maybe I didn't, are you gonna be producing more energy than you will be consuming? That is not the current plan. The current plan is to generate what we need. So the size of the plant is not fixed yet, but we're thinking it's approximately four megawatts, which is approximately the amount of energy that our campus would consume during a year. Okay, thank you, Vice President. Um, Regent Sheehy. Paul, um, last year when we were on your campus, we did some touring and uh, I saw a couple of boilers and things. Is this to replace that? It is. Okay, I'm for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank President Bos Bo Bodner and you and your whole team for the thoughtful way that you're going about this. And I, I like getting this where we're in on the planning and we're in on um, all of the steps that are so crucial along the way. And I totally agree with you, Seth, that uh, you know it's important to future generations. And it's also important for those of us who have memories that are very dear to us that arise on that campus. When we return to it, we want it to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. My parents met on that campus in 1940. I met my husband on that campus. I want it to look nice. I want it to be nice. And I want it to be eco-friendly. So thank you. You're welcome. Regent Einstein. Thank you, Chair Tess. Um, the refinance was a brilliant move on your part, uh, friends at University of Montana, congratulations. Although I think interest rates are going to drop further, so maybe it didn't hit the bottom, but we'll see. They Time haven't will yet. Tell on that they're, one. They're More north. seriously, though, what I <laughs> what I would like to do is to call out on the first three items, the funding sources for those, and it was private donations, non-state university funds, and UM Foundation. And you know what that means? Those means the those foundations and campus leaders are out getting donations and contributions and support from the public to help our infrastructure to help us move forward here. Too often, I think uh, we, we don't provide enough acknowledgement, especially to the foundations across the entire Montana University system for the buildings that they provide, the scholarships that they provide the endowed professorships and chairs and uh, the athletic facilities and, and beyond here. So, um, so I, I just think I want to call our attention to the excellent work those campus CEOs and their respective foundations and all the tireless work all our volunteers and board members do to help support the infrastructure of uh, the Montana University system. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Einstein. Additional comments from members of the board? Seeing none, thank you very much for your thank presentation. You. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, the information items, and there are three of them on our agenda today. And so, Deputy Commissioner Trevor, if we could start with information item A, update on sports betting and draft board policy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, I'd ask uh, Helen Thigpen, our Associate Legal Counsel, to address the first item. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, Helen Thigpen, Associate Legal Counsel for the Commissioner's Office and uh, the University System. <clears throat> the Commissioner gave you a good update 
on what's going on with the sports gaming law that passed in 2019. And so I'm here to just flesh out some of the details and to discuss with you um, this informational item before you today. So there are two items that are posted. The first one is the um, explanation of the item itself. And then we also have a draft policy that would uh, be an entirely new board policy to address uh, sports gaming and how it impacts our uh, camp, the MUS campuses. So a little bit of background just to flesh out some of the discussion that the commissioners already had with you. In 2018, the US Supreme Court issued a decision in a case involving the NCAA, and that case was um, Murphy v. NCAA, and it significantly impacted sports gaming across the country. Um, essentially, the court ruled that the federal government uh, through Congress could not uh, prohibit states from authorizing sports gaming. It didn't, the ruling essentially didn't uh, change anything except for say that states could do it if they chose to. So following that ruling, um, several states immediately moved to authorize sports gaming uh, across the country and Montana was one of those states. So in 2019, as the commissioner described, there were several bills that were considered. The one that ultimately passed was House Bill 725, and it uh, did pass with wide margins of support um, and was signed by the governor. Uh, Montana, with the passage of that bill, became the ninth state to allow sports uh, gambling across the country. Each state has uh, taken a little bit of a different approach on how the um, sports gaming was gonna be structured. In Montana, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, the lottery will be regulating uh, sports gaming. Um, normally, gambling in Montana has been run through the Gambling Commission and the Department of Justice, um, but this particular program will be run through the lottery. Under the bill and the rules that are currently being proposed and under consideration by lottery, by lottery, individuals will be able to place sports wagers on both professional and collegiate sports. So somebody could bet on a national sports game or they could bet on the Super Bowl or something like that. Um, and it, they would also be able to bet on games offered uh, within the Montana University system. So that is something that we've been monitoring and um, obviously have um, want to, on our part, want to ensure the integrity of the games and also of our student athletes and all of our athletic staff. So uh, the, the way that we understand it and the way the bill will work is that wagers can only be placed in a licensed retail location, which uh, currently is a place that has a gaming operator's license and an alcoholic beverage license. So somebody would have to go to one of those establishments and I believe they are estimating around 1,400 across the state. Um, and then there will also be an app which will allow uh, individuals to place bets but they can only do that in the location of the um, licensed establishment. So it'll be geocoded to a terminal in, in that location. So it's, it's not as though somebody could um, place a bet um, outside of one of those establishments. The lottery is planning to have those rules adopted soon. They're under consideration right now. They've closed the public comment period. Um, and they have indicated to us that they will offer and they do plan to offer uh, games with, uh, within the Montana University system. So the, potentially the Cat Grizz game uh, next year, given that, they, that it's not currently in place right now. Um, so that brings us to the impacts on our student athletes and campuses. Uh, I think it's really important to mention that the NCAA currently prohibits all student athletes, athletic department staff, coaches, uh, staff that have responsibilities in or with uh, over the athletics department from uh, con engaging in sports wagering activities. So that currently is already in place and we uh, really want to make this widely known that even though that the law authorizes um, this and would make this a legal activity, it's not going to be allowed, obviously, for those um, that are currently uh, fall within that category under the NCAA. <clears throat> so the board policy that's uh, for your consideration would align with the NCAA rules and then would also prohibit uh, voting members of the board from wagering on sports and the commissioner. 
Um, and then it would also ensure that our policy, our campus, uh, campuses are appropriately educating students, impacted staff on what that means. Um, the NCAA obviously is very involved with this. They have an existing uh, very robust campaign on um, sports wagering where they educate their athletes um, and we believe that currently our athletes are all informed of this um, but now with the passage of the new law we need to um, take a, a big responsibility with this and ensure that so that's the current proposal and I will stand for any questions if you have any. Thank you. Regent Sheehy? No big problem with the policy. It looks good. Um, but I wondered, what about office pools? Um, you know, is there a de minimis? Can you bet with your son about Cat Grizz? What? M Mr. Chair, Regent Sheehy, uh, the law, this particular um, law that passed the, this last session doesn't impact anything that you could already do. Office pools, um, fantasy, sports leagues, those kind of things that were already authorized either by state or federal law are not impacted by this. Um, this is about uh, placing bets on specific games um, through a licensed uh, establishment. Okay. Yep. Additional comments? Regent Miller. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just have a quick question. When I'm reading through this draft, I'm not seeing anything um, with a timeline. So, for example, if an administrator or a coach were to retire or leave, um, could we put in like a two-year stop pet or like a stop in there so that they can't bet for two years after that? Um, I can still see issues with um, past people betting that probably should not bet. That, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Regent Miller, that's something we could certainly think about. Um, if, if somebody is leaving and going to a different institution that's covered by the NCAA, obviously that prohibition would still apply. Um, but we can certainly look at whether that, that we can do that. Once somebody is gone, it makes it more difficult for um, the board to regulate that individual um, after they've already left if the service or the campus. So <laughs> something you. to think about. Mr. Commissioner, I have a, I have a question about um, as, as this particular le legislation made its way through uh, this past session, were, were we engaged in the conversation about this? Uh, Mr. Chair, we, we certainly were engaged. It was a, a number of bills that we tracked. Um, I will say that this bill moved through committee rapidly um, with not a lot of comment. and. It uh, was introduced fairly late, um, right before trans Transmittal. It crossed boundaries quickly. Uh, I, I mean, to be honest, it, it, was, it was sort of on the tracks, and it moved through the process. Um, and that's fine. That's how it goes sometimes. Um, we, I, I think that the, the right course of action, though, it, it's here. It's in front of us. Um, We'll put the steps in place on our own side to, to deal with that. But then, honestly, I think that we need to monitor this as it rolls out um, and see what the impact is. And uh, honestly, there could be a, a fair amount of cost associated with education, uh, over, oversight, uh, some of the things that our athletic departments are worried about as this moves forward. And I think we're going to have to uh, see how it plays out, and then you know we may be in a position where, uh, albeit a session or two later, that we need to propose amendments to it or some other considerations uh, as it moves forward. It, it was just a bill that moved sort of quickly. It didn't get amended. It didn't get bounced around. It it sort of passed and passed through. And uh, I think we'll uh, just have to monitor moving forward. And if there's changes that we need to make, then uh, we'll we'll take that approach. Thank you, Commissioner. So, so, with regard to the other states that are involved in this, are, are we kind of on, on a parallel track with those other states? I, I'm sorry, maybe I missed that. Are there, are there other states that are ahead of us on this? And if so, what has been their experience with the sports betting issue? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, there, there are the states that have done this, um, Yes, other, it, it's a little difficult to assess because each state has taken a little bit of a different approach on how they've structured 
the gambling, as I've mentioned. But yes, I mean, there's a lot of research out there. There's a lot of good um, things that we can look at to ensure that we're, you know, properly uh, educating our athletes and staff. And, and Mr. Chair, there are some nuances that are worth looking at as they move forward in their own states. Like New Jersey actually did, I believe it's New Jersey, wrote into theirs where uh, they could wager on uh, sports competitions, but not any that involved institutions within their state. Um, and so, you know, it, as we move forward, uh, depending on the impacts, that those are some things that we may want to, need to consider as, as, as it moves along and as we see what is best practice in other states and how this plays out across the country. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Regent Lazar? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment and a question. I, you know, I just underscore you know, the last section, A and B, and we've kind of covered it a little bit, but uh, I think it is critical that we have a, a robust plan about educating, um, particularly our student athletes or trainers or coaches, um, so that they're, they have the information that they need to make the right decisions uh, as it relates to sports betting. Um, in terms of enforcement and um, remedying violations that may happen, can you talk a little bit about sort of what infrastructure is in place to ensure that we are able to enforce that and make sure that we have the, the proper plans in place when there are uh, violations? M Mr. Chair, Regent Lozar, yes. Uh, we envision the processes that are already in place um, applying to this policy. Um, so for example, with the NCAA, there are already rules and regulations in place for how they would regulate um, for example, somebody who violated the sports gambling uh, prohibition. So um, those rules are already in place. They could be suspended for a season. There are, there are very stiff um, penalties with that associated through the NCAA. So that's one process, and that's already in place. Um, and then we would follow um, our existing processes for um, discipline and that sort of thing that, were, that are already there. Um, and that's what we envision at this point, Mr. Chair. Additional comments or questions from members of the board? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, let, let's move on now to information uh, item B, long range building program and deferred maintenance. Mr. Muffick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the long range building program and deferred maintenance presentation that we're gonna provide here today, I have a guest from uh, the architecture and engineering division that I'll introduce as we get started. Uh, the presentation is to provide background on the long range building uh, process, the, the long range building program, discuss the significant changes to the process, specifically as it relates to changes uh, from uh, recent legislation. I also wanna talk about strategies for uh, funding deferred maintenance as we move forward. I know that's been an interest of the board and of the commissioner's office. It's identified as one of our uh, risks under our enterprise risk management uh, process. Presentation is pretty detailed. Uh, it will serve as a reference document going forward and it'll provide some historical data as well as uh, discussing next, next steps. Uh, at this time, with your uh, approval, Mr. Chair, I'd like to introduce Russ Catherman. To my left here, Russ is the Division Administrator for the Department of Administration's Architecture and Engineering Division. Uh, a and &E and Russ are critical and close partners with the university system on construction projects. Uh, Russ is here to discuss a and &E's role, kind of explain that to, to everyone, uh, provide detail, uh, answer questions, uh, and uh, provide his overall expertise. So with that, Mr. Chair, with your approval, I'll uh, turn the mic over to Russ. Mr. Afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members. I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with you this morning and put a face to the, the state's long range building program and uh, be available for questions. Uh, just be uh, really quick here. I know the state's building program and processes and projects, uh, which I know uh, Mr. Muffick will go through in some detail, appears to be a bit unique as it relates to many functions within the university system. Uh, I believe the board is very familiar with uh, needing to get the legislature's concurrence on 
on all projects greater than $150,000, which limit we, we did try to raise this last session and the, the legislature declined uh, to, to move that forward. Um, there are a couple of limited exceptions within statute where uh, we don't need the legislature's uh, approval, one of which you're probably very familiar with. Uh, anything that's 100% revenue producing is one example. Uh, the other is if something's 100% private donations, for instance, we can uh, seek the, the governor's consent. Uh, I think the other, only other uh, one that I'm aware of is anything that's athletic that is then a lease to the, the foundation. Uh, so, the, but the unique piece in the process that many uh, may not be familiar with, which I, I hope to, to kind of uh, lend some clarity to this, this morning, is often you know, why is the A&E division involved in some of these projects through, throughout the system? And uh, that less familiar piece is that the legislature also, uh, from many years of agencies doing uh, their own thing, centralized the requirement, so not only legislative approval of anything greater than $150,000, but any project, regardless of fund type or, or authority, has to, to come through the architecture and engineering division uh, where I need to make a call of either take on the project management, the contracting, the procurement of it, or uh, select to delegate a project to an agency uh, through, so, through MOUs and, and so forth. Um, so we try to make that a positive experience for, uh, for everyone. I would say we don't always hit that target, but we try to do our best uh, throughout the system uh, uh, to do that with all agencies. Um, but uh, to, again, to keep it short and, and brief, uh, but as regents, I know you have a tremendous uh, variety and number of responsibilities, so I really appreciate the, the chance to uh, be here today and, and again give you uh, face to, to reach out to if, if there are questions uh, as well. Uh, but Mr. Chairman, I, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the many dedicated members of the facility services teams that we uh, collaborate with on all campuses and uh, to the, the presidents, chancellors, and deans. Uh, my team interacts daily uh, with many of your facility services members on planning, design, and construction and repair of your buildings. And I just want to share with you uh, that they are some of the finest professionals uh, we have the privilege to collaborate. So uh, again, with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to Mr. Muffick and thanks for the chance to be here. Thank you, Mr. Muffick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the essence of time, I will go through this pretty quickly. Uh, so the Long Range Building Program, maybe Heather, you can do this for me if it's not working from here. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to go through the process, talk about who's part, who participates, talk a little bit about the history of the long range building process, and then talk about how things have changed with House Bill 553 and then some strategies moving forward. Uh, as uh, I believe uh, a number of you on the board are aware, the LRBP, a long range building program process, uh, is uh, quite uh, a lot of number of people involved in it. It's a continuous process. It starts as soon as one legislative session ends. We start planning for the next legislative session. Campuses are quite involved. There's a, uh, uh, the regents are involved, obviously, the commissioners involved, campus presidents and facility staff, A&E, the executive branch, uh, budget office staff. I mean, we, uh, we cover the, the whole uh, university system as well as uh, state government. Um, campuses track and compile projects. Uh, we prioritize needs. The UM affiliation and MSU uh, affiliations work together to prioritize and, and talk about what's going on on each campus and determine where the greatest needs are. We put together a system-wide comprehensive list uh, that we then discuss uh, at the commissioner's office and, and with the leadership from uh, MSU and, and U of M. We look at a number of uh, sources as we go through the process. Uh, we look at capital project plans, the facility condition indexes and deficiency reports, the major uh, maintenance and deferred maintenance lists. Uh, we look at prior LRBP lists, energy conservation lists, adapted renovation needs, new construction needs, and campus master plans uh, as we go through the process. This is something that's been going on for, uh, for decades. Uh, something that we're trying to really uh, fine tune, especially with the new changes uh, from House Bill 553. As we look at uh, the general hierarchy of, of projects, uh, we look at uh, life, uh, and health, life and health safety issues first, major maintenance second, code compliance third, 
uh, operational efficiencies and savings and adaptive renovation and new construction is way down at sixth and uh, planning and preliminary designs are at seventh. So we have a, uh, already a focus as a system of, of looking at what do we have already as, as our buildings, what do we need to do to maintain the safety for our students, faculty and staff and uh, what are the major uh, maintenance projects that we need to address. Uh, I think there's often a, a, a an idea or a perception that the university system is just all about build, 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 and, and that, uh, well, it's great when it does happen, we are very focused on uh, the maintenance of what buildings we have, and we were very respectful to that. Uh, real quickly, the continuous LRBP process that I mentioned, I won't go through these all uh, in detail, but I'll just mention, uh, as we get done with one legislative session, we start planning right away, the campus faculty, or campus facilities people are planning. Uh, the commissioner's office staff is interacting, obviously A&E is involved. There's a, a timeline that we have to meet where we have to get the information to uh, the architecture and engineering division. But at this time of the year, uh, so we're in November, we have uh, already gone through campus planning. Uh, we've already put together on the campuses projected priority lists. Uh, campuses uh, will be meeting, uh, the MSU side has already met and gone over and, and, and uh, we changed the process a little bit, bit this year at uh, President Crusado's urging and it worked quite well where instead of going out to each campus and discussing their projects, we brought the MSU campuses to Bozeman and we sat down so we had more of a holistic uh, view of the MSU side. We're just gonna be scheduled to do that same thing with the U of M side in December. Then in January, we'll sit down, the commissioner, uh, the presidents, uh, Chief of Staff Trevor and I will sit down and we will prioritize uh, the project list. It's gonna be a little more cumbersome this year and I'll get into that uh, as we move forward. Then uh, after we get together in January and prioritize the list, we'll bring an information item to the board in March, which is what we always do. It'll show uh, the projects uh, listed. It'll include uh, capital projects, it'll include major repairs, and it'll include uh, authority only projects. And then in May, those uh, projects will be brought to the board as an action item. Um, then we move forward with uh, uh, the A&E and provide them the uh, list of all of our projects that have been approved by the board and they put it in to uh, uh, what they work with the budget and planning office and the governor's office and it ends up in, uh, some of it ends up in the, uh, the uh, uh, governor's budget. Um, I just noticed Heather pulled up, this is what our list looked like last year. So we had about $200 million in uh, projects last year. If you include the maintenance, you include the major construction, and you include the authority only. If you go to the next slide, Heather, we can show we had a pretty successful uh, uh, 66 session. Romney Hall obviously was a big one, $25 million we received in, in uh, uh, funding from the state with an additional $7 million in authority. Uh, we received $4.25 million in funding from the state for the dental clinic and dental assisting hygiene lab in Great Falls and $2 million. Uh, for the research uh, laboratories and greenhouses, and then we received 4.55 million in uh, deferred maintenance. So let's uh, go to the next slide, if you would, Heather. The authority-only projects, and again, these are the projects where uh, approval by, it needs to be provided by the legislature to expend money that does not require appropriations. So uh, as Regent Nystuen touched on earlier, these are typically private funds when we're fortunate enough to have donors that provide these. We uh, received over 60 million, I think it's 62.5 million in authority uh, from the legislature to do these projects in the future when funding becomes available, quite successful. Uh, so that's kind of the historical update real quickly on how it works and what we had uh, previously, what we had for last uh, session and what we were funded. Uh, going forward, uh, I wanted to talk real quickly about the changes to the long range building process and uh, funding. As I've mentioned numerous times, House Bill 553, it's, uh, it was sponsored by Eric Moore out of Mile City, created a new structure and funding for financing building projects and deferred maintenance and it sets debt limits for the state of Montana. So uh, basically it provided a framework that really wasn't there previously when we would go into the legislature. Nobody, uh, I shouldn't say nobody, but there was always discussion about what is an acceptable debt level? What should we really be bonding for? What's the amount? This followed the state of Utah model. And so what it does is it basically caps state debt at 0.6% of the fair market value of taxable property. And it also uh, caps uh, the obligation for debt service. So uh, as of right now, based on the fair market value for FY22, the uh, estimated amount of debt, the limit of debt that the state of Montana could take on would be $1.05 billion. As of right now, we have 291 million. So we've got 700 uh, plus million available based on the formula. 
whether the, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of uh, decisions that go into that, but we are a long way from the debt limit. As far as the general obligation debt service limit, it's 1.5% of general fund revenue. That's estimated to be 37.7 million for FY22. Right now we're at 8.1 million and it's expected to drop to 6.1 million. So we're not close to, to touching the uh, debt service requirements either. We're about 30 million off from that. So uh, going forward, it provides us a framework. There's a lot of room going forward for us to uh, be able to obtain uh, debt and funding. And so we won't be limited by that, but it actually at least provides us some kind of benchmarks, uh, provides the state some kind of benchmarks. The next slide, uh, LRBP is split into two categories. So before where we have deferred maintenance and we had the capital projects and we had authority only, it's a little bit different. We've got major repair now, replaces de uh, deferred maintenance and capital development uh, is for all the new construction. This is some detail here about uh, the costs and, and how it fits, uh, how projects would fit into either major repair or capital development. Basically, uh, a renovation or repair or replacement with a cost less than 2.5 million will be in the major repair. Anything more than 2.5 million will be in considered capital development. One important distinction here for the major repair is this is guaranteed funded through uh, LRBP funds, which is coal and cigarette tax. And if coal and cigarette tax don't provide the necessary funding, then it's required by law that general fund funding kicks in. So that's, that's gonna be a, a, a big deal for us going forward. Next couple slides, it'll sh I'll, I'll show you how that uh, fits in. So the capital development will be anything over 2.5 million. So the, the major repairs as we move forward, again, our prioritization process will remain the same. We will work with the architecture and engineering division to provide a definitive list going forward. It's gonna change the way uh, as when we pulled up that uh, last session or last uh, approval, uh, last session of projects, we had uh, about 57 million in deferred maintenance projects listed on there. We got 4.55 million from the state and they give it to us as a lump sum in the past. Going forward, we're not gonna get a lump sum. Going forward, we're gonna have to provide specific projects to architecture and engineering division, which then gets prioritized through them, through the budget office, through the governor's office, through the legislature and the specific projects will be funded. So that's gonna be quite different than us being able to say, okay, we want $5 million for roofs for the MSU side and 5 million for the U of M side and 3 million for fire suppression on each side. We're not gonna be able to do that. We're gonna to have to have a very specific list that says building X, we need a roof, building Y, we need fire sprinklers. So that's gonna change what you see in March and going forward what you approve as a board. It's gonna make it a, a quite a bit uh, more critical for us going forward to look at additional sources of funding for maintenance. Because if we have an emergency come up on a campus, we're not gonna be able to go to our, our pot of money for deferred maintenance and say, oh, hey, let's fix the boiler in X hall at, at X campus. We're, gonna, we're not gonna have that uh, luxury anymore. So I'll get into that uh, in a couple more uh, slides here. One other thing I would touch on that as, as Russ and his group put together the prioritization list, they're gonna be looking at the facility condition assessments. They'll play a key role in project prioritization. We're working with Russ and the campuses to uh, develop uh, a consistent process for that, a consistent uh, software solution as well. The good news here uh, is for the FY22, with uh, 2.1 billion in current replacement value, and that's how we're, it's being calculated by the state, we're looking at about $12.6 million available to the state for major repairs. For that's for one year. So if you're looking at it at the biennium, it's about 26 million for deferred maintenance. And this is guaranteed funded through the state. And uh, if you look at the university system, we have, I think it's 68% of the square footage in the, well, we have 68% of the number of buildings owned by the state and 62% of the square footage owned by the state. So uh, over time, I think it would be logical to assume we'll be getting about 60 to 65% of the funding. So we'd be looking at a uh, maintenance funding now of about 13 million a year. To put that in perspective, we've had about 4.55 million this year, 3 million, or this biennium, 3 million last biennium. So we're looking at a significant increase here, three to four million up to 12 or 13 uh, million in uh, funding for deferred maintenance. So let me see where we might wanna go next on this uh, abbreviated version of my presentation. 
Um, Heather, maybe you could pull up the history here of state appropriated cash and LRBP funds. Thank you. Um, so this, I have the two slides here, just wanted to touch base real quickly on these. There's one for the MSU side, one for the U of M side. Uh, we've got about two billion in replacement cost for the value of our, our campuses and uh, we've received about 300 million in funding since 2006 for the university system uh, through cash and bonds through LRBP funds. So we have received a significant amount of funding. Uh, that would be my point on that slide. And just the point, uh, and, and Russ reminds me this all the time and I appreciate that is the university system is a major player when it comes to the, the number of state buildings that we have across the state. There are obviously other major players, corrections, fish, wildlife and parks, military affairs and that, but we are, we are uh, the big dog, so to speak, as it relates to, to state buildings and our impact on uh, deferred maintenance and, and all that across the state. So let's go to deferred maintenance and life safety. So here's kind of the, this is the sticker shock one for deferred maintenance. We, we believe, and through our facility condition assessments and all the work that our campuses do, we have over 400 million in deferred maintenance system-wide, probably closer to 500, so maybe 450 million in deferred maintenance. Our campuses, as I said, conduct facility condition assessments and reports on the building. We received 1% of what uh, we have across the system at 4.55 million, and I mentioned we had 3 million last time. I know addressing deferred maintenance and life safety needs is a focus of the board. So we've got some potential strategies for what we do going forward. So on the next slide, it says uh, we got maybe these aren't mutually exclusive. We can continue to rely on state funds, the House Bill 553 and the $13 million that would likely come in our way on average per year. So about 25 million biennium. We can set, we can develop set aside requirements for campuses, maybe a percentage of the overall budget and uh, we can also talk about establishing deferred maintenance exigency funds. Uh, we met with the CFOs yesterday, Deputy Commissioner Trevor and I did, uh, and uh, we went over the concept. We have a draft policy uh, that we're looking at uh, that we would likely bring to the board at one of our next meetings, maybe in January or March. So next steps, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, we're looking at the, the establishment of the funds. We want to uh, continue to work with A&E. Uh, I think our relationship ha has uh, further developed, particularly from the commissioner's office the last uh, three or four years. And uh, we want to continue to work with them on the facility condition assessment and improvements. It's critical for us to be involved with uh, the facility condition assessments if we want to continue to receive uh, the appropriate share for our uh, maintenance. If, if we kind of blow that off and other agencies are, are, are better at it than us, I think uh, that we could suffer. The good news is we are very good at those uh, at, at our campuses and we are uh, quite a bit ahead of the uh, other state agencies as far as doing assessments. So um, as I mentioned, possible new board policy which will uh, authorize campuses to take some funds from their general operating fund any uh, funds that they have uh, due to operational efficiencies, they, they could move over to uh, a deferred maintenance fund, similar to what they can do with scholarship funds and retirement funds. And uh, maybe some additional language to encourage campuses to maintain a certain dollar amount or certain percentage uh, in those funds for the emergencies that we know will happen and that we're concerned we won't have uh, that, that lump sum of funding to address uh, those, those issues that we've had before. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I would uh, end my report, stand for any questions from me or Mr. Catherman as well. Thank you, Mr. Muffick. That's, that's a great report. Um, I, I do have a question. Sometimes in the Montana University system, we get wound around the axle with regard to how, how we can construct or, or um, rehabilitate academic buildings versus auxiliary buildings. And I think that, I think that particularly outside of uh, this board table and those of us that are involved in higher education on a daily basis, it gets very confusing. Why, why can't we use state funds to renovate the dorm? Why can't we construct the athletic facility with those state funds? Can, can you just talk a little bit about that on the record so we know? You interested in that? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I can, I'll, I'll let Mr. Catherman address that and then I might jump in as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, there is uh, some limitations within statute on, on how those, those funds are categorized. And uh, unless there's a specific authorization by the legislature of state funds to, uh, to an auxiliary's building, uh, then we could not use state dollars. 
uh, that way because it's, it's simply in the, the manner of the way the state appropriates the funding uh, each session uh, that, that puts that limit in place. So you would need uh, direct action by the legislature for uh, something that's non-academic. Uh, I hope that helps um, clarify that. But what you're saying is that if the legislature authorized an expenditure for an athletic facility, it's, it's entirely possible to do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I understand uh, the question correctly, uh, the, the legislature did years ago, of course, authorize construction of athletic facilities and did pay, uh, pay for those. Uh, but the trend has been uh, over, over the years, over the sessions, to um, separate the auxiliaries into more of a business function to try and have it uh, finance itself, if you will. And um, so it would, it would take specific legislative action when, uh, when long-range dollars are appropriated uh, by the legislature to, uh, to my office, they are separated into those categories between academic and, um, and the auxiliaries. One, one uh, good aspect of that is the general spending authority that the, the legislature does provide, but it does uh, state in there that, that that does have to be non-state. Uh, funds for use, but it could be grants, uh, donations, um, auxiliary funds, et cetera. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I could, I think in, in general, broad brush, uh, if, if it's an auxiliary facility funded 100% by the auxiliary fees, uh, the board has much more authority than under uh, academic buildings. Academic buildings, we still need legislative authority or in some rare instances, the governor's authority. So. Uh, you're looking at athletic facilities, you're looking at dining halls, you're looking at uh, dorms. Those are the kind of things that this board can approve and move forward with. In addition, we can also approve, uh, you can approve the board uh, planning and design for, for all types of buildings. So, Thank you. Additional questions? Regent Nystuen. Thanks, Chair Toss. Uh, a half a billion dollars in deferred maintenance and life safety is uh, is. I have a tough time getting my head around that. And I'm sure that the university system buildings are not the only ones across the state that have that level of priority. But the concern I have is, uh, is this reflected in insurance rates that we pay, a risk that we uh, inherently have as a result of having these things identified and yet not doing anything and just deferring, deferring, deferring? Um, is there, I mean, where, where are we with insurance and risk and, and exposure because we are not able to keep pace with what needs to be done? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Regent, uh, that's uh, an excellent question. I don't uh, have the answer for you. We would need to get in contact with our risk management and toward defense group uh, to find out how all of that's structured. I can uh, tell you that the, the state inventory is part of the broader um, solicitation, if you will, for uh, underwriters and carriers when the state does go out and, and seek for those services. I would add, Mr. Chair, Regent Nystuen, if I could, uh, we're not alone in this. This is a nationwide concern, so I wouldn't say that we would be uh, uh, our insurance would be higher than maybe say this the North Dakota state system would be uh, based on their condition of their buildings it's likely similar to what ours are so if you're looking at a, a national underwriter they're looking at us all fairly the same Regent Lazar uh, thank you mr. chair so just just want to see if I'm understanding this correctly around deferred maintenance um, we received 4.5 or so million dollars for deferred maintenance in the system. Yeah, under this new um, strategy, this new plan, House Bill 553, the system will receive up to approximately $13 million annually uh, for deferred maintenance. Mr. Chair, that would be correct, but it wouldn't be a lump sum amount like we received in the past. It would be per project. So it might be $300,000 for the roof on X Hall and $500,000 for the roof. So on that this $13 hall. million dollars includes both capital development as well as major repair. No, that's not, that's not, that's not true. It is just for uh, maintenance, just but for it's specific per project. 
I believe it's another 20 million that's set aside annually for capital development, but it's not required to be funded like deferred maintenance. Right. It's, it depends on uh, the legislative decisions. If I could, Mr. Chairman, one, one quick adder to that is the legislature uh, has put into 553 a restriction on itself that it has to fully fund that major repair account before approving any capital development. So they, they, they need to put in enough to do that calculation on the replacement value. And we estimate that that's about the 25 million per biennium uh, to defer maintenance. So it's a good start. And uh, the idea behind the 0.6 uh, of the replacement value is to see is, are we going to make progress uh, on, on reducing that, that $400 million number, uh, which, is, which is the use system portion only, right? We need to add the rest of the state inventory in on top of that as well. It's it's big big number big challenge. Additional questions or comments? Additional questions or comments from members of the board? Um, very informative. Thank you. This has been a great presentation. I appreciate your uh, your being here today. Uh, Chair Lozar, we are uh, beyond the bewitching hour for lunch, and so is it your desire to take the lunch break at this point and then come back? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we don't want to keep the uh, folks waiting and the food waiting. It's uh, let's uh, transition to. Sorry. What what we'll do is we will conclude the work of the budget committee. Uh, we, we do have a one additional item, um, which is shared services update. Um, we are going to hold that to the next meeting, if that's ex if that's okay with everybody. Um, we have a very very big agenda here uh, today, uh, a less big agenda in January. So so let's let's move that shared services item to our agenda in January. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes the Budget Committee uh, uh, report today. Uh, thank you, Chair Tuss. Uh, with that, we will uh, break for lunch. Uh, it looks like um, the Regents will be with uh, student representatives at uh, Lee Lounge, and then um, our guests will be meeting or having lunch in Ballroom D of the sub. All right, we're going to get back underway. Uh, this afternoon, we've got um, we've got a couple committee meetings that uh, we're going to work through before we dive into uh, the two-year education and community college uh, committee meeting. I wanted to extend uh, gratitude to Gallatin College for the tour that we just went on—a a fascinating tour going out to the East Campus. So, uh, thanks to Gallatin College for uh, sharing your students and your facilities with us. With that, I'm going to pass the meeting over to uh, Chair of the Two-Year and, and Community College Committee, uh, Regent Nystuen. Chair Nystuen. Thank you, Chair Lozar. Uh, you know, just before we get, to, as we're getting settled here, I'd, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the work that was done by the Shared Services Group, the guiding documents and the types of categories. It's, it was unfortunate today we didn't find the time or we couldn't have had the time to do that. So I, I would like to acknowledge uh, that this is clearly a pending item that needs uh, considerable, considerable discussion and, uh, and so forth. So with that, uh, welcome to the two-year Education and Community College Committee. Uh, we've got about an hour. We're a little bit behind schedule already as we start here. And this afternoon, we've got a couple items related to, uh, to advance. Um, the first one, uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, shall we queue up the Become an Alum Program update? With that, I'll throw it to you, Brock. Uh, uh, Chair nice student members of the board, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, a nice agenda. Uh, the first item will be 
uh, a report from our commissioner from the Department of Labor and Industry, Galen Hollenbaugh. Then we'll have actually a panel of two year leaders who will talk a little bit more about our year of assessment, engagement, and planning. Uh, we will uh, uh, kick it off with, with this update from Commissioner Hollenbaugh in a partnership between the University of Montana, the Missoula College, and the Department of Labor and Industry, really geared around uh, one important portion of our resident student access initiative, which is connecting with uh, students in Montana, 120,000, 130,000 who have some college but no degree. Uh, we know this is an important segment of our, our resident, uh, potential resident student population, and this is a really uh, important pilot. I think we're going to learn a lot about the results of this effort. So it's uh, 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 Commissioner Hollenbaugh here to give us uh, a brief update, and I imagine you'll stick around for some questions afterward. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, indeed, I will. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Galen Hollenbaugh. I'm the Commissioner of Department of Labor and Industry. It's indeed a pleasure to be back here in front of you again to give you a sort of a final update, if you will, of where we have come to uh, with our Become an Alum effort. And uh, it's, this is becoming a bit of a, a signature project that the Department of Labor and Industry has been focusing on and working on with higher education, and particularly with the University of Montana, as we all begin to uh, figure out ways that we can engage the workforce in Montana and make sure that we're fulfilling the needs of businesses and, and getting, getting the jobs filled so that our economy continues to grow in this state. So, what I thought I'd do today is to take, I know a lot of you have heard some of this project, so this will be a bit of a quick review for you, but for those of you that are just tuning in or listening or have, do not have uh, an idea of what this project truly is, what I want to do with this presentation is just give you a, a quick situation analysis of the workforce issues that we're facing and what's caused this, uh, back it up with a little bit of supporting uh, economic information and some of the background in terms of how we got here, and then give you some of our process steps that the Department of Labor and Industry engaged in in terms of staff involvement, uh, uh, operational involvement with the pilot project, and then finishing up with some lessons learned in the, in the couple of months that have been working on this, and then actually have a few questions of this group in terms of our next steps and where you'd like to see this go from here. So with that, um, let's take a little bit of a look at where we are today. You've all heard lots of people from the Department of Labor and Industry uh, talking about um, our ongoing workforce shortage in Montana. Uh, confronting that shortage has been our biggest challenge over the past few years, and we know that this is going to continue into the future. Uh, we here in Montana, uh, along with the rest of the country, we have, a, we have demographic challenges. Uh, our boomers are retiring. Uh, over the next 10 years, we expect about 100,000 of them in Montana to leave the workforce. And our projections, as most of you have heard, uh, show that we only have about 90,000 individuals coming in behind them to fill the jobs. So as you can see, we have a bit of a gap that we need to address. And you can also see some of the consequences of this demographic shift in our unemployment rate. Our seasonally adjusted unemployment rate hasn't been above 4% since September of 2016. Uh, and it was only 4.1% then. And generally, you tend to think of, hey, a low unemployment rate's pretty good. Uh, but when you have an unemployment rate that lasts that long for that low, what economists will start to tell you is we are entering what's called a constrained labor market, where businesses are just not able to grow uh, because they can't find workers to fill the jobs. So how do we help businesses, or how do we uh, address a workforce shortage. And one of the ways that we do that, and businesses look to do that, is by improving productivity. Uh, working efficiently can minimize some of the effects of needing more workers, but in addition to that, what we see with the businesses, they step forward to with additional investments in equipment and technology. What that leads us to is we also have to invest in worker training. Now in Montana, a burning glass analysis of the 71,000 online job postings found that half require a credential or a degree, and another 25% are classified as middle skill, which likely require more than a high school diploma. So that leads us to, you know, Governor Bullock began to recognize or recognize that, that we do need skilled workers to help us fill this workforce gap and to help us continue our economic growth. So he joined a growing number of states who were setting attainment goals uh, 
and early in his tenure declared that in Montana, we would increase the number of individuals with a degree, certificate, or credential from 40% to 60% by 2025. He then convened the Future Ready Cabinet, some of you are members of that, uh, in 2018 to re-examine that goal and to make some adjustments, and the goal is now 61%. But I'll tell you this, that 1% growth is still going to be a pretty heavy lift when we start looking at the, this, the workforce required in this state. So, in partnership with the private sector, as we start to look towards the, the bottom part of this slide here, in, in partnership with the private sector, DLI has uh, helped make some progress toward this goal by strengthening our registered apprenticeship program and increasing our focus on work-based learning programs, very much like uh, this pilot project, which has become an alum, uh, which is what I'm here for today. Now, the economic picture that we look at, or what we talked about, is, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman talked about, the data that we have, we know there's 120,000 Montanans that have some college credit, but no degree. Uh, the Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce forecast that by next year, 69% of jobs will require post-secondary education and training to meet that demand. And, and in order to meet that demand, we need to engage or re-engage people in education and training. So with that in mind, uh, we reached out with the University of Montana in terms of to, to set up this pilot project uh, with the, the existing Become an Alum effort at the University of Montana. Now what we did in setting this up as you start to look towards the, that bottom slide there is we reached out to about 5,000, we set up this universe of about 5,000 individuals who left U of M in the past five years without completing a degree and who didn't enroll anywhere else and were still within a reasonable distance of Missoula. I believe we set that at about, I think we set it at 50 miles, but it might be 100, uh, I'll have to, to, to double check that. But as you can see, as we broke down uh, the, the individuals that were within that universe, the uh, Department of Labor and Industry took the lead on working with individuals with under 30 credits. Uh, we suspected that those individuals would likely be closer to our typical client base through our job services office that we work with daily to try to re-engage in the workforce, so we figured that the re-enrollment process was closer to, to our mission. So the process that we used to, to begin our outreach. Uh, you can see from this slide uh, some of the methods that we use to contact our target audiences. Remember, this is new for us. It's uh, job service offices, workforce services offices. We aren't as much in the business of active outreach and more people that are coming to us. We do, we act, do some outreach with businesses, looking for what people need, but this was a much different type of outreach process than we are typically engaged with. So through these, through these different methods of, of contacting folks, uh, we, were, we were informed by some marketing folks and some mission folks to tell us that uh, they typically aim to have about nine different touches for prospective students. So with that in mind, we started working towards that goal. Now, so here's a, just a quick snapshot of some of the efforts that we used for outreach. From left to right on the screen here, the, the main one, we, the Department of Labor and Industry established their own web page for, for interaction with prospective students with an embedded video to explain the project. The top uh, was a postcard. So we, we mailed out to everybody that was on the list as we were also checking addresses and trying to confirm that the people we're contacting were at the addresses that we were trying to get in touch with them. Once we did that, the bottom center screen was an email that we sent uh, to folks to try to get them engaged and then the the card on the right is something that our job service offices used as they were out in the community meeting with businesses meeting with prospective employers uh, anybody that was coming in the door we were trying to raise community awareness in terms of what we were doing with the pilot project through a variety of these and just these are just a few of the examples of how we were we were reaching out uh, to to our our prospective universe of students all right, let's talk a little bit about uh, Department of Labor and Industry's investment in, in this, this process. So as you can see, approximately 1,200 staff hours uh, that have gone into uh, this project since July. Now initially, we engaged our entire job service Missoula office, which is about you know, 30 uh, or so uh, FTE that are involved with the, re the job and workforce recruitment effort uh, in February and March trying to define this universe, trying to see what we could do to make this outreach happen. After working through that, we narrowed it down to a group of about 10 people uh, within the job service office that had ongoing daily responsibilities with the Become an Alum uh, effort. 
Moving on into that, as we began to contact more students and actually get them enrolled, what we found was that we needed to have some more direct staff involvement uh, with the university system and with, with the University of Montana in terms of we had to enroll uh, these folks effectively by ourselves. So with those two staff, one embedded at the main campus, one embed embedded at the Missoula College, uh, that's where we began to learn all of those processes necessary. That's not just getting somebody a job. This is actually getting somebody enrolled in the process. And uh, President Bodner, uh, Dean Gallagher, I cannot say thank you enough for your help and assistance in training our staff coming in, teaching them everything th from your enrollment process to how things work with the University of Montana system. It was it's eye opening for us from the job service side of things to recognize what it takes to actually get people enrolled into the university system. So thank you very much. This pilot project would not have been nearly the success without your dedication and commitment to the process. So thank you very much to you and your staffs for, for bringing us uh, on board. Uh, additionally, when we started with this, we had allocated about $50,000 uh, funding for direct student services. And to date, we've used about 10,000 of that, and that goes for everything from, you know, we can, for enrollment services. We can uh, pay for some tuitions, materials, computers, books, that, that sort of thing. So we, we, uh, we have been fairly frugal with our money, but uh, all in all, as you see, the, we, we had a fairly significant investment in this and uh, staff time was uh, paramount and uh, as I'll talk about in terms of lessons learned, this is a very, very staff intensive process that as we hope to build this out with uh, the other campuses across the state, uh, we're look we will engage with you at whatever level that you need if that's what you desire, but we'll, we're ready to make that staff time uh, commitment. All right, so what do we get within, with our enrollment in the past couple of months that we've been working on this? So total fall enrollment uh, is 99 students that have come in. Uh, 52 of those were direct from DLI. Those are ones that we contacted, we brought in, we figured out what they needed, and we got them enrolled. Uh, additional, the Registrar Hickman told us that another 47 came through after hearing and engaging with the Becoming Alum process and recognizing that this was an effort they're being done, but re-enrolled on their own uh, to come into the process. So that's the breakdown of the 99. Uh, the best part about this is this is ongoing and we intend to stay uh, engaged with the University of Montana in this process. It has been, it's a wonderful process that's engaging both private sector and, and government and education. Uh, but we now have 38 more students that are committed, enrolled for spring semester with 70 plus right now that we expect to be enrolled by uh, spring semester. So and that, and that, that number actually is continuing to grow uh, every day. Uh, the 52 students that enrolled this fall, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the programs that they enrolled in. Uh, the medical assisting one ends up being a very large category of that because that's effectively those, those programs and certifications that run doctor's offices. It's everything from coding through reception work through you know, uh, you know, some basic lab intake uh, work. So that's, that's a fairly large field, which is obviously why I think that there's the largest number of uh, people enrolled in that. Okay, moving on. Some of our lessons learned here. We found that in this pilot that we truly needed to work with the individuals, not just to get them in the door, but to address the barriers that caused them to leave in the first place. As I reported to you before, you know, even five years later, after re-enrolling, the reason that people left in the first place can still be there. Child care, caregiving responsibilities, financial uh, issues, life events. Uh, but also what we're finding is if there is a singular issue that seems to run through all of this is there's a reluctance on the part of some of these students to re re-enroll or re-engage in something that they feel that they may have failed at previously. So interestingly enough, that sort of fits the skill set of our workforce services folks who are oftentimes working with folks to re-engage them in the workforce because these are oftentimes folks that we're dealing with when we're trying to get them re-engaged in a job. They may have been laid off, they may not have the right skills, they may have seen their initial career field eliminated. So they're just reluctant to say, wow, there are, there are issues here that I don't know that I'm ready to, to address. So that 
takes us to the second part of this is our initial thought was we'd get into this where we could just engage with the students, figure out what they needed, and would hand them off at the door of the university and say, this is great, uh, welcome to some, some new students for you, get them engaged and get them enrolled. And that's where we quickly realized that this is more of an ongoing relationship. It's not just finding out and finding out who wants to re-enroll. This is truly acting almost as career counselors for folks to say, all right, what do you need? What are your barriers to getting back in? What do you want to do? What are the barriers for you getting those skills? And it really started to become, that's why we find it so, so important to have our staff embedded uh, with your staffs, uh, with the university staff, so that we make sure that nothing is dropped with that. So re to re-engage in education is a big commitment. Uh, most of these individuals we have are employed full time. Uh, they are having to find a way to schedule education back in their lives and the barriers uh, that need to be overcome to do that that are different. So they're in a sense they're like non-traditional students so we do have to look at those things like scheduling and course delivery, uh, childcare and, and their life issues but they also have those traditional student needs like advising. What does it take today to get whatever credential or degree that you're trying to finish? So again, embedding these staff and learning our processes together uh, is, is a big help with this. Now, some of the unexpected partnerships that come from this are really as we start to engage with um, education, labor, and business, we're starting to find that the, the businesses out there are really, really looking for this type of assistance. They're really looking to engage with how are they going to keep their workforce uh, prepared. So job service staff engaged with uh, 35 large and small employers in the Missoula area uh, concentrating mostly on uh, the high demand, good paying uh, employers who were indicating they had difficulty filling their workforce needs. And uh, by soliciting their feedback, uh, both in types of the training that they needed for their employees and wanting to make sure that there was also an opportunity for the folks once they've received their credential to get back in the workforce, we have uh, a group of 16 employers that have really engaged with us to help us continue us this effort. However, uh, the list of employers who are taking an interest, interest in this program after finding out some of the successes is really beginning to grow uh, in Missoula. In fact, one of the best examples I can give of this is after taking a broader view in some of the businesses we've engaged with, this uh, particular business in Missoula was actually contracting out of state to bring in training resources for their workforce. And we're asking them, it's like, well, wait a second, you have a homegrown base of training right here. What do we need to do to engage you with Department of Labor and Industry, the University of Montana, so you can send your workforce here and not have to have that extra expense of trying to find people to come train you. We have people right here that can train you. And that, that's, and right now, actually, we have started down that path with these businesses say, it's here, we can do this locally. So the other lesson learned here is, this is a staff commitment. We've got to step into this. This is, this is not easy. This takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of engagement. And now that we've, we've seen some of this just with the Missoula Job Service Office, we are already starting to train our other job services off across the state, knowing that this is, is coming, and knowing that very, very likely we will need to be engaging very soon with many different institutions. So with that, moving beyond the pilot, what, what, do you, what do we need? What do we need to move forward with? Um, I, as I mentioned, I am happy to engage individually uh, with our job service offices with every campus and any campus that wants to engage with us directly. Or Mr. Chairman, Regents of the Commissioner's Office wishes to have a broader policy statement here to have a broader approach across the system. We're happy to sit at the table at whatever level uh, that you're looking for. But my ask as we're starting to look at this is our re-enrollment strategy. I'm hoping that we can start to set some concrete things in motion here to understand what we're doing with re-enrollment. Because the 120,000 Montanans right now that don't have their degrees, it's great that we're, we are actively seeking to get them re-engaged to help us with workforce needs. But there isn't a business out there that isn't talking about what their workforce of tomorrow needs. And we know that those, that workforce right now are the people that have finished their credential, that have their degrees. They're going to need more skills too. That's the next wave of this. 
and we better get in front of it now with some concrete steps to start figuring out how that person with a bachelor's degree gets the next step and what that continuing education looks like and the lifelong learning that is now going to be required of the future workforce. So that's what I'm, I'm looking to engage with, with you on in terms of setting that sort of policy arc that will continue well into the future. And then, of course, the final report, um, the, the data from this project is going to, and as we continue with this, is, is going to be very, very important. We need to start tracking these folks that, uh, did I turn that off? Probably. Uh, we need to start tracking these folks in terms of, okay, you finish your certificate. What's the impact of that? What was the impact to your employer? Did you go out and start your own business? So we need to start not only tracking what was the benefit for the person that received the increase, the, the finishing of their certificate or degree, but we need to see what the economic impact of that is broader in terms of how did you use that to re-engage with the economy in the state. Now that report and that data will continue to grow far past this administration and the next, but it's one that I think we should be looking at to solidify. I know from the Department of Labor and Industry standpoint, we'll start to feather this into our Labor Day reports and other data that we collect, but we'd like to begin sharing that data with everybody else to make sure that we understand and have the proof of concept here to say, yes, this is how you re-engage your workforce, this is how you train your workforce uh, into tomorrow. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Regents, uh, everybody else in the room, <laughs> uh, I'll stand for questions and discussion in terms of how the project, pilot project worked or what you'd like to see us do into the future. Question, thank you, Commissioner Hollenbaugh. Uh, President Bodner. Mr. Chair, I, I just want to uh, take a moment. I mean, Commissioner Hollenbaugh thanked many people <coughs> on the university side, um, and we had a lot of people that worked very hard on this, but uh, I, I just want to publicly and personally thank Commissioner Hollenbaugh. I mean, this was uh, a huge amount of work. Um, you know, we at the University of Montana, we talked about this, I guess, a year, a little over a year ago. Yeah. We started saying, right, how do we, how do we start tackling this, this population, this 120,000? And uh, it's a really, really tough population to reach. Um, and we, you just can't do it without the partnership from DLI and, and really the, that case management uh, expertise that they have. Um, and, and I think, as you think about this, you have employers on one hand, that have a clear need, and then individuals on the other who have a lot of talent but perhaps uh, need some additional skills, but then in between those two sits higher education, which can feel a bit like a black box and tough to access, and that, that population faces hurdles, that if you can you know, make that black box a transparent one <laughs> uh, through partnership, you can, you can overcome some of those hurdles. So we're, you know, to have a, hopefully over 200 people into this by the, uh, by the end of there, that's a huge impact for this state when we think about the, uh, you know, the, the employer need and our demographic challenge. And I think uh, it, you can see it's been incredibly resource intensive, um, but I really appreciate your work on this, Commissioner Holland. I don't want to build upon what, what, we've, what we've learned here. Thank you, President Bodner. Other questions or comments from uh, Regent Sheehy? Thanks for all this work. It sounds overwhelming. I was very glad to see the next steps, which indicates to me that it's continuing. Do you think that this is sustainable, this, this amount of work over? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, Regent Sheehy, yes, it, it, it has to be. The workforce challenge we have in front of us, we can't ignore it. We have to tackle this. So you can't ignore it. Can't put it at the corner. We have to do this. Thank you. Regent Tuss. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to follow up on Regent Sheehy's um, question. This is a big deal, and this is important. Thank you for being here. Thank you for a great presentation. But, but thank you for engaging the University of Montana in this effort. We really need to take this from a project to a program. We need to take this statewide, and regardless of who, the, who occupies the second floor of the Capitol in the next administration, um, on the mic, on the cameras, and in the record today, I, I really want to emphasize the fact that this is important. The biggest economic development challenge right now in Montana is workforce development. And if we don't do this, I don't know how we're going to solve that problem. So I would encourage the commissioner's office, uh, all of the campuses, and the state of Montana in your capacity to continue to 
you know, keep your foot on the gas on this. Um, I think this is incredibly important for the state of Montana long term. Thank you for your leadership on this. Thank you, Regent Tuss. And you know, the, the other engagements that we've had here, we're already continuing the partnership in terms of working on the, uh, the portal that's working on it and making sure that we have absolutely shared all of our data and the dashboard stuff that we have in terms of wage uh, information and how that, where the jobs are in the state. We want to make sure you have full access to that so as you're informing your students across the state, you're using our data that's real-time data that we can get to you. So yeah, even from this pilot project, we're starting to see all of these other things that we need to be engaged with higher education on to make sure that everybody's aware of what you can do and what you need to do in the state. Thank you for those great comments. Uh, Regent Tuss, I'd, I'd like to echo that. Every time I know I go to the Montana Chamber of Commerce, they're talking about this. The Montana High Tech Business Alliance, all these various associations and groups that we work with in the spirit of economic development, which is your day job. I mean, this is all they talk about is r workforce. And you know, as a private sector employer, we see it all the time too, so thank you. Uh, Regent uh, Lozart, did you have a question, a comment? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just, you know, I would echo uh, all the kudos that um, have been appropriately handed to you and, and your team. Um, you know, going back to uh, Regent Tuss's comment about going from a pilot uh, or a project to a program and your some of the takeaways that you've learned in surveying um, this po population, uh, did you get a sense of uh, a better understanding of what some of the barriers were or some of the logic or reasons why um, these students dropped out? And if so, what do we need to do if we're going to expand this into a, more of a program across campuses? What do we need to do to prepare our campuses for uh, this particular population of students? Yeah, uh, Regent Lozar, yeah, that's part of what President Bader was talking about. This is a tough nut to crack because the population is so diverse. It's so hard to get in touch with. It's so hard to understand. The, the, the reasons that are given are as varied as the day is long. It, and it truly is. There isn't a single reason. But again, like I said, what we did see at the end is this reluctance to re-engage because they thought they were a bit of a, you know, if anything, it's like, oh, it didn't really work out last time. It was really hard. How am I going to fit in again? It's been too many years. It doesn't work. So I would say if there's anything, it's fear that you're kind of combating to say, no, it's don't be afraid to re-engage. Things have changed. It's a whole different world in education than it was when you were here, even though it was five years ago. So it's about walking people through. Again, this is, this is like career counseling. It, it's working and case managing people from the beginning to the end, walking them through saying, it's just a process. How to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Here's what you need to do. Here's how we'll help you get through with it. And here's what you get at the end. President Cruzado, did, yes. did you have a question or comment? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair and Mr. Commissioner, thank you so much. It's always good to see you. Um, and Regent Sheehy asked, is this sustainable? And then my question was going to be, is this scalable, right? And I, I hear that that's what the Board of Regents would like for us to, mm -hmm. to, to do. So in terms of next steps, what would you recommend? I can clearly see other campuses like City College and Great Falls College and Galton College, Northern, being ready to engage as well. Mm -hmm. So what would your recommendation for us would be? Right. It, it's, yeah, it's hard. You, know, you want to do everything all at once, and that's tough. You need to scale it up. Uh, I would think initially working from the business side, the first things that they're looking for is uh, a bit of the work on uh, micro-credentialing in terms of, I would point to the uh, advanced technology group out of Missoula coming in saying, all right, we need some quick hitters here just to train people up on a very specific skill set that we want to come in and handle this very narrow piece of what we're trying to do with our business. That's why I think you're going to be engaging with your two-year colleges, city colleges, those folks that are likely able to respond more quickly with a quick hitter. Those, those you know, couple weeks, three weeks, five weeks uh, classes. The second step in terms of scaling is going to take a little bit more thought. And that's where you start re-enrolling people in degree programs, where, you, where we need to start looking at how are we going to use work experience of somebody that's been out for five years to apply it to credits that may already exist? Uh, part of the reason that it's hard to get some people back is it's like, oh man, I don't have two years to engage in some of this. But we, if we can work with those prospective people, students that want to re-enroll to say, wait a second, 
let's take a look at what you've done in your career. Does any of that apply to this coursework that you may not have had when you initially started at school, but it really is going to take that sort of effort to get over the hump to say, all right, you might have had two years left if you were running your regular course, but if you come back, you did five years as a you know accounting intern firm, okay, we can probably knock off some of those account accounting classes and see if we can move you through the program faster to get that degree done faster. So it's in terms of scaling, it will take some planning. It, we have to get around the table with each different institution to say, let's do some polling of the businesses in your community. Let's find out what their need is. Let's see what we can address immediately. Then take the next bite. Okay, what is the long-term need here? We're looking at our businesses that are growing. What business, what are you looking at in terms of your investment in the future? How do we help you plan for that? So I'd say that's sort of a two-step process for and that. quick follow-up. Is there a person, is there a contact uh, that we should start thinking about how to initiate this planning yeah. with uh, the department? Or with you directly? Yeah, work all with right, me. Perfect. I'll all stand right. in for that. And, uh, but likely all of this work will, will begin and be done through our Workforce Services Division. So our division administrator there, his name is Scott Eichner, uh, who we will, we will be tasking with uh, driving a lot of this down through our job services offices across the state. Very good. Uh, Regent Miller. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for all of your work on this. Um, the success of this program has been staggering. I'm really excited to see the future of it. Um, and that brings me to my question is, as the Board of Regents, what can we do to help turn this pro program um, into a statewide um, project, or project into a program? There's two ways. If we want to start it as, uh, let's get everybody around the table here. If you want to set up a separate committee from this to say, how do, let's create this as a project that the entire uh, campus community will be following this, let's get around the table. Or they said, if you want us to engage individually with each campus, sort of location by location or city by city, we're happy to do that. So I think that's, those are your options. How do you want to engage with us? Well, we can do either, or if there probably even a third option you might, might have come up with, but we'll engage with you. So we have job service offices across the state. We're able to do this. We're getting trained up uh, on this, and I think we're ready to step in as soon as you want us. Uh, Regent Dombrowski. Uh, thank you. It, it occurs to me that when we say the word case management, it is so many parallels to healthcare, mm. and it's sort of a, a bit of a one by one because there's so many complexities in people's lives. So I wonder if a piece of getting at the barriers, we can't probably systematically or even scale those, but, but there is probably some parallels that we could think through even with people. For example, you know, we might find someone who's really struggling with um, their health care needs because they haven't been able to have, find meaningful work. And then we would take it that next sense and, or a stable home. And again, in Missoula with our homeless initiatives, we're, we're out in front. So I think there might be even a, another or a deeper part of this pilot that we might explore in Missoula for the sake of learning and then extending it to scale. So it probably is getting around the table and thinking about that, I might suggest. And your industry Thank partners you. can very much help with that. The hospital association's already been in contact with me. They're doing their member surveys right now and they're actually looking at that Medicaid population that's out there. We have our very successful help link program, which also is very much like a case link effort to remove barriers to get people into the workforce because boy, did you hit the nail on the head. You got a lot of healthcare issues out there that are pretty hard to overcome, but we can work through that with the Medicaid expansion dollars. Well, thank you, Commissioner Hollenbaugh. This has uh, been very in enlightening, and I think uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, let's keep this as an ongoing agenda item for our future Regents meetings to uh, evaluate our success in, in, sure. in do doing this, especially in light of what uh, Regent Tuss had talked about. Well, the, the, we just got to keep our foot on the gas pedal and full steam ahead. So with that, any final comments, uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, before we have a great segue to the next uh, item? <laughs> That's right, uh, Chair Nystuen, members of the board. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, uh, Commissioner, and we will make this a recurring item and certainly um, our office, my team, is happy to facilitate some of these system-wide uh, discussions so that we can turn this into a, a full-scale program. Uh, you can't ask for a better partner than our Department of Labor and Industry, and it's, it, it holds true for this project, also the portal. All of it ties back to um, this discussion we've been having, and it's about reaching 
uh, new kinds of students. Some of them are adult learners with some college, no degree. Some of them are going to be uh, folks with a degree but need some upskilling and retooling. And then certainly some of them are, are students who might not be thinking about four-year education right now but want to connect with one of our uh, two-year institutions. And as we move into the next item on the agenda, Just I'll invite... Just queue it up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll invite uh, four of our, our two-year leaders uh, <clears throat> to, to the chairs here. And, and I'm going to ask each one of them a, a, a question about... Um, this, this particular stage of our year of assessment, engagement, and planning. Thanks, Galen. <laughs> uh, our year of assessment, engagement, and planning. I mean, you, you could argue, and I, I bet it's a safe argument, two-year education's never been more prominent, never more important in this state. Uh, and, and you really work on, on two ends of the spectrum there. One is expressing uh, the value of two-year education to potential students. And the other one, to echo President Bodner and others, is to reduce the barriers to entry. So that no matter what type of student we're talking about, we make it as easy as possible for those students to find options within our two-year system to enroll and then to succeed. Um, this year uh, started really in September for us, and, and we heard from actually all 12 of our two-year leaders about mission fulfillment in the system. And uh, I, I'm cognizant of our time. I don't want to dive and do a recap of that. But it was really inspiring for me, for me to hear a little bit about how, uh, for example, at MSU Northern, we were working with Native American students on tribal college transfer through the Little River Institute. Um, we had out in, in Glendive at Dawson, the, the welding competition with the high school students in, in partnerships with the industry uh, represents another part of the mission. Dean Gallagher, the apprenticeship programs at Missoula College. It was a really a heartening conversation. And from here on out, what we'd like to do is to start to focus the conversation a little bit. In May, uh, in Haver, uh, what I'd like for us to do is actually have a set of, of action items uh, for the board to look at with respect to two-year education and the way that, that you all as board members can, can better support uh, two-year education in the state. Between now and then, it's about paring down this general discussion of mission fulfillment into uh, a more specific discussion about issues that are sort of both challenges and opportunities for our two-year institutions. And we've got four leaders uh, in front of you, and I think we'll kind of hit four topics uh, today. I imagine we'll follow up on some of these items uh, throughout the winter and into our March meeting. Uh, but my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Dave Gercheck, uh, Dean Susan Wolf, Dean Tom Gallagher, and, and President Jane Karras. Uh, we haven't overly rehearsed this, but I think each one of you knows uh, at least what kind of question is coming and We've had a lot of discussions over the last, uh, the last couple of months about um, next steps in our own area. And Heather, if you don't mind, if we can move on to the, the next presentation, that would be helpful. Um, I've, asked, uh, I've asked each of these leaders to consider just kind of an initial uh, response to a, a, a prompt. And, and the first prompt that we talked about was, I guess, um, related to kind of communicating the, the value of, of two-year education um, and the fact that the two-year path for many, many of our students is actually the best path. And it's not just the best path if you're interested in a terminal associate's degree or a credential, something specifically related to career and technical education. It could very well be the best path for you if you're interested in transfer education. It might be great for you to start nearby in an institution that has smaller class size, perhaps specific programs uh, that, that suit your, your, your needs, your academic needs. Um, yet we know that we don't always hear about the two-year path as the most valuable option in the state. And I think, uh, uh, unless I'm mistaken, Dean Gercheck, you were going to speak to your experience with communicating that value of the two-year path and uh, maybe give us a glimpse of what we could work on over the next several months as, as we think about bringing an action item or two to the board. Sure. Mr. Chair, Deputy Commissioner, members of the board, you know, um, two-year education is one of the best-kept secrets in Montana. You know, 47% nationally undergraduates go to two-year education colleges. So they had they had two-year colleges to either obtain career technical education or to obtain their first two years of college and then transfer to a four-year college because the tuition is a little bit lower. You know, from what we see is that 
we at Highlands have two types of students. We have, a, we have a student who comes to us because we provide them with an opportunity because their GPA or their ACT scores aren't very good, so we give them an opportunity for a future. Or we have students who really choose us to come for the career technical education, or they're, they're kind of smart shoppers and they come to us because they're gonna get their first two years of college at a reduced rate. I wanna tell you about a student that that uh, Montana Tech um, uh, staff member um, had some opinion about, and this was a staff member that was her daughter, and her daughter spent a lot of time investigating, you know, really forward thinking, and decided, I'm gonna come to Highlands for two years and get my AS degree and then transfer to UM. And she was so excited, and so as the mom was telling me this, I said, you should be really proud of her, you know, I mean, she is really forward thinking, you know, she, she's figuring out the price and everything else, you know, and it's like, well, she, you know, she's looking at that, uh, the investment on, uh, or the return on her investment on this, and she saw Highlands was the choice. I said, well, good for her, and the mom said, not anymore, she really feels kind of disheartened because after she's told people that, they try to talk her out of that. Why would you go to a two-year school? Why don't you just go right to U of M? Well, as I said, there's a misconception, and that misconception is pretty simple. We have people in the, throughout the state that think that two-year education is not the same as four-year education. Yet Highlands, our program, our classes still have to be vetted the same way that our engineering classes and everything else is, so that doesn't make sense to me. But it dawns on me that, that we have first individuals who've gone through four-year education, so this is the pathway they know, so they think that's the best, or, and we still live with this, and I think every two-year college in the state has to deal with this, we're still Votex, we're 30 years ago. And so because of that, that misconception is really causing some problems for us. So from my perception, I think that as we go forward, we need to kind of fix this communication problem. Because right now, at nationally it's 46% or 47%, Montana is at 26% for undergraduates attending to your colleges. So we gotta figure out a way to hit the mark. Thanks, Dean Kerchuk. Um, I, uh, Chair Nice student, I might suggest that we work through um, the four prompts and then if there are questions from the board that might that might make sense. And um, certainly, uh, Dean Gerchek, we, we've heard quite a bit about the importance of outreach um, into, into the K through 12 world, make sure that we're connecting not just with, with students and parents, but also counselors, teachers, uh, in, in growing some awareness about uh, the two-year opportunity. Again, both in the CTE area, but, but in, in general education and transfer as well. So I think that's a priority for, for all of us moving forward. And I know we've got a few folks in our office, but also some great partners at OPI and DLI and on your campuses that can help us in that respect. Uh, on a related note, I might shift to, to President uh, Karras to offer some thoughts about communicating value in, in a different way or in a different direction, which is to potential employers. And in such a tight labor market, I think sometimes uh, it's, it's uh, tempting for employers to go after um, any warm body or really anyone that can step in and perform the task. But we believe in what we're doing for our students at, at our two-year campuses. And we're working hard to make sure that employers understand the value of the technical skills, the employability skills that they get on those two-year campuses, and we hope that that factors into the hiring decision and, and the wage discussion. And I think you have some great experience in that area that you could share. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee and the board, uh, Commissioner Christians, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, just, I just want to add one thing to what Dean Gerchik said about students. I think one of our biggest challenges is especially apparent this weekend when everybody wants to be a cat or a grizz. Nobody wants to be at any of the other campuses. It's a, a cultural thing in Montana that does impact all of us. Um, in terms of employers, I do think the two-year colleges do a great job of working closely with employers, um, whether for all of our career and technical education programs, we have local advisory boards made up of local employers. Those employers are very clear to us what they expect, what they want. They understand the value of a two-year degree, but they very rarely offer a pay differential. Now, certainly in certain careers where licensure requires a two-year degree, maybe it's in healthcare and nursing and dental hygiene, 
those programs, EMT, paramedicine, you have to have that two-year degree to pass a national licensing exam to be um, approved to uh, work in that field. But so many of our other students, for example, in welding programs, our students can get a welding certificate or welding certification without even completing a certificate or a degree. And employers just want those welding skills right now. As you said, this is a job market where employers are happy to pay for a warm body that will show up and be there and they can help train them themselves if they don't already have all those skills. So for us, um, again, it's that culture, I think, and perception. If you compare the United States or to Europe and the value put on two-year degrees in the current technical field, but also when you look, as, as you said, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, about the transfer degrees as well, that many states, there is a benefit to students who transfer already having a two-year degree from a two-year to your transfer degree from to your institution. That isn't really a benefit in Montana. You can take your gen eds, you can take a few classes, you can transfer easily, which is great, but the data does show that students who have that two-year experience and two-year degree are more successful in completing their four-year degree in fewer years and with a higher grade point average, therefore saving themselves in the state money. Same thing for employers, those students who are well-prepared, when they go to the employer, they're more likely to stay there, to be productive, and to continue being a good employee. So um, I think it's a very complex issue that we really need to take some time to look at. We've done a great job over the years in sharing that information. I think, as I said earlier, many employers are aware of the value of a two-year degree, but for a number of reasons, they can hire employees without that degree, and so therefore there is no reason for them to have that pay differential and for students then to spend the money on a two-year degree when they can get that job without it. Uh, uh, thank you, President uh, Karras. Uh, again, I, on, a, on a bit of a, a segue, I suppose, um, if, we're, if we are communicating the value of that two-year degree uh, and expressing to employers why it's uh, something that they should look to when making a hiring decision or, or establishing a wage, um, it seems important for us to discuss exactly what kinds of, of, of skills, both technical, but also employability or, or essential skills, students are picking up as part of their uh, certificate or, or degree program. And I've had a lot of conversation, even this morning at the, the faculty breakfast, this, this notion of hearing from industry that they want graduates who can perform the technical um, uh, tasks required, but who have great time management, discipline, they're respectful, they can communicate, um, they, they understand how to improve over time. How do we think about embedding those kinds of training into our two-year degrees, uh, either explicitly or through our existing curriculum? And, and Dean Gallagher, maybe you could share a, a thought or two in that respect. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so much, Commissioner Tessman, Commissioner um, Christian, and, and, uh, and Mr. Chair, and and regents, um, we, we do spend a lot of time talking about technical skills. That kind of consumes a, a majority of our discussions when we, uh, when we start talking about what we're trying to do in a two-year colleges. And sometimes we miss the mark when we don't talk about these other skills. And there's, there's a certain subset of transferable skills that are needed in every single profession that's out there. And we refer to these in a number of different ways. We might call them soft skills, might call them professional skills. Um, I'll use the term human skills. Uh, so, so if we kind of develop a list of what those might be, uh, interpersonal communication is, is, uh, is super important for everyone, and that's both having strong verbal communication, but also recognizing that we're, uh, there's an elevated need in the digital age for strong written communication as well, having those skills that somebody can write a, a, a well thought out email message, concise to the point, um, but also in a way that, that adequately convenes the um, particular values maybe of an institution or a business. Um, being able to get along with others. That sounds like something we learn in kindergarten, but that continues to be an issue in the workplace. Building relationships with customers. Um, teamwork. Building relationships with the other employees on a team. You know, that's a, an essential skill. Uh, work ethic. Uh, accepting professional criticism. Being able to be coachable. When somebody says we need to make a modification, being able to make that modification without um, being significantly um, um, upset about that. Accepting professional criticism is an important part for all of us. Uh, empathy, serving others, caring for others, compassion, tolerance, 
Uh, these, are, these are the human skills that, that we need to coach and teach, and they're transferable across every domain. So we have opportunities. We have some challenges with this, too. The, the opportunity is we're listening. We're hearing those, uh, those values that are brought forward by employers. We don't have all the answers all the time, but, but faculty, I know, are working on it. Uh, at all our two-year colleges, and, and uh, we're, we're trying to build those into embedded activities in the classroom, um, but we also get those uh, in work-based learning activities as well, going and working alongside uh, maybe an internship, an apprenticeship, or even a clinical experience in, in one of our health professions. There's an opportunity there to learn, to coach, to teach, and so these transferable skills are, are eminently Im, um, embedded in everything we do. We also have a number of challenges too, and so one of the challenges is that these can be quite variable. You think about the, the atmosphere in, in one particular workplace versus another. Um, so, so finding those commonalities and those skills is really important. Um, connecting with students is important as well. Uh, they need to, to find relevance. Um, they, they, need to, um, they need to buy into it. They need to say that these are important things and part of my academic development. And then uh, lastly, these transferable <laughs> skills, they last a lifetime. And they will help students as they move from one profession to another um, but it's also important to note that, that we're, we're all at different levels, and it's important that we meet individuals at whatever <laughs> level they might be at. Thank you. Dean Gallagher, thanks very much. I mean, and certainly uh, that's important across our two-year campuses and our four-year campuses, right? It's just about communicating that, that those are important elements of our curriculum um, to employers, to students, to families. So thanks for those comments. Dean Wolf, I hope you can bring us home. I'm mindful of our time, uh, but this is an important kind of last point, and we has spent more time talking about this item than anything else thus far, and that is the importance of workforce training programs, uh, both credit but also non-credit workforce training programs for students who do want to come in for, uh, quote unquote, a quick hitter, uh, two, three weeks or a weekend intensive, pick up very specific skills that they can bring back to their workplace. That's happening throughout the system. I know a lot of that at Great Falls College. Maybe you can throw out an example and, and, um, and, and a little bit of discussion and what might better support those activities on your campus or others. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, um, Chair, um, and the Regents, um, Commissioner Christian. Uh, the example I would like to bring, and some of you have heard me say this already, is Dick Anderson Construction. And that is when they approached, um, actually it was uh, Commissioner Pam Busey, um, probably almost four years ago saying, <laughs> he said, I want to skill up my workplace, you know, my, my um, workers here, and they are the future of my company. But I don't, I can't take them away from their uh, wages. They need that for their families. And so I want them to be able to learn on the job. He also said, I don't want them to go to a campus and I don't want them to have to earn credit. And at that time he said, and I am not interested in an apprenticeship program. So um, we were able to work with him um, in a matter of a few weeks to create a program using his uh, um, supervisors on the job um, in the company. We use faculty from across our institutions. We share faculty. Um, and we were able to, over the last three years, skill people up. We have five who just completed their apprenticeship program. And remember when I said he wasn't interested in that, but thank you to our legislators who had the apprenticeship tax credit, and all of a sudden he saw that there was a benefit um, for having an apprenticeship program. So uh, we went to that graduation, and I can't tell you the pride that was exhibited by Dick Anderson himself. And he spoke of how important it was for him to know that he is going to be leaving his company in good hands. And so that, to me, means the world. That is the mission that we do to meet the employer where they are and for what they need at that time. So thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dean Wolf. And I, and I think, uh, again, this is a fairly general uh, discussion, but we're starting to hone in on some, some specific project areas. I know we'll be meeting throughout the winter and, and continue to become uh, more focused in terms of how we can uh, generate more support and, and sort of more actionable items with respect to, to this board. Um, I do think it's important, I'll note again, to have the two-year voices front and center as we discuss uh, some of uh, these opportunities and challenges. I know that they would uh, welcome any questions uh, from the board. Again, I realize that we're up against time, but I imagine uh, we have a couple minutes at least. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. I, too, want to thank Dean Kerjack, Wolf, Gallagher, and President Karras. 
and their colleagues behind me that uh, are, are all in this, in this together. Uh, in the spirit of time, uh, let's, let's remember that in March, the, uh, in, when we're in Dillon, uh, there's an expectation that we'll understand how the board can uh, facilitate more progress for the campuses across uh, the Montana University system and the community colleges, mm -hmm. as well as in May when we're in Haver to uh, what are the strategic objectives and metrics and successes that we want to see in the year 2021 and beyond. So uh, really what we're doing today is continuing the dialogue and continuing the discussion. I think from a Board of Regents perspective, this is really an open book, an opportunity for you who are boots on the ground that work directly with employers and uh, in labor uh, in industry and, and so forth. Do you tell us what you need, and I think we're gonna put the wind in your sails to do that. So with that, do we have questions or comments from the board? Questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, um, I thank you all the panelists, and also, uh, I was remiss in saying uh, from the onset here how much I appreciated an update tour of uh, Gallatin College. Uh, Dean Stephanie Gray, great job. Uh, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, an hour extremely well spent and so forth. I was so impressed about, I made the comment, you used every cubic foot of that building <laughs> and, and you're soon gonna be out of space and so forth. So uh, don't take your foot off the gas as it relates to uh, continuing to look at programs and so forth as for, the, uh, for your students, the Gallatin Valley and beyond. So with that, uh, we will turn the, the uh, meeting back to you, Chair Lozar. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Regent Nice, and I just wanted to make a, a quick comment uh, about the you know the communication of the value and the value proposition of two-year um, education in Montana, and I think um, that was covered to some degree, and I think it's being covered more and more in our our regents' meetings, knowing this is a, a top priority for us, a top priority for workforce and for government, and so I I recommend we continue to have this dialogue, and I wanted to to uh, thank the panelists for spending time with us, and I wanted to to thank. Um, uh, President Karras and, and uh, Dean Wolf and uh, Dean Gallagher for joining the two-year study commission uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the legislative commission that we had around two-year education. And um, I, I think they did a fantastic job of putting a voice to um, some misconceptions that come about in regards to CT and two-year education. And I think that level of education is absolutely critical for all the stakeholders, for parents and for students. So. Uh, thank you for taking your time to, to travel to uh, Helena for the study commission. Uh, with that, we are, we are just slightly behind. We're just going to go ahead and take uh, a, about a nine-minute, ten-minute break. Uh, it's about 3.15 right now. We're going to start uh, at 3.25 uh, with the Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee. Next up on uh, this afternoon's agenda, we're going to move over to... Uh, our last committee meeting for the day, um, Academic Research and Student Affairs Committee chaired by Regent Sheehy. Regent Sheehy. Thank you. Um, in an effort to provide opportunity to other board members, I'm going to ask Regent Rogers to run this portion of the meeting. And uh, with your permission, Chair, that's how we'll handle this. And I plan to do the same thing with Regent Miller at the next meeting before his term is up. Regent Rogers. Thank you, and thank you, Re Regent Sheehy, for your shared leadership uh, approach. I really appreciate it. Uh, so to get started off the top, uh, we have two items on our consent agenda. Um, they're related to BOR policy changes. Uh, would anyone like to move these to the action agenda? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and move to our action agenda. Uh, so first we'll start with item A, uh, which is the consideration of a candidate for an honorary doctorate uh, from Montana State University. And I'll turn it over to President Cruzado. Yes. Uh, Regent Rogers, members of the board, it is my honor to introduce to you for your consideration an honorary doctorate uh, of humane letters to be conferred at our next commencement ceremony to Mr. Mike Clark. Mike Clark has provided unprecedented service for the people, wildlife, and landscapes of Montana. 
its minorities throughout the United States, and for visitors from all over the globe who come to experience the natural wonders of our region. Clark's actions in Montana have supported sustaining one of the most unique ecosystems in the world, the Greater Yellowstone. The community of Bozeman, fortunate to have Yellowstone National Park in its backyard, owes a debt of gratitude to a person who has dedicated a large part of his life to protecting the integrity of this place as wildlife habitat, critical global ecosystem, and, environment, and, and an environment for living, recreating, and studying its distinctive features. Much of the research conducted in Yellowstone National Park is coordinated by Montana State University, and Mike's contributions have helped to maintain the park's ecosystem as a research laboratory. The faculty, the students, and the alumni at Montana State University think Mr. Uh, Mike Clark is most deserving of this honor. Thank you, President Cruzado. Any comments or questions from the regents? Regent Sheehy. Uh, I su suggest that we move this to vote today. Hmm? Is this the one we're voting on today? No. Never mind. <laughs> Any other additional? May I second that? <laughs> <laughs> Any other additional comments? Wonderful. Well, we'll move on to item B next. Yeah. Um, so this is a very exciting item. Yes. Um, as we know, the appointment of an individual to the rank of Regents Professor is the highest honor in the Montana University system that we can bestow upon a professor. Uh, the faculty member must have demonstrated exemplary performance in teaching, research, and public service. Uh, we, have, we as a Board of Regents take this very seriously, and I'm honored to invite President Cruzado to come forward with comments. Absolutely. Regent Ro uh, Rogers, members of the Board, I would like to call to the podium with me Dr. Philip Stewart to join me right here. Today is a very special day as we honor one of our very accomplished faculty members at Montana State University. The title of Regents Professor is reserved for faculty who have demonstrated outstanding scholarship of an international caliber, an authentic commitment to teaching and mentoring, and service both within and outside, within and outside the university. Dr. Phil Stewart, a professor of chemical and biological engineering, meets and exceeds all of these criteria. As a world leader in the study of biofilms, Dr. Stewart has played a central role in advancing our knowledge of the complex microbial communities that form on the surface of such things as medical equipment. Since coming to Montana State University in 1991, he has published groundbreaking studies about how microbes, including harmful bacteria, resist being killed by antibiotics. His publications have been cited more than 41,000 times. In fact, he has the distinction of being the most cited researcher at Montana State University. His research is making possible new products and medical treatments that alleviate suffering and save lives. Outside the laboratory, Dr. Stewart's leadership has been instrumental in transforming MSU's Center for Biofilm Engineering, CBE, into one of the world's largest and best known biofilm research centers serving as its deputy director from 1996 to 2004, and then as director until 2015. Dr. Stewart is known for his seemingly effortless ability to teach very difficult and complex material in the classroom. Some students credit him as the reason they decided to pursue chemical engineering, including perhaps our very own Joe Teal. For all these reasons and more, 
We say thank you to Dr. Phil Stewart for his 28 years of extraordinary service to our Montana University system. And it is my honor, on behalf of the students, the faculty, the students, the staff, the alumni, and the industry that has benefited from his scholarly work, to respectfully present to the Board of Regents of Montana University System the nomination of Dr. Phil Stewart. And I ask you to confer upon him the distinction of Regents Professor of the Montana University System. Thank you, President Cruzado. Um, I believe this item merits immediate action by the full board, um, and I will turn that back over to Chair Lozar to handle the vote. <coughs> Thank you, Regent Rogers. Uh, yeah, we will come back as uh, the body of the whole, and uh, we will take some immediate action. Uh, the action uh, before us today is to confer on Dr. Stewart, uh, the title and the honor of being a Regents Professor. I will uh, entertain a motion to approve this so nomination. Moved. Uh, moved by Regent Sheehy. Any discussion uh, from members of the board? Any discussion from the campuses? Any public comment on this particular action item? Seeing no further comment, I will call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. The motion passes. Congratulations. Chairman Lozar, members of the board, with your permission, I would like to ask Dr. Um, Stewart, now Regents Professor Stewart, to please share a few remarks with us. Thank you, President Cruzado. Uh, I'm deeply honored and very grateful to my terrific colleagues in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, to everyone at the remarkable Center for Biofilm Engineering, to collaborators all across campus from other departments and colleges, and to many, many hardworking students. Um, to all of those folks, I say thanks for the creative partnerships and uh, express my gratitude for the support of the university and the university system. Thank you. And 
with that, we will uh, go back to the ARSA committee meeting and uh, Regent Rogers. Thank you so much and congratulations again. Uh, we'll now move to item C, uh, which is the Great Falls College MSU mission statement revision. Uh, Dean Wolf, would you like to speak to that? Thank you so much, um, Chair, um, and Deputy Commissioner, the Commissioner, and Regents. Um, I was before you, it seems like maybe just two years ago, but a little bit longer, when we did a, the first revision of our um, mission statement, and I remember Regent Tess was saying maybe it wasn't quite, um, didn't explain enough about what we do. And after working on our new strategic plan, um, a lot of work was put into this with the help of um, our mid-cycle Northwest um, Commission accreditation visit. And we brought in some people. And um, so we think that the revised mission statement truly reflects what we do, what you're hearing about all of our two-year institutions. And, um, and I really appreciate the last few um, words in here about and meeting the needs of our community. That is so much what we do. So um, that is our request, please. Thank you. Uh, any comments from the regions? Wonderful, thank you, Dean Wolf. Uh, so our next four items, D through G, will be presented by Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Uh, Chair Rogers, members of the board, um, I'm gonna introduce uh, these next, oh gosh, I guess five items uh, in, oh, four items in total. Uh, I, I do have uh, my, my trusty aide here, Director Joe Teal, uh, who's our Director of Academic Policy and Research, and he'll help me when necessary. But these next four items <clears throat> all relate to the process by which we plan, approve, and then review new academic programs. And I suppose this may appear, um, fairly pedestrian to some in the room, but in, in reality, this is, this is the fabric of the Montana University system. The decisions we make with respect to launching new programs uh, and developing new academic opportunities for our students, it's what ends up defining our campuses, it's what ends up determining whether we do meet Montana's workforce needs uh, or not. It's extremely important. And uh, I suppose about four or five years ago, um, my predecessor, uh, along with the campuses, did launch into a major revision of the academic program approval process, and I think it's been fairly successful. Um, however, we can always uh, do better and refine along the way, and what we're going to propose to the board uh, today reflects a lot of hard work and hard thinking, and really reflects an updating of, of the system that's been in place for a number of years. Uh, if, if you think about the rationale for these changes, it really boils down uh, to, uh, to three things. Um, and I guess I can pose it in terms of three questions. Um, how can we launch new academic opportunities from certificates to doctoral programs that will help the Montana University system ramp up and meet the economic and workforce needs of the state? Can we do that any faster? Can we do it any more effectively? That's question one. The second question, how can we make sure that this board is able to engage in this process at the right time and with the right amount of detail and information? I think it's been working fairly well, but perhaps we can do a little bit better. And then the third question, how can we make sure that as we launch new programs, we have a healthy, and rigorous way to check in on those programs after they've been launched to see if in fact they're taking off the way that we've expected them to. So those three questions guided this process and in fact guide the new framework that we'll present to you today. Uh, and, and Director Teal, I think we'll have an opportunity to walk you through the basics of this framework. Joe, I'm gonna ask you to be fairly brief. Uh, we do have a set of policy changes that follow on from that presentation. 
We can certainly answer any questions you have about those policy changes. I would let you know, and Joe, I'd let you know that I think they all connect to supporting this new framework. So uh, that's an important kind of context to set. And I would also note that the work is ongoing. We have uh, a number of, uh, of kind of ground level details that we still need to work out, most notably perhaps a new online submission platform that will be crucial in speeding up our process and making submissions and review uh, as effective and efficient as possible. That work will continue with the chief academic officers, others on our campuses, and I think in March when we come back, we'll be able to again present uh, some updates to you all, and those updates will kind of round out the entire picture of what we have. So today, uh, I'll ask Joe to take it from here and, and explain a little bit about this new framework that we have. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Tespin, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, I do want to emphasize this is, again, the start of, of building some details into this new framework, a new online portal, uh, and working th through with the CAOs, the information that they're, they're gathering, they're presenting, and how our process at the regents level coordinates with curriculum committees, faculty committees at the campus level, they're ensuring the academic rigor that's really important in academic programming. So we want to start here with the very, very bottom square, mission alignment. So part of this entire process is seeing if we can create avenues through which campuses can communicate to each other and to you, the regents, how the academic programming, their academic vision for their campus uh, connects both with the mission of the campus and provide notice to all of you of how programs that are going to come up in the next year or so are going to tie directly to that ac broader academic vision and to the campus's mission. From there, uh, we move into what we're going to call an invitation to plan. And this is, as Dr. Tesson mentioned, our attempt to ensure that when these items are presented to the regents and voted on by the regents, it's early in the process where you can provide some meaningful input to the direction and development of an academic proposal, and it's also presented with a level of detail and information that's actionable by the regents uh, with perhaps more workforce state needs information that uh, you're interested in rather than some of the accreditation assessment focused information that the commissioner's office accreditors might be interested in. If uh, an invitation to plan, to plan goes through the process, receives the board's support, receives board comment, then the campus and the commissioner's office are charged to go forward in developing a full proposal. And these full proposals would be vetted by the CAOs, would come to the commissioner's office for final review, and then would be approved. Now this last piece, we, we currently have uh, a fairly new process of doing some, oh, First, we should note that there's going to be a fast track option here for uh, workforce focused certificates as well as terminal associate degrees, uh, associates of applied science, and lots of other changes that we'd say are minor. Those won't go through the invitation to plan. They'll be on a fast track and hopefully with an online portal will proceed much more quickly than they even do now. And then the last piece is program review. So you approve uh, programs, really do you, I think, get a full picture of how those programs have performed or had some level of, of accountability as to whether programs are achieving the expectations that they claim in their initial proposals. So as a part of this process in year three and year five after launch, proposals will be compared against the own standards that they've set in when they're approved by the Board of Regents and when they're approved by the Commissioner's Office and uh, go through a process first of, if they're falling behind, developing action plans to improve, and later on, if they're still falling behind, uh, perhaps sunsetting over time. So that's uh, the overall framework that we're looking at. Uh, we want to have a pretty brisk process of working with the academic officers to add meat to these bones, to ensure that we have a process that works uh, at the campus level, at the system level, for regents, uh, and uh, hopefully at some point also goes from a paper and email based process to more of an online system that lets everyone know what 
where proposals are in the queue, how they're moving forward more in real time than we have at the moment. Uh, and with that, uh, I suppose, do you want to talk about the policy proposals or, or should I cover those quickly? Uh, no, Joe, that, that you, you, I think you can go ahead and do that. Again, I, I think we can work through them quickly as the board has yeah. questions, they, they, can, um, they can ask them. I would just note, uh, I appreciate a measured approach. Some hopefullys and maybes in there. I, I think these are definites. We're going to yep. work towards uh, as quickly as possible an online uh, platform that for 19 out of 20 programs allows for near continuous submission and actually near continuous review and approval. I think that should speed up the vast majority of programs. Occasionally, if we do run into a, a proposal that that needs some adjustment, the board can now give that feedback very, very early in the process. Campuses can make those adjustments much earlier rather than have to uh, reverse 18 months or two years worth of faculty planning and, and, and everything that comes along with it. So I just wanted to add those two points, Joe. And, and again, I think um, you can launch into the policies, all of which really support the framework you just outlined. Uh, in Regent uh, Rogers, Chair Rogers, if you prefer, we can also just stand for questions on this from the board. Uh, it's, up, it's up to you. I think that unless we have specific, oh, go ahead, uh, Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Chair Rogers. Uh, I think this is fantastic. I know this has been the, uh, a product of years and years of, uh, of work, and I appreciate everyone's attention on this. Um, just kind of looking at the model uh, that was designed, particularly the new program review, we had the conversation a couple years ago here about reviewing, and I know you're, you're updating and amending that process. Uh, as it relates to going beyond year five, when you move into a mature, uh, mature program goes into the inventory, what happens in year 10, year 12, when uh, programs maybe are, are not viable anymore? Is, does that just follow the typical process of moratorium in level ones? Is that, is that how that works? Um, Chair Lozar, I think, um, that's that's an important part of this conversation. Uh, I'll be as, uh, I guess, straightforward as possible. We decided we, we wanted to move forward with some changes to the approval and kind of um, review of recently launched programs now. I think when it comes to our mature program inventory, most systems, in fact, m yeah, most systems across the country have some kind of system set up so that if head counts or some other indicators start to lag on uh, in certain program areas, there's an opportunity for an improvement plan uh, to be developed with, with departmental leadership. And then ultimately, if that improvement plan doesn't lead to results, um, there are some systems where the board then takes action on those programs. I think we need a little bit more discussion about what the sort of floor would be uh, in terms of, of head count or graduation numbers. Uh, that'll take some more analysis. Joe and I have been working on that, but we felt we'd move ahead with this and then work on that mature program inventory later. Other comments? Regent Sheehy. I've served on this committee, I think, for about six years, and I think we initiated the first rendition of this right about at the time I was starting with uh, Dr. Seck. And then Casey got on our committee and really started rabble-rousing that we should be doing more or sooner or faster or harder. And it was a great impetus. Thank you, Casey, for that. And then what looked like a tragedy, which was Dr. Seck leaving us, uh, turned into a set of new eyes. And thank you, Deputy Commissioner, because you've done a, just a really bang up job on looking at this completely new and revamping it. I think you've posed the right questions. Um, it, we were all mumbling around questions for about six years about what was going wrong and we're not putting our fingers on it and you summarized it in, in those three questions. It is true that this is a work in progress. Uh, I think it's a lot of progress and a lot of work. So uh, thank you for all of this. I think this is the right, I really think this is the right direction. I think this is going to work. I think the region involvement, as I've said to, to Brock many times, I think region involvement earlier is better. Um, you know, we tried to wait until the end so that we could take a deep dive, but we're really precluded that late in the process from doing anything that we couldn't do right up front. So we've done a lot of learning and I, th I think this is the right way. I'm very excited about the progress and uh, I'm fully supportive. Uh, Madam Chair, Regent Sheehy, can I accept your thanks but actually redirect them? 
So, Joe, uh, a ton of work and, and a CAO colleagues, a ton of work as well. So thank you. I think it's a step forward and uh, certainly happy to answer any more questions about the board policy changes. Again, there's nothing out of line with what we've discussed already and would be uh, excited to see a vote tomorrow on these. Any additional comments? Um, I'll certainly echo Regent Sheehy's sentiments. Uh, I feel like so many of the comments that we've heard from faculty and campuses and even other regions are really well addressed in this new proposal, and it's really exciting. The one question of clarification is, just to be clear, existing programs that are on the books in the future, if this were to pass, would then be um, carried out through this review process in the future? Or would it apply only to new things? No, so, so programs, the review process at this point only looks at newly approved programs in year three and year five after launch. As Dr. Tessman has mentioned, you know, other states have processes to look at the full array of offerings, of mature offerings, and, and we've, we've looked at some of those policies in other states and, and are investigating whether some approaches might, might be sensible for Montana. Thank you. Okay, uh, move ahead to the next item. Um, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, thank you very much. Uh, and as, as we move to the next set of items, um, they, they relate to our level two proposal. So under the current um, system for program approval, we know that we have um, a, a long process that involves a lot of engagement uh, from the chief academic officers, oftentimes faculty, department chairs, uh, who are responsible for putting together uh, the new program proposals. And today we have um, items from three different campuses, um, the three different campuses, uh, uh, Montana State University Billings, and then uh, one item from Montana Tech, and then one item from uh, Montana State University here in Bozeman. To uh, begin the discussion of these level two proposals, I will invite uh, Provost Melinda Arnold from Montana State University Billings to join us at the podium. Thanks, Melinda. Deputy Commissioner, Regent Rogers, members of the board. Greetings from MSU Billings and um, apologies that uh, Chancellor Edelman could not be with us today. I am thrilled to request authorization to rename our College of Allied Health Professions to the College of Health Professions and Science. As you all know, we've been working on this little science building for a while and uh, we finally literally broke ground and brick. And so and as a function of doing so, we have been working with our faculty, students, and staff to ask them their opinions about changing the college name, which everyone agreed to. So uh, that is our request. In so doing, we can no longer have a College of Arts and Sciences if the sciences move to the College of Health uh, Professions and Science. And so at the same time, we are requesting to rename the College of Arts and Sciences to the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. I stand for questions. Thank you so much, Provost Arnold. Uh, any comments from the Regents? So I think we will continue, continue with you for the next item. Madam Chair, um, so we have both, both items from Montana State University billings uh, have been covered. I think we Perfect. can move now to uh, the single item from Montana Tech University. And uh, uh, we have Dean uh, Dave Gercheck from Highlands College here to present that item. Uh, Madam Chair, Deputy Commissioner, members of the board, uh, Highlands is, is trying to do some unique things like all the, all the colleges. And one of the things we're doing is we're actually moving a couple of our trades programs, which is, which is uh, construction and civil engineering technology and drafting into the business department. And the purpose of that is to develop more synergy between programs. Because it dawned on us, an example, our civil engineering technology program, they should become civil engineers. But guess what? They don't. They become surveyors, and surveyors start businesses. And so from our point, we thought, this is more of an alignment with what we should try to do. So therefore, what we're asking is we're taking three trades programs and moving them to business, and then we need to change the name of the department to better suit what they're doing, which hence is the name 
business and industry. And that's our request. Thank you, Dean Gergchek. Any comments from the regents? Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Tesman. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, our last item is from Montana State University, Bozeman. I, I'll invite Provost Bob Makwa to the podium and uh, in a slight uh, adaptation or adjustment to our usual process, I find that it's really helpful in this moment to give Provost Makwa perhaps a few extra minutes of your time really to highlight um, the process that led to this agenda item. And I, I um, would emphasize that uh, this board, um, our office, asked all campuses in the Montana University system to undergo um, some version of program prioritization um, on their campus. And at Montana State University, that involved a prioritization process focused on, on, on doctoral programs. I think Provost Mockwell will spend a little bit of time outlining that process and then segue into the agenda item itself. Is that correct, Provost Mockwell? Uh, that's correct. Thank okay. you, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you. Um, if we could have the, the PowerPoint on the uh, program review process. So my name is Bob Mockwell. I'm the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at Montana State University. And I appreciate the opportunity today uh, to describe Montana State University's program review, which included a comprehensive evaluation of all PhD and doctoral programs at the university. The effort was part of an extensive 12-month-long doctoral program prioritization review conducted by a committee that was formed specifically for this purpose. In compliance with board policy, the review and summary report prepared by the committee contained the two essential elements of program reviews which are shown, shown in the slide in front of us. 21 different programs were examined as part of our review, which were undertaken to strengthen and improve all of our doctoral and PhD programs. This was not merely a ranking exercise, but a process implemented to achieve continuous improvement of graduate education at MSU. Relative rankings were developed using criteria that reflected both qualitative and quantitative metrics. The process was informed by data from our offices that track and manage institutional data and further elucidated with input from the university community, including specifically the doctoral degree granting departments. The committee consisted of 16 members who represented a cross-section of positions and experience in graduate education and research with a distributed representation of discipline areas and academic colleges at MSU. There were 16 metrics total subdivided between the five categories shown. The metrics were averaged over a time period which was typically five years and whenever possible were normalized on a per capita basis. The normalizing variable being the number of tenurable full-time faculty in the unit. After developing the metrics and socializing them across campus, the committee worked with institutional researchers to obtain accurate, verifiable data. The committee then solicited department heads for input and invited them to provide narrative responses to help the committee better understand nuances of each of the programs that may not have been fully captured by the quantitative measures. Based on the final prioritization scores from the 16 different metrics, the committee ranked the doctoral programs and then grouped them into the three classifications shown, highly effective, effective, and needs improvement. Written summaries for each program included recommendations from the committee based on both data and departmental responses. 19 of our 21 programs are shown in the slide. Two of our programs, material science and psychological sciences, uh, were excluded in the final classification because the programs have not been in place long enough to develop sufficient longitudinal data to evaluate them based on the metrics that were used in the process. As we saw in the previous slide, five programs were in the highly effective topmost category and, and 10 were classified as effective, the middle category. 
Each of these 15 programs submitted responses describing their plans for further improvement. You know, for example, physics, one of the highest rated and most successful PhD programs at MSU was also one of the first departments to submit a plan for further strengthening their program. In general, these improvement plans included items such as practices to enhance graduate student recruitment and graduate student support, expectations for including graduate student funding in grants, and including additional graduate students on research projects, examination of time to degree and graduate student retention, making updates to existing academic programs, which might involve updates to existing courses, perhaps new courses, and even new relevant programs. Each of these 15 programs will undergo review again as part of the normal seven-year review cycle. Department heads in the departments in these three areas, history and philosophy, animal and range sciences, and civil engineering, acknowledged and agreed to address weaknesses and areas for improvement that were identified by the committee. Each department provided details about changes that are being made or in the process of being made. Many of those changes are, are, are similar in line to the, to the uh, uh, areas of improvement that I, I mentioned previously. Each department submitted plans and are, are taking steps to improve. These three programs will be re-reviewed in three years. The fourth program that was ranked as needs improvement by the committee was Cell Biology and Neuroscience, CBN. In this case, the discrepancy between high expenditures, the low number of graduate students and doctoral degrees granted, the low teaching loads, and the deficiency of graduate courses offered was unique among the doctoral programs reviewed and was highly concerning to the committee. The performance of this department was not meeting the standards expected of all departments at Montana State University, and the graduate program was no longer in compliance with the program that was approved by the Montana Board of Regents, your predecessors in 2004, and by our regional accreditor, NCCCU. The faculty in, in the department were resistant to change, refused to address recommendations from the committee or recommendations from their previous program review in 2005. On the screen in front of you are five of the areas of underperformance that are described in the report and thoroughly substantiated. Unless you have questions, my plan today is not to spend time dwelling on these issues, but rather to direct our energies toward the future of this program and the opportunities that lie ahead. Joining the eight tenured faculty members and two instructors in MSU's former department of CBN with close to 30 tenurable faculty, research faculty, and instructors in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology will provide a strong foundation for sustainability and future growth. These changes are necessary for the academic programs and for the faculty from the former department of CBN to meet established goals for improvement which align with the performance expectations and academic quality of all departments and programs by the Board of Regents and by the faculty at Montana State University. This concludes my summary of our program review. After addressing any questions the board may have, um, I will, I'd be happy to describe our level two board item that was submitted um, as part of this ARSA subcommittee. So thank you. Thank you, Provost Makwa. Questions from the Regents? Comments? Regent Sheehy? Thank you, Regent. Uh, we've gotten a lot of comments on this uh, item over the past few months, and the uh, context in which you've placed it today is very helpful to our deliberations. I hadn't realized its context within the, the three categories and, and, and uh, its response in comparison to the others who were in the ineffective category. So I find that very helpful. Um, is there, have there been any measures taken to make sure that the students who were in CBN have been um, accommodated in some way? 
Yes, th thank you, Regent Sheehy. Y yes, there have. So the, the program, the undergraduate academic program, is now being managed by Regents Professor Mark Jula in, in the microbiology and immunology program. All the courses that students need to continue on their track to pursuing their degree are, are still offered and will continue to be offered. There's been no changes in, in, the, in the pathway for students to achieve a degree in cell biology and neuroscience. Can I ask one more follow-up? Um, may I ask you the same question with respect to the, the professors? Right. So with, with respect to the, to the faculty in cell biology and neuroscience, uh, as a result of this merger, there's been no change in employment status. There's been no change in tenure status. There's no, been no change in the faculty's offices or in the faculty's labs. And there's been no change to the curricula that's being offered. All the faculty that were in CBN have been transferred into the microbiology and immunology department. It's true, and you've heard, there are some faculty who have taken leave for, for a variety of reasons. Okay. But they're still employees of Montana State University. I appreciate your candor on this and uh, appreciate that you've alleviated many of my concerns. Other comments from the regents? Regent, uh, nice Bob. to <laughs> You can just call me Bob. Well, um, I, what I would like to do, Madam Chair and uh, Provost Makwa, is to say this has been an incredibly long journey for you, for us. Um, articles in the paper, uh, emails, scads of emails, including very long ones uh, f from the campus here as well, explaining all this. I think it's gone on far too long, and I'd like to see that this come to resolution rather quickly here. I've uh, been a little surprised that uh, um, we've had the, uh, the commentary back to us about all the things that, uh, you know, the personal agendas and all these related things here, but, you know, it really comes down to students' success, student performance, and so forth, and the ability for your peers across this great campus to really see that there's great value in this particular program. Um, I want to again acknowledge the work, uh, Provost Makwa, you've done, President Cruzado, and the leaders on the campus here. You could have taken the easier path, and that would be to just uh, roll with the tide here, but you didn't. What I'd really like to do is to encourage, uh, you know, further dialogue as to how to get the healing process expedited and move forward with this. It's time to move on and do it from the basis of the student and student success and to heal this, heal this, uh, this, this issue. So thank you. Deputy Commissioner Tesman. Uh, uh, Chair Rogers, members of the board, and Chair Ni uh, Regent Nystuen. Um, I, I, from my position as a staff member, I would uh, echo those sentiments. And this has uh, been helpful today to hear a little bit more of the background on, on the process of program prioritization. But in reality, this has been an ongoing communication, and I certainly have felt uh, connected to the process um, uh, since I started in this office and have been connected to a lot of the communication, much of it public, um, regarding uh, some of the decisions that, that you and, and the campus are making. Uh, I feel very well informed from a staff perspective. It's heartening for me to hear from board members that they feel well informed. And uh, I'm glad to see this as an item in front of this board today. Regent Tess. Thank you, Regent Rogers. I, I would just remind everybody that this program prioritization process has started with us. Um, we, we expect this from our campuses, and we've asked our campuses, campus leaders um, again and again, year after year, uh, to go through the various programs on all of their campuses. And uh, I, I just really want to applaud uh, you, Provost Makwa, and Montana State University for, for executing um, kind of the, uh, the expectation that this board has, not just of this particular campus, but of all of our campuses, to periodically, on a regular basis, review our programs. Are they still relevant? Are they doing what they should be doing? And so I'd just like to remind folks that it really did begin with this board, and I want to thank you for executing that. Thank you. Regent Sheehy. 
Uh, I just want to say that I have appreciated the student comment in particular, and I have appreciated the way that while it has been a dialogue, that is something that we must do. This is a painful thing to do. And the uh, people who were pained by it, had uh, they spoke up. And I welcome their comments. I'm glad we received their comments. I'm glad you responded appropriately to their comments. And I, th the thing I felt most about a lot of the student comment in particular on this matter was the pride that they have in their degree from Montana State University. And I think we should acknowledge that from that, that pain derived from the fact they're really proud of their degree. So I think that's something that we can take to heart and that we can get a positive out of on this. Hope that we can come to some resolution of it. I mean, obviously we're gonna vote on it and it'll, it'll be done one way or the other. But um, I really, I don't want this to be an episode where we think that the, the comments are a bad thing. I think they're a very healthy thing and a very good thing and we did listen. Any other comments from the regions? Uh, Regent, Mich M Regent Miller. <laughs> Thank you, Regent. I think along those lines of Regent Sheehy, um, I know there's a handful of students sitting behind me today that will be doing public comment on this matter. Um, and like everybody here has voiced, we all want a resolution. Whatever the board votes for tomorrow, we want this to be resolved. And this is just a request from a student who also likes his voice to be heard. But at some point, I would love if you could sit down with the students behind me um, and kind of heal these wounds. I, I would hate to see any students have hurt feelings over whatever happens, but um, I'd really appreciate if you could meet with them at some point in the future. Thank you, Regent Miller, for that suggestion. And, and I absolutely think it's a good suggestion, and I will follow through with that. Deputy Commissioner. Uh, uh, Chair Rogers uh, and, and members of the board, uh, Provost Makwa, I think uh, we've we've heard a lot about the process, uh, and certainly we've we've walked around the item. I, I, I suggest that if you could introduce the item, we could then okay. have any additional questions from the board. But to get that out on the table might be productive at this point. Okay, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, with with permission from the chair, I will do that. Montana State University has put forward this board item uh, to request approval for the merger of the departments of cell biology and neuroscience with microbiology and immunology. Many factors were considered as part of the merger, not the least of which is the high stature and reputation of the welcoming department, microbiology and immunology, which has a proven track record as one of the university's top departments in research expenditures, scholarship, and combined with an outstanding reputation for educational excellence. If you remember the, the, the top category uh, of, the, of, of the top most ranked programs, microbiology and immu immunology was in that category. With the new changes in the administrative and management structure, CBN faculty have the opportunity over the coming months to work with colleagues in MBI to achieve stability and long-term viability in the undergraduate academic program and to examine new opportunities to revitalize graduate education and research. In closing, this action is in the best interest of current and future students who are interested in educational, research, and career opportunities in the, in the varied fields in biology, biomedical sciences, and neuroscience. I thank you for your consideration for this item. Thank you, Provost Makwa. Questions or comments? Um, the two questions that I have are just um, would like to raise again in reflecting on the student comments from May. Um, there are a lot of concerns around ability to gain admission to medical school, um, research opportunities being available to students. Uh, could you just speak to those two items uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page of where those opportunities are at? Sure, sure Madam Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll address that, the first one about medical school. Certainly, our Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience has had a strong track rec record of excellent students. Many of the award winners uh, that you have, you saw listed this morning in President Cruzado's presentation, several of them ha have come from the Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience. Excellent students uh, go into that program, graduate and pursue uh, professional degrees in, in various medical fields, in including um, medical education and, 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 and pursuing MDs. Our acceptance rate into medical school at Montana State University 
is, is actually quite high. It's about 20% higher than the norm. That being said, we have many avenues and pathways for students at Montana State University to, to pursue that, that goal. Uh, cell biology and neuroscience is one. We have a number of other programs in the university that have higher acceptance rates. Microbiology and immunology is a very successful program and a good example. Um, chemistry and biochemistry is one of the highest departments. In fact, over the last five years, our acceptance rate has been about 7% higher than CBN. Most notably, our highest acceptance rate, which is about 14% higher than CBN, is from our post-bac program. These are non-science majors, engineering majors, e economists, history, English, geology. Uh, their acceptance rate is, is about 14% higher than our norm. So to answer that question, this can only strengthen opportunities for students in the, in the CBN program to, to be successful at, at medical school. And, and, and to be successfully accepted. In terms of research opportunities, likewise, I, I mentioned the, the size of microbiology and immunology. Those faculty have labs. They're very acceptance of, accepting of students. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for research. We have neuroscientists, neuroscientists doing research in electrical engineering, in computer engineering, in psychology, in many areas across campus. If anything, I see this as, as, as opening doors to, to uh, considerably more research experiences for those students. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, the one other piece I will clarify is um, support from the faculty for the merger. It sounds like there is a lot of support from fa the faculty for the merger. Is that correct? My impression across campus is that there is, there is support for this merger and there's a readiness to, to move on, especially from the perspective of our students. Uh, one, one, one example I, I can share was at the faculty senate meeting last week. Uh, the faculty senator from the Department of Microbiology uh, read a letter from, from the combined department where he mentioned that the faculty in the combined department are overwhelmingly in support of this merger. And, and throughout the meeting, I think he used that term two or three more times. I sense that, I see that, I feel that, and I, and I believe it's true. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. So that ends our action items for today. And now we can move forward with our information items. Thank and you. I believe Provost Makwa is up with our ride program update. Uh, and and uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Provost Makwa, while you regroup for just a second, <clears throat> the, the information section of the ARSA agenda today is, is pretty full, uh, and it highlights the team effort that we have in our office and actually across the state. Uh, one important part of that team effort, it, I, I wanna mention it right now, actually. We have um, a, a relatively new program uh, in, in our office called the Ochi Research Fellows Program. And a lot of the work that you've seen uh, already today and that you'll see during the information section is made possible because we find great ways to tap into the talent in the state. And we have a set of four graduate students uh, from across the Montana University system who serve as this year's class of uh, Ochi Research Fellows. Uh, Sydney Sherrick uh, from the University of um, Montana, uh, Shane St. Onge uh, from the University of Montana, Sarah Piper from UM, and then Shua Brazil from uh, Montana State University. They're all working on really important uh, projects from dual enrollment to rural uh, educator recruitment and retention. And so I, I know we have a few of those Ochi fellows uh, in the audience. And if you just very quickly will stand up and give a wave, you are part of our team and we're really honored to have you here. So thanks very much. Okay. <coughs> Provost Makwa, I think that gave you a brief moment to regroup, and uh, and perhaps now you can launch into a short uh, uh, a presentation on the RIDE uh, program. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. And I appreciate the opportunity to provide a brief, and I promise brief summary update on the Montana RIDE Dental Education Program. Uh, primarily, I'd like to describe the, the progress that has been made by the committee since that the curriculum for that program was first approved back in January 2018. And, and as a reminder, the, the acronym for RIDE um, 
the, the acronym RIDE stands for, Regional Initiatives in Dental Education. RIDE's a cooperative, cooperative professional education program that's under development between Montana State University and University of Washington. It's, it's modeled after the WAMI program, which is another cooperative education program between University of Washington and MSU. The mission of RIDE is focused on educating dentists who will serve rural, underserved areas in Montana. The, the unique aspect of this kind of dental education is that, that it, it requires specialized training to develop what's sometimes referred to as super generalists. These are dentists who are trained with advanced skills to perform a variety of dental treatments without the level and, and backup that is common for dentists who practice in urban areas. This slide illustrates the, the four-year curriculum and captures some of the intricacies of, of this multi-campus uh, cooperative program. The first year program, students are taking classes in, in Bozeman and they'll be sharing classes with, with the WAMI students. RIDE students will spend about a month of their second year working in dental clinics located in rural, underserved, and Native American communities spread across the state of Montana. And the remainder, the remainder of, the third, of the second year, the students will join up with a cohort of Washington RIDE students in Spokane, Washington. The third year, the students move to University of Washington School of Dentistry in Seattle. And there they'll, they'll be learning the advanced skills needed to practice in these resource limited communities. Here's where they develop those skills as super generalists, um, where they'll be practicing and seeing everything from primary dental care to complex emergency treatments and, and everything in between. Then in their fourth and final year, RIDE students participate in clinical rotations back in established dental clinics in rural, underserved, and Native American communities. So although Montana attracts top-notch dentists, most of the dentists practice in nine counties. The remaining Montana counties have few or in some cases no dentists. Addressing this vacuum in dental care is what makes the Montana RIDE program so important for the health and well-being of our state. Montana RIDE clinical training sites have been in place for several years. and They've been supported by grants from Montana's Health and Human Services. The red markers on the map in front of us denote those sites. The yellow markers show new clinical sites that have been developed since we last presented the RIDE program uh, to the regions, also through, through generous grants from HRSA and from the Montana Health Foundation. As shown in the slide in front of us, the RIDE team has been busy submitting grants and they've been successful in, a, in obtaining additional funding to support the program. Resources from these grants are being used to further expand the number of clinical sites and to support implementation plans for the first year curriculum. That's that curriculum that will be offered jointly with the WAMI program in, in Bozeman. Future funding will be necessary for long-term su sustainability of the program. In addition to expanding and growing clinical sites, there have been many important achievements this past year, including establishing meaningful partnerships with the Native American tribal leaders. There's, there's several items listed on the screen. One that's noteworthy is the RIDE team has begun to establish uh, several teledentistry sites in some of the rural Montana communities. So in closing, I want to acknowledge the, the members of this dedicated and, and committed team, which is being led by Kathy Judela, the director of Montana State University Division of Health Sciences, Chris Juliar, director of Montana AHEC and Office of Rural Health, and Martin Tynes, MSU WAMI director. This opportunity, this team would not be complete without our cooperative partners at University of Washington, who are equally dedicated to helping Montana launch this program. Two members I will, I will mention are Frank Roberts, the RIDE program director and department head at University of Washington School of Dentistry, and Suzanne Allen, 
the Vice Dean of Regional Affairs for the Uni University of Washington School of Medicine. I also want to express our appreciation to the Montana Department of Health and Human Resources for all their support over the years for this program. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions, Regent Lozar? Uh, thank you, Chair Rogers. Uh, uh, Provost Makwa, <clears throat> could you talk a little more about um, sort of sustainable funding uh, that you mentioned there, there is some need for future funding. I know there was a conversation maybe a couple of years ago about the RIDE program around funding. What kind of resources are we talking about? Obviously, we've, we've been creative in identifying grants and partnerships that are moving RIDE along uh, forward. Is, could you speak to what we need to be thinking about as, as the program matures? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lozar. You, you are correct. When we first brought this forward to the board in 2018, we had some estimates of, of the cost per student and, and, and a request that that would ultimately have to go forward to the state for funding, similar to our WAMI medical education program, similar to the WEMU uh, veterinary education program. Uh, since that time, the, the, the team that I mentioned have been working on attaining uh, additional outside support to reduce that ask. I anticipate over the coming year there will be uh, communications with the commissioner's office as they continue to try to whittle down that the, the size and magnitude of that ask to something that would be, you know, frankly, a attractive to the legislators and, and uh, allow this to be built into a future budget request. Uh, follow up. It, do you have a sense of uh, the level of funding um, that we're talking about? I have a rough sense, but if I if I think if I mentioned that publicly at this point, I would have some some people probably not real happy with me. I recognize they're paying close attention to the uh, the funding that's currently being provided by uh, the WAMI program or yeah, provided by the WAMI program on a per student basis. And so that, that's, a, that's a target. Uh, dental education is considerably more expensive than medical, medical education. Students after their four years of practicing de of, of dental education are ready to be practicing dentists. They, don't, they do not have to go through a residency component. So there's a lot uh, essentially squeezed into those four years. So it will be more expensive than, than the WAMI program, but, but I'm sorry, I don't have a specific number to share at this time. Deputy Commissioner. Uh, well, uh, Chair Rogers, if, if there are no other questions, uh, uh, Provost Makwa, thank you very much uh, for that presentation and the information on the RIDE program. Uh, and uh, with your permission, Chair Rogers, I'd move on to the next information item, which is uh, a report on the 2020 United States Census and how it connects to Montana higher education. I believe that we have uh, Jerry Busey and Mary Craigle here uh, to give us a, a brief update. Good afternoon, Chair Christians, members of the Regents. I'm Mary Craigle. I am the Director of the Census and Economic Information Center uh, for the Montana Department of Commerce. And my cohort here, Jerry Busey, is uh, with the U.S. Census Bureau. She is one of the partnership specialists that is working in Montana. I, I believe we have a presentation that is very brief. I promise to be quick. First of all, thank you very much for giving us this few moments on your agenda. Um, this is an incredibly important issue to Montana, and um, I just checked. We have 111 days to get ready to get this thing done, so I'm um, hoping that all of you will join me today. The 2020 census, um, just a so, little recollection, is uh, we've been doing this since 1790. It is in the U.S. Constitution. Um, and it's every 10 years, and so people forget between the period of time uh, what a census is and what it goes about, but it's actually incredibly important and particularly important this time to the state of Montana. Why should people in Montana be counted? Well, for one reason, $2 billion a year that comes into this state is based on census data every year. Um, and I'm going to get to a different slide that shows a little bit about some of the 
program specifically that education cares about, but it's about $20,000 per person that we count in Montana. Um, second reason is future planning depends on accurate census data. For census data, we live with for 10 years, so uh, it's those plans that we try to make going forward. Our campuses are too small, our programs are not structured correctly, our highways are the wrong size, et cetera, et cetera. So that census data is critical, not only for the count of everyone, but because it's the basis for so much of the other survey and projection data that we do. Um, so let's talk a little bit about funding. Again, oh, in, in the US, um, I just read a new number and it's actually 1.3 trillion now they're saying is based on the census. Um, at the po point of this slide, it was 675 billion per year, seven trillion over 10 years, that's just a ton of money. Um, and again, it really matters a lot about counting every individual because it is the denominator for which this money is distributed. So let's look a little bit just at Montana. Montana alone, federal direct student loans in one year only, this is for fiscal year 2016, $213 million plus change came into this state, 10 million in Pell Grants, et cetera, et cetera, career education, WIOA. Um, and then I included a couple other numbers about infrastructure, again, which are critical to campuses and the facilities and the communities in which um, those campuses are. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about the data. I think for colleges in particular, the big, two of the big areas are workforce development, um, knowing what our population is, what they, uh, the ages, what racial demographics, all of the different demographics about our students and our communities makes a big difference when we're doing training, when we're trying to decide the programs and offerings that each campus will have. Um, let's talk a little bit about apportionment. Um, the U.S. Census is used to determine the number of seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, there's only 435 seats, so it gets divided up based on the population. That will occur at the end of 2020 when the final count goes to the President and then on to Congress. Um, in 2010, we missed out having a seat. Um, we were fifth on the list. We would have needed about 10,000 more people to get a seat. Um, this time we are projected to get somewhere either seat 433 or 434 um, in mo most of the projection models I've seen. That would mean we would get two US, two US congresspersons rather than the single congressperson we have now. Um, that would be the first time a state has ever regained a congressperson. Um, and I think again, this is a big emphasis, if we do not have an accurate count, our, our chances of doing this are greatly diminished. Uh, not only is it used for apportionment of the U.S. House of Representatives, but it's also used for legislative districting and school districting. Um, boundaries across the state of Montana are set based on the census data. So this is the timeline we're looking at. Uh, again, 111 days until it starts. It's March 12th. It will run through July in the state of Montana. Uh, we are right now in the educational phase, trying to get out and tell everyone we can, which thank you very much for, again for your time today here to do this. Um, but again, it's, it's really is the trusted voices. It's individuals talking to their neighbors, to their communities, to their families. Um, I'm actually pushing this as a great Thanksgiving topic right now. So uh, <laughs> it's not controversial at all, right? Nothing. <laughs> um, so anyway, just so you know that, um, but again, it's the only way it works is, is to get everybody involved and have everybody understand the importance to our state. This will be the first cyber census. It will be the first time you can do the census online or by phone. Um, you can also do it in paper. We actually really are pushing to have people do it in person, or uh, I'm sorry, by on, online or by phone. We don't want them doing it in person. It's very expensive. Census workers will come knocking at your door up to seven times if you don't self-respond. Um, we don't need that to happen. Plus we want Montana to know early on how we're doing in terms of our response rate so we can do follow-up efforts. Um, it's always important to point out the confidentiality of the census. This has been a big concern, particularly in the last couple of years, um, and it's good to reiterate that the census uh, is absolutely confidential. The information um, is collected only for statistical purposes and is never shared with any outside agency, uh, law enforcement, anywhere else. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau uses other people's data to verify the records, but they never provide the data outward. So what can you, as the regents and the campuses and all of the, the leadership in this room do? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, there are complete count committees forming 
in most of the committees or, uh, communities around the state. I believe we have 75? 75 complete count committees up and running. Those are local volunteers who are working, again, that grassroots effort to use your trusted voice to get people counted in your community. Um, if you go on to the only thing you need to remember today, which is census.mt.gov, that's the only thing you need to remember today. There is a map that says uh, where those complete count committees are and where the contacts are. Uh, we're adding updates to that map and the materials on that site every day. Census.mt.gov. And that's a picture of the map. Shows you we're pretty well spread out, but we got a lot of work to do. Our goal is to have over 100 complete count committees um, so that everywhere across Montana we have local voices um, and community leaders that are carrying the message. Um, if you're interested in materials or knowing more about the census, you can get that from census.gov, is the national materials. But look, oh, there it is, census.mt.gov. Um, there's personal materials, including videos, flyers, events. Uh, I've done 11 conferences in 40 days and four out-of-state trips with this lately. So again, we're trying to get everywhere we can. Um, but please, talk about the census, promote it, reassure people that it's safe. Please host an event, have us come talk to your community, your campus, um, get your students involved, do whatever you can, provide a PSA. Um, and one thing, any one thing you could do to help us would be great. We got $100,000 at the state level to promote the census. Uh, North Dakota got a million dollars. California is spending $250 million to promote the census um, in their state. So I need each of your help very much to do this. This is not something that we're going to be able to resource out of. Um, just our dollars. And again, encourage it. It's safe, it's vital, it's important. It's nine questions, it's quick. And uh, if you need an extra part-time job where well, there's 14,000 people they're trying to recruit, so within the state of Montana, um, they're looking for four to 5,000 census workers um, potentially to be working in Montana. So uh, pays $17 to $19.50 an hour, not a bad gig for a college student or a part-time teacher. Thank you. 111 days away from today, official census day is 131 days. Any questions? Thank you so much. Any comments? Regent Tess. Thank you. Mary, great presentation. Um, living in a, in a college town, I'm actually getting a lot of questions about where college kids should be counted. Is it Absolutely. where they're residing then or is it their home community? Uh, great question. Thank you, Regent Tess. Uh, actually, we just distributed, hopefully, a flyer that discusses this, but college kids should be counted in the college community where they are. Um, the reason for that is if you think about the census, one of the main purposes of the census is to provide the dollars and the services uh, where they're needed, and that is where the population is. Most college students will spend a majority of a year in that, communi that college community where they are residing, not home with mom and dad. And so... Um, it, they do need to be counted in the campus um, community where their campus is located. Most college kids in the dorm are, ca are counted through an effort called group quarters. So all of the dormitories, um, administrators on campus will be contacted ahead of time. I've already been uh, working closely with Jeff Bondi here at MSU. He's aware of all of it for the housing here. Um, on, and those uh, kids in the dorm will be counted uh, in, a, in a method that they decide together. Um, however, it's the kids that are off campus that we're really concerned about, um, particularly those kids that have two kids on the lease, but there's actually five living in the house, to reassure them that it's okay for those five kids to be counted on that form. They're self-responding on the internet. Nobody's coming to the door. Nobody's going to be checking that lease. It's just for the, to get the dollars and the numbers and the data and the representation for the state. Any additional questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next information item C, the rural teacher recruitment and retention update with Director McLean.
D Director McLean, welcome. Uh, and you're actually here for our next two items. Uh, and you'll start uh, with it, an important update um, on rural educator recruitment and retention. Really excited to hear about what's happened with the task force and importantly, what the next steps are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Madam Chair, members of the board, it's very exciting to be here today, especially since my colleague Christine Miller and I had the great privilege of going to the classroom of my Ochi fellow, Schwa Brazil, this afternoon. And she's in the audience with us right now with a couple of her students who happen to be pre-service teachers. So very relevant this conversation is today. And when we asked how many of the students in the class we're going into education, about three quarters of them raised their hands. So thank you so very much for the opportunity to be joined today by colleagues from Montana State University and the University of Montana Western to bring you back to a conversation that started in May of 2016. At your board meeting that year in Haver, you heard from a group of Highline superintendents about their educator recruitment and retention challenges. You issued a call for our office to work with our campuses to do everything possible to support our K-12 partners in addressing the rural educator recruitment and retention issues across the state. As such, we put together a Montana University System Rural Educator Recruitment and Retention Task Force and went right to work. Today, Madam Regent, members of the board, I am very pleased to bring you this report summarizing the accomplishments of the task force. Before I highlight this work, I would like to thank our task force members for their time, dedication, and very thoughtful contributions and unique approaches to addressing this issue. These folks came from our MUS campuses, from Montana's private and tribal campuses, and from our K-12 community, including the school administrators of Montana, Montana Rural Education Association, Montana Federation of Public Employees, of whom we have representatives here today, the Montana School Boards Association, and the Office of Public Instruction. As you can see here by this list, in a very short time, the task force established new programs, advocated for successful legislation, and Board of Public Education rule changes, and developed pathways and other pipeline programs. For today's conversation, we will specifically discuss two points of our work. First, it is very, very important for you to know that when you issued the call to our campuses to recruit and prepare Montana students in their educator preparatory programs, our campuses delivered in a magnificent way. Next slide, please. What you're looking at here is Department of Labor and Industry data. And as you can see in the elementary, middle school, and high school level, all of the educator prep programs across the Big Sky State are producing more teachers than there has been a demand. So this slide right here is evidence of that delivery by your campuses when it comes to producing educator preparatory completers. So while we are overproducing generally, thanks to Dr. Tricia Seifert on this next slide, we can see that when we took a look at the Office of Public Instruction job openings posted between April 1st and 2019 to September 27th of this year, there were 31 content areas where there were openings. In all but four of them, the Montana Educator Preparatory Programs graduated more completers or just enough completers in all but four of them. The four where we did not meet the mark are listed right here. Business education, family and consumer science, music, and tech ed. You will hear momentarily from our panelists as to specific programs designed to address these specific content shortage areas, as well as continued efforts to address critical shortage areas identified in the annual OPI Educator Critical Shortage Report. The second effort I would like to identify from our accomplishments is the study with the regional education labs, the Office of Public Instruction, and our partners at RISE for Montana. As soon as our task force started its work, we embarked on two simultaneous parallel paths. To put it simply, we knew we didn't have time to wait, so we went to work getting things done while we also studied the issue. 
One path was to address pipeline and programmatic needs, which we did very aggressively. The other path was to carefully research the issue more thoroughly to guide our efforts and conversations with law and policymakers well into the future. As such, we partnered with the Regional Education Labs, the Office of Public Instruction and Rise for Montana on the Educator Mobility and Shortages in Montana study. And it is very appropriate that we get to have this conversation as we stand here and sit here this afternoon because we're joined by one of the key architects of that study and that's Dr. Jane Downey from Montana State University. Without her leadership, the study would not have been successful or possible. So what you have before you is just one piece of data that shows a need to support continued focus by our office and our campuses in doing all we can to support the Montana teachers we are preparing into rural communities across the state where significant challenges exist. So, Regents, bottom line, at your call, Montana's educator prep programs rolled up their sleeves and left no stone unturned in completing well-prepared educators all across the state. In fact, so many as you saw from the DLI slide that we are overproducing. Yet we know we have continued work to do in addressing content-based shortage areas as well as as well as developing continued programs that support grow your own learning models that will help our state in meeting our rural educator needs. So to hear more about what two of our campuses are doing in both regards, I will look to my colleagues on today's panel. Dr. Ann Eubank. There we go. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Lozar and, and Regents. My name is Ann Eubank, and I am an associate professor and the incoming department head for the Department of Education here at MSU. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about our response to your call to ensure that every child in Montana has access to highly effective educators. And I'd like to begin by playing a short video of our college's dean um, three years ago this week. A different kind of audience that I think we'd like to recruit into teaching are those who already have a degree in something that they're interested in. They have a foundation, they have, they have college preparation, and they want to change their career. So we'd like to be able to offer a Master of Arts in teaching that will allow career changers learn the pedagogy so that they can apply their foundation in the subject that they want to teach. This is another situation where we need to offer classes online, but we'd like to offer face-to-face -face components with teaching methods and supervising practicum and supervising student teaching. Okay. Well, here we are three years later and we did it. So, um, you know, we are, we are just um, over the moon um, with enthusiasm about uh, the progress that we've made in the service of the state of Montana. So. Um, we did take your call seriously, um, and, and in addition to the Master of Arts in Teaching, which I'll speak to in just a moment, uh, we really launched a three-year effort uh, that's become part of our department's identity and a major focus of our efforts in educator preparation. And we started with uh, two projects that have become ingrained in our teacher education program. So the, this is a little timeline here. So the first uh, thing we did was um, we established a rural colloquium, and so this is where uh, we invite superintendents and school leaders from rural Montana to come and speak to our, um, our student teachers who are just completing like the next week and walking across the stage um, to talk to them about uh, the joys and challenges of, of working in rural uh, Montana as a teacher and some of our um, students actually leave with a contract in hand. They get snapped up right away, and we're really proud of that. Um, our rural practicum, so uh, we've, this spring will be our third year for rural practicum. And these are um, students who uh, choose to uh, spend their spring break immersed in a rural school. And they spend a week uh, shadowing teachers and, uh, and instructing the students and working um, in small groups with these students. And it's a full immersive experience. They also um, take advantage of what the town has to offer and talk to the residents of, of the location. And um, the interest in this signature experience, um, our first year we 
um, we invited uh, some individuals to participate and uh, for this spring we have more interest than we have spots so it's catching on and, and we hear this um, in our engagements with our uh, pre-service teachers that the buzz that's been created around rural practicum like it is the place to be on spring break not you know not Fort Lauderdale yeah not Cali rural Montana and that's just great so um, additionally, as Dean Harmon indicated uh, three years ago, that we worked diligently to launch our Master of Arts in Teaching in summer of 2019. Um, our first cohort will graduate this spring of 2020 with credentials in math, science, social studies, and English teaching for secondary um, schools, grades five through 12. Um, this is an almost 100% online program, so, uh, so students can study and complete their field experiences in place. Um, and so the program's designed for folks who, who already live in rural Montana, who are career changers, who wish, wish to give back to their communities. And then uh, this January, we'll welcome our first cohort of um, K-8 elementary teachers and they will complete in spring of 2021. And so um, here's the best part of this, just the cherry on top. Uh, thanks to a five-year grant from the U.S. Department of Education, we will uh, now be able to train nearly 80 teachers who will commit to teaching in a rural high-needs school for two years. Um, our program will cover uh, tuition and fees through a living wage stipend so that teacher candidates can complete that unpaid field experience and that full semester of student teaching where they really learn how to be a teacher. Um, the grant will also provide two years of mentoring support. Um, we know that, uh, that teachers, we have a body of evidence that uh, demonstrates that teachers who receive strong mentoring support in the first several years of teaching tend to stay. So it's a retention issue as well. Um, and then the third part of this grant is that, uh, that will provide uh, school leaders and school boards with professional development on best practices for teacher recruitment and retention. And this is critical because we also know uh, that organizational climate is a determining factor on whether teachers stay or leave. Here's the most remarkable part of this grant. In addition to $3.1 million in federal, federal funds, our many Montana education partners contributed $600,000 through either in-kind or financial support. And so what, this, what I've learned through this process is when we roll up our sleeves and work together, we get things done for the benefit of all kids, and that's really the Montana way. Um, we take our land-grant mission to serve Montana very seriously. We're very excited to be part of the solution to ensuring that every child, whether they're from Bozeman or Two Dot, is prepared for college and career. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of the department. I'd like to thank you for your support. Uh, we're more than excited to continue to help build an infrastructure in Montana that helps us to meet this goal. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ann. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner, and uh, Regents. I am Vicki Howard, Professor of Special Education at the University of Montana Western. Even prior to the teacher shortage, the University of Montana Western was providing a variety of online and distance programs. Uh, for example, we offer online early childhood and PK3 programs and an endorsement in special education which is rated as the most difficult area to fill by state administrators, and business education, which is one of the four high needs areas mentioned by Ms. McLean. About four years ago, our phones started ringing off the hooks as willing but uncertified prospective teachers who were recruited by school districts to fill open positions sought a way to earn their credentials. We were offering some of the coursework online, but needed to uh, expedite, uh, create an explicit, streamlined program that met the needs of non-traditional learners who, will, who were already in the classrooms. Before we knew it, we had around 150 post-bac students in the pipeline 
Um, so we were absolutely building this ship as it was sailing. Even before the recent BOR approval, we had begun delivering the 29 credit post back certification with experimental coursework. And the, um, the certification areas that are delivered are uh, provided on the slide. So next, next slide, thank you. Uh, Grow Your Own reflects an acknowledgement that local communities may provide an answer to teacher shortages in rural and tribal communities by mining existing individuals who are unable to leave their community to attend college due to the cost of attendance and or family obligations. Preparing this local talent has the dual benefit of rising people up while increasing the likelihood of retention because individuals are already where they want to be. Since 2017, Montana Western has partnered with Blackfeet Community College, Browning and um, Heart Butte schools to co-develop and co-deliver teacher preparation for members of the respective communities. Most of our candidates were already working in the schools as aides, class seven language and culture educators or as provisionally licensed teachers. In two years, 32 indigenous elementary ed uh, educators earned their degrees and became certified through our program. All of these completers were hired by the Browning schools, dramatically increasing supply while reducing teacher turnover. We are now working on a second cohort and have over 40 indigenous candidates seeking credentialing in elementary education, special education, and secondary education. Due to their difficulty in filling teaching positions, Montana Western and Little Bighorn College were invited to partner, partner with Hardin Schools to collaborate on a replication of this grow your own model. Though we just started our planning in September, more than 30 applicants have already come forward wanting to be a part of the program to become certified teachers. Most of these candidates are indigenous. We will begin delivering classes in January. If all goes as planned, 15 of these applicants will be certified to teach by the spring of 2021. To finish, I'd like to tell a quick story that illustrates why this work is so meaningful. One of the questions we ask the candidates in the interview is, um, what do you need to do to put yourself in a position to be successful in the program? When we asked Lauren this question, she took a long time before answering, and then she said this, quote, I have been training horses for a living. My auntie told me about this program and said that I should, uh, should apply. I heard that you were only taking the top candidates, but I hoped that I would be selected. So I sold some of my horses and put the money aside to attend. We went hunting and bought, brought home some extra meat and put it in, uh, made it into dry meat so that we would have enough food. I put aside enough money to pay for internet service and bought enough gas cards to drive back and forth to class for at least three months." Unquote. And because of this partnership, Lauren and other candidates will get their chance and amplify their potential to serve children in Crow communities. Thank you. Two outstanding examples of what is happening as a result of your leadership and your prioritization of this very important conversation. And while you get to hear from these two, there are examples like this happening all across the state. And I'm looking specifically right now at you, Regent Tusk, because I have great data here from Montana State University Northern as well. Wonderful examples all across the state in our public institutions, our private and our tribal institutions alike. And I just want to signal one more time that the graduates from the very first Master of Arts in Teaching program will be in classrooms next fall. Pretty remarkable for sure. Thanks to both of you for being here today and for your continued leadership on this very important conversation. 
Finally, as our educator preparatory programs continue to do an outstanding job, as you just heard, in answering your call and preparing teachers, we know we still have work to do to support this effort, and presently our office is poised to work with our partners to take the study that I referenced earlier and the study upon which I will momentarily share with you a one-pager so you can take and read it and use it to guide future work at this table, but we're going to take that study and put it to work in guiding policies and legislation just as we've done already. We're also going to continue to monitor and address geographic and content shortage areas. And then finally, right now we are in the process of working with our partners to develop and roll out an advertising and a marketing campaign aimed at more rural educator placement. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity and we now stand for questions. Wow, thank you so much for such an incredible presentation and thank you for all of the work that you've done all over the state and partner, partnering with our tribal colleges. It's just so exciting to hear about. Thank you. Yeah. Any comments, Regent Sheehy? I have a question actually. Uh, of the accepted candidates, roughly what percentage are women? Uh, we are so excited, uh, especially at Little Big Horn College, that about a third of the candidates are men. Are you about the same? Um, we currently um, have nine candidates, and I am not entirely sure of their gender. Okay. One of the things I think is really interesting about this is that uh, it, all across the West, the rural tradition was to hire women teachers who then didn't get to keep the job once they had families. And I think it's so interesting that we're providing an opportunity for a second career for a lot of women out there. It's really exciting. Um, thanks for your work. It's just it's really, really, really gratifying. Regent Lozar. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just wanted to echo that, that last comment you made, Regent Sheehy, that you, you referenced uh, a meeting uh, three years ago, and you can go back even three and a half years ago, the meeting in Haver, uh, where we did have a panel that discussed incredible anxiety around what, what do we do in Montana around, I think at the time was 350 uh, jobs in rural Montana that needed to be filled. And obviously, um, quite quickly, you were able to, to respond and do it in partnership with uh, a, a long list of, of partners and making sure that um, that our, our young people in, in rural Montana have high quality teachers and they, they see themselves uh, eventually coming back to their rural communities. I think it's one of the things that is important as we look at uh, migration in, in and out of uh, rural Montana. Having strong teachers is one of the things studies have showed that keep people in their community and keep their communities vibrant. So your work goes well beyond what's happening in schools. It, it, it is preserving um, rural Montana. So we appreciate you for that work. Regent Tuss. Uh, I'd be remiss if I also didn't say thank you. Um, I remember the meeting three years ago, but I also remember the meeting that precipitated that meeting, which was in a small room in Robbins School in Haver with the superintendent for, for Haver, Fort Benton, Big Sandy, and North Star. Uh, and they talked to me about this crisis that I wasn't really aware of. And I said, well, let's, let's do what we can. Let's bring this crisis before the Board of Regents. And, and it just goes to show what you can do when you focus. It, it just goes to show when you put your heart into something, and I can't thank you enough and everybody involved in this effort. Thank you very much. Regent Miller. Again, to echo all of these comments, as somebody from a rural community not too far from Tudot, a <laughs> town called Judith Gap, Montana, this is so important to me and is near and dear to my heart. I'm excited to see where this program goes and. Um, just thank you so much for everything you're doing for our rural communities in Montana. Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, uh, Professors Eubank, uh, Howard, thank you so much. And, and Angela, thank you for your leadership uh, on this. Uh, I think I can invite you to uh, stay at the podium and give us uh, a brief update on the American Indian and Minority Achievement effort. But once again, thanks to all three of you for your leadership on this really important effort. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'll move quickly into the AMA report. I'd like to begin by 
Speaking quickly to a point that was made earlier by Ms. Flynn from the governor's office, our office had the great privilege of working with Ms. Flynn, with Jason Smith, Jason Smith and Katie Parsons uh, from the governor's office. And from our office, we had me and we had Shauna Albrecht and Ron Muffick. And really quick turnaround on an opportunity that would uh, help folks uh, get to a better place in uh, preparation for the high set and then ultimately taking the high set uh, in our uh, reservation communities. And so we quickly worked together, developed a plan, got that plan communicated to our tribal colleges, and then rolled those resources back out. And so I think that's a part of this access conversation that is so critical and so important. And I wanted to make sure that it's a part of our AMA conversation as we go forward. And then two other things. Uh, the first one is, at the request of the AMA Council, I've been talking about the Indian Education for All course that has been rolling out on our campuses. And I'm proud to say it now exists in a place and space on every single one of the Montana University System campuses. Now, additionally, at the request of the AMA Council, we now have an American Indian Student Success Dashboard. And the council recommended this. They talked about what ought to be components of it. So I brought that to my colleague, Mr. Eric Meredith, in the office of the commissioner, and he went to work. And so to walk you through the components of the American Indian Student Success Dashboard, I'll introduce you to Eric Meredith from the office of the commissioner. Uh, thank you, Angela, uh, Deputy Director, uh, Madam Chair, and members of the board. Um, so I'm going to uh, quickly go over this dashboard, and I'm not going to uh, dive too deep into the numbers so much. I'm just going to uh, show you some of the functionality here. Uh, this is available on our website, so I highly encourage you to uh, go in and take a look at it yourself. Um, but because of time constraints, I'm not going to go into the data too much here. Um, so. A lot of these are very similar to uh, some of the dashboards that you saw this morning from uh, John Thunstrom. Um, there's a little bit different functionality to some of them because they have a different purpose. Uh, so this particular one is just on the enrollment, but the important piece here is over here on the right, you can actually uh, select the different campuses that you'd like to um, uh, look at. and. Uh, Maybe the more important part here for this being the American Indian uh, dashboard is we can look at uh, by race and select any race that you would like to look at or any combination of them. Um, so, uh, for example, if I deselect one, it'll update automatically. I can add and uh, uh, get rid of as many as I'd like. Um, <clears throat> then down here at the bottom, it'll show you the actual numbers. And uh, one common theme that you'll see in some of these dashboards is that uh, I, I actually set it up so that you can see the American Indian counts and non-American Indian counts. And the reason it's set up that way is so that you can select as many of the different races as you'd like, and it'll give you the two counts to compare. Uh, so that's the common theme throughout all of these. This one here is just the enrollment counts. So the next one is uh, the um, retention rates, and uh, each one of these lines is going to be a, one of the uh, separate races. Once again, you can select which ones you want to see. The counts are down here below by American Indians and non-American Indians. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, I'm going to go pretty fast. If you're interested in the numbers, please uh, go in and take a look. <clears throat> the next one is the uh, BA graduation rates. Once again, the same type of thing. You can select by the race, by the schools. And the associates, graduation rates. Uh, <clears throat> completions, pretty much the same thing. The uh, difference here is you'll see some of the, uh, the bars have a slightly different color in the top. And that's the number of American Indians compared to um, non-American Indians. Uh, so these last three are the ones that I actually want to cover the most because they're a little bit different than what we've seen in the past. Uh, this particular one here is the uh, financial dashboard, and um, <clears throat> it shows for American Indian students the enrollments, the uh, count of students that had uh, Pell Grants, and then the count of students that actually took advantage of the American Indian tuition waivers. Um, so that's where the three different lines are. 
The key part on this particular uh, dashboard is you can select the term. And currently, the term is selected for all, so it includes students from the entire year. So some students will actually be counted twice because if they took the American Indian waiver in both the spring and fall, they'll show up twice. So that's why you may notice the enrollment counts here are almost 5,000 when really for, uh, if you look at one semester, which I can go ahead and do here, if I click on fall semester, now you'll see the enrollments are down to 2,000, which is uh, the number of American Indian students that we have in one particular semester. Next one is the employees, uh, same type of thing. You can look at the employees by uh, the race and by the location. The location in this particular uh, instance is by town. Um, one key that I do want to show on this one is for employees, uh, it is not required for the employees to actually tell us which race they are. And so there's actually a fair number that are in the unknown category. So there's something to keep in mind when you're looking at this particular dashboard. And then uh, this last one is, uh, if you're familiar with the sand key diagram, uh, that's what this is, and it's the transfers. Um, and when you first go to this particular uh, dashboard, it will, uh, it's already selected for only looking at American Indian students. And what's the, the schools on the left is the school that the student is actually exiting, and the schools on the right is where the student is landing currently. And if I hover over, for example, this one is the Montana Tribal Schools, It'll tell me exactly how many students uh, went to each individual school for uh, this particular fall. So last, uh, last year they would have been in a Montana tribal school. And so for example, we have 15 students here that went to MSU Northern uh, this fall that were American Indian students. So this is a very uh, interesting graph and very interactive. Um, like I said, I highly encourage you to uh, investigate all of this yourself. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to open it up for any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. Any comments or questions? Regent Lozar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is, uh, this is fantastic. I had the opportunity a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, to be a part of the American Indian uh, Minority Achievement Council when we developed uh, some of these core objectives. And to be able to see that you know, one of those discussions uh, and early, early on in the council discussions was um, what should we focus on um, and how the heck are we going to find this information? And it's pretty obvious that you guys have made significant progress um, in being able to track this. So this is, this is fantastic. This is a great for, thing for us to be able to refer to as, um, as we're continuing to have conversations around performance funding. And, and uh, I would... I would just, and we don't need to go there right now, but I would just uh, take, take a look at um, the difference between graduation rates uh, with bachelors and associates of arts, and um, you will see that we have a ways to go with our American Indian students. And I know, I, I'm confident that we're putting in the measures that we need to put in to make um, continued progress, but um, it'll be great someday to be able to see these bar charts on, uh, with equal patterns. Thank you so much. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm so happy we had a chance to hear uh, at some length uh, information on the rural educator recruitment and retention efforts, huge success there. The AMA dashboard uh, is such an important part of the equity question in the state and, and certainly tracking uh, some of this information is a first step towards making more progress. And so really happy that we spent some time on that. I do know that we are past uh, time uh, in, in terms of the ARSA committee. I would, with your permission, uh, draw the board's attention to our normal items, uh, level one uh, memorandum and the intent to plan proposals. There's information available um, uh, on our website with respect to program proposals that are coming down uh, the road. Um, I would request that we uh, postpone the report on e-learning. It's also a tremendously important area in terms of uh, access to rural students, underserved students, so much innovation there. I want to give that item the, the time that it deserves. We actually had a couple of individuals uh, uh, travel to the meeting in order to present, so I apologize to them, but I, I think that it's better given the airspace it deserves. So with your permission, I would postpone that agenda item until a later time. Yes. Uh,
with that, I think we have concluded the business of the ARSA committee. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to Chair Lozar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we are at this point in the meeting and the day that uh, we are going to focus on public comment. And I just wanted to uh, kind of go through a couple items. One, I wanted to underscore uh, a, a point that Regent Sheehy made uh, when we were looking at level two uh, proposals and that uh, this board very much values public comment and we use it to deliberate, we use it to better understand what's working, what's not working, and to get insights about uh, the work of the university system. So we very much value uh, public comment. Um, and just want to also make a note that uh, you, in addition to uh, providing verbal comment, you can also provide written comment. We have that process in place. Um, and then lastly, uh, we ask those who are going to provide public comment uh, to keep your remarks to a couple minutes. Um, and then if we, have, uh, we, if we have very, very similar public comment that uh, we ask you to go to the mic and um, uh, sh uh, share just the point that you uh, concur with the previous person who shared public comment. Uh, with that, um, can I just get a sense of how many people are interested in uh, providing public comment this evening? Excellent, perfect, yep. As is the case with all public comment, uh, it's a process not of Q&A, but uh, so we will not respond. Um, but again, like I mentioned, this is the opportunity for us to, to get feedback. So we very much appreciate uh, you taking the time to, uh, to join us today. Uh, with that, uh, we will open up the, this portion of the board meeting for public comment. If uh, you could come to the uh, podium and uh, please share your name. Uh, my name is Steve Stowers. I'm an associate professor at Montana State University. Uh, I want to preface my statement by saying that I am in favor of the CBN micro merger. While my statement raises serious concerns about the process by which we got to this point, it should be not, mis not be misinterpreted as opposing the merger. Shared governance establishes the foundation for the effective functioning of a university and depends on trust and cooperation between the faculty and the administration. Ideally, shared governance involves, putting, involves the, the putting forth of thoughts and ideas by both groups, joint discussion and debate of the merits of those thoughts and ideas, and charting the best path, path forward based on a group decision. What I hope can be learned from my statement today are the perils of the abandonment of shared governance using the events surrounding the Cell Biology and Neuroscience Department at MSU over the past year as a case study. Almost exactly one year ago, Provost Robert Mockwell presented a plan to then CBN Department Head Roger Bradley to radically transform the CBN Department into a school of human biology. Provost Mockwell's proposed plan would essentially turn CBN into a pre-med factory and convert the research intensive department into a service department focused almost exclusively on teaching. The provost plan was developed entirely by the administration with no input by the CBN faculty, an example of the faulty decision making driven by top down governance. Not surprisingly, CBN faculty led by Roger Bradley resisted this plan that would do irreparable damage to the CBN department. For exercising his freedom of speech and expressing a contrary viewpoint, Provost Mock will allow Roger Bradley to be removed as department head and replaced not with a member of the CBN department qualified to lead it, but rather with a member of the administration whose academic background is in Roman history. By disallowing another member of the CBN department to serve as department head, Provost Mock would deny the CBN faculty a role in the governance of their department. Provost Mock would never again allow the CBN department to have one of their own as department head. In late April, a student-initiated petition was delivered to Provost Mock was signed by over 500 students, including over 70% of the 300 CBN undergraduate majors. This petition essentially requested that the resources Provost Mockwood had withdrawn from the CBN department in recent years, mainly by declining to replace tenure track faculty who left, be restored so the CBN department could continue to deliver the high quality education it has long been known for providing. Two weeks later, once the majority of CBN students had left campus for summer break, Provost Mockwood dismissed the concerns raised by those 500 MSU students by announcing his decision to dissolve the CBN department and merge it into the microbiology and immunology department. Neither CBN nor MBI faculty were given an opportunity 
to express their views as to the pros or cons of the merger. It was forced upon both departments and had to be implemented immediately in the absence of any prior planning or organization. Provost Makwa's message to both students and faculty could not have been clearer. His governance of Montana St State University is based on fear and intimidation, not trust and cooperation. In addition to punishing CBN students and faculty for daring to express an opposing viewpoint, Provost Makwa's actions have also had a chilling effect of suppressing student and faculty voices in other departments, effectively sending the message that if they express any thoughts or ideas contrary to that of the administration, they will face similarly dire consequences. In this way, Provost Makwa has effectively quashed shared governance at Montana State University in favor of unilateral decision making by himself alone, i.e. autocratic governance. If your intuition tells you eliminating an entire department from MSU should not depend on the judgment of a single visual, individual, your intuition would be correct. Montana v University System Board of Regents Policy 218-1A1 states, the following matters require review and approval by the Board of Regents before they can be announced and implemented. Formation, elimination, or consolidation of a college, division, school, department, institute, bureau, center, station, laboratory, or similar unit. There is thus a required process codified in the Board of Regents policy that must be followed before department, before department consolidation. The reason the CBN-MBI merger approval is on today's agenda is that Provost Mockwa did not obtain the required approval for the Board of Reach from the Board of Regents six months ago before he implemented the merger, thereby abusing the power of his office. By blatantly violating Board of Regents policy, Provost Mockwa usurped the power conferred by the state to the Board of Regents and illicitly appointed himself judge, jury, and executioner of the Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience, in so doing denying due process to all the negatively impacted stakeholders. Ramming through approval of the merger here today ex post facto does not remedy the damage already done by the earlier denial of due process. The subject line of Provost Makwa's email to faculty announcing his decision to dissolve the CBN department was, important changes to strengthen cell biology and neuroscience. Provost Makwa's approach for strengthening, cell strengthening the discipline of cell biology and neuroscience was to dissolve the cell biology and neuroscience department. This strategy defies all logic and common sense. In addition to the faulty reasoning underlying this approach, CBN faculty were also surprised by Provost Mockwitz's merger announcement because we had been working in good faith with the administration throughout the spring semester. This included developing a five-year neuroscience doctoral plan to address the weaknesses of the CBN graduate program identified in the doctoral pri program prioritization the provost uh, has been citing as a justification for the merger. In February, three months before the merger, the provost signed the plan, thereby agreeing it was sufficient to address the weaknesses of the CBN graduate program. I would note that this is in direct contrast to what uh, Provost Mock represented uh, a little bit ago, where he said that the um, cell biology and neuroscience faculty were unwilling to recognize the weaknesses of uh, the report and, uh, and work to uh, address them. CBN faculty followed the plan to the letter during the intervening three months, including admitting three new doctoral students and submitting proposals for two graduate courses. Simply moving the CBN faculty to another department in no way addressed the concerns Provost Mock would use earlier to justify the merger. It is also unexplained why the other three departments classified as needs improvements in the doctoral program prioritization report were allowed to address their weaknesses with a written plan instead of facing dissolution or merger. For some non-transparent region, CBN was singled out for punishment by Provost Makwa. Now that we are actually six months post-merger, we can ask whether or not the merger succeeded in strengthening the cell biology neuroscience program. The most striking consequence of Provost Makwa's unapproved merger was the almost immediate loss of half the CBN tenure track faculty who either resigned their tenure or went on leave and are therefore no longer contributing to the education of CBN students. These losses include Roger Bradley, Steve Iger, Charles Gray, Thomas Hughes, and Ray, Renee Rehopera. It is naive to believe that these losses are unrelated to the denial of shared governance these faculty experienced in the months preceding the merger decision. Let's assess the current state of the CBN graduate and undergraduate program separately, starting with the graduate program. As a consequence of losing half the CBN faculty, the CBN doctoral program is now effectively in moratorium because the expertise necessary to educate graduate students across the various fundamental areas of neuroscience no longer exists at MSU. Enrollment in the neuroscience doctoral program will thus be decreasing for the foreseeable future. The reduced size of the CBN faculty also makes the neuroscience doctoral program less competitive 
for recruiting doctoral students in the CBN faculty less competitive for grant funding. By all objective measures, the, C the neuroscience doctoral program has been substantially weakened by the unplanned and unapproved merger. Prior to the merger, the administration actually had praise for the CBN undergraduate program. CBN undergraduates won numerous prestigious awards within the previous five years, including two Goldwater scholarships, two Truman scholarships, and there were two Rhodes scholarship finalists. CBN had the highest medical school acceptance rate of any department at MSU, 20% above the national average, and boasted the highest retention rate in the College of Letters of Science at 93%. Due to the faculty losses since the merger, there has been a substantial reduction in both the quality and breadth of undergraduate CBN course offerings. For the current semester, it was necessary to make five last-minute instructor substitutions to cover all CBN courses. In some cases, substitute instructors have no training in neuroscience. To give just one specific example, for the foundational course, Integrated Physiology by OH 185, with an enrollment of over 200 students, the current instructor has a PhD in anthropology, but no formal training in physiology. The use of instructors without formal training in the discipline in which they are providing instruction is a common practice at community colleges, but makes MSU an exception in this regard among R1 research universities. Integrated physiology is the key foundational course for the entire CBN major. Without a strong foundation in physiology, CBN students will not be able to master the material in upper level CBN courses and hence be less competitive for medical school. For the upcoming excuse, spring 20... Excuse me, Mr. Staros. If, if you could wrap up in about a minute, we do have several uh, other folks who would like to provide okay. some public Okay, for comment. the upcoming spring 2020 semester, at least four CBN courses have been canceled and two additional courses are without ins uh, assigned instructors. In his email announcing the dissolution of the CBN department, Provost Mock will promise there are no changes occurring to or planned in the curriculum of course offerings for the undergraduate cell biology and neuroscience academic program. It is a high quality program that will continue for current and future students. Provost Mako has broken his promise to CBN students. The loss of half the CBN faculty has also resulted in a commensurate reduction in available neuroscience research opportunities. Um, I will just say uh, the CBN undergraduate program wasn't broken before Provost Mako's merger decision, but it is broken now. Despite the loss of five CBN faculty over the summer, in addition to the two unfilled faculty lines from previous years, Provost Makwa has denied all requests to initiate searches for replacement CBN tenure track faculty. His decision not to replace lost CBN faculty is in effect a massive withdrawal of resources from CBN. With no CBN faculty searches occurring this academic year, there will be no new CBN faculty next academic year, and the best that can be hoped for is to maintain the status quo. In the meantime, any additional CBN faculty losses will result and additional CBN course cancellations or instructor substitutions. As a chief of academic officer of Montana State University, Provost Mock has demonstrated a failure of leadership with both respect to judgment and to the ethical standards expected for an officeholder of his stature. Provost Mock was hubris has resulted in the tragedy now being realized by CBN majors that their future careers are in jeopardy because they are being deprived of the expected high quality education that inspired them to matriculate at MSU and that has been a springboard for launching successful biomedical careers for 15 years. There are two simple lessons that, became, that can be drawn from Provost Mokwa's abandonment of shared governments in his handling of the CBN department over the past year. The first lesson is faculty have a limited tolerance for being denied shared governance. At some point, they simply walk away. The second lesson is decision making based on the collective wisdom and diverse perspectives of a group is superior to the unilateral decision making by a single individual. If the provost had sought and assimilated input from CBN and MBI faculty prior to announcing and implementing the merger, the outcome would have been far better for both students and faculty. I hope other Montana University system administrators hearing this will take these lessons to heart and won't have to learn them through firsthand experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Staros. Uh, other, uh, other, other public comment, and I'll, I'll again repeat, you do have the opportunity to uh, submit written uh, comments and we ask that you knowing how many folks are here to provide uh, public comment that you limit your comments to about two minutes and uh, please refrain from repeating uh, previously noted comments um, I'll say so uh, Commissioner Christian and and uh, Regents I would like to take a minute to uh, address some of the questions that uh, Regent Rogers raised in her questioning earlier so um, it's difficult to get everything into two minutes. There's 800 students involved in this, and I think it's important. Excuse me. Uh, could you state your name, please? I, oh, sorry. My name is James Mazur. 
And until last May, I was an associate professor of cell biology and neuroscience at MSU. Today, I stand before you as a member of MSU's Department of Microbiology and Immunology. I've been doing neuroscience research for more than 30 years at five different R1 universities. Before moving my lab to MSU in 2016, I spent 12 years on the faculty at Yale School of Medicine, where I taught undergraduates, graduate students, and medical students in the area of neuroscience and rose to the level of associate professor. In 2016, after careful consideration of both the strengths and weaknesses of MSU's neuroscience program, I made the difficult decision to leave Yale and join the CBN department at MSU. That decision was driven in large part by the tight-knit community of faculty and students, both graduate and undergraduate, working effectively together as a team. And the excitement for neuroscience I saw among the CBN students I met when I first visited here in 2015. Last week, when I first read the level two proposal under discussion today, a proposal developed without input from either CBN faculty or MBI faculty or students, I was shocked to learn that the provost's decision to eliminate my new home department as a freestanding academic unit was based solely on the results of the 2018 doctoral prioritization report. A report faculty were repeatedly told would only be used to help units improve and not to punish or eliminate programs at MSU. The report drew attention to the small size of CBN's doctoral program compared to other MSU programs, but failed to note that the size of MSU's program was actually comparable to other US doctoral neuroscience programs with similar sized faculty, and that students in the program were almost 100% funded by external grants, costing taxpayers virtually nothing. The report's findings came as no surprise to me last fall. In fact, one of the things that brought me to MSU in the first place was the opportunity to help grow a small but effective doctoral program, something to turn it into something more sustainable and potentially more interdisciplinary. In fact, I discussed the matter with CLS Dean Ray when I visited and then VPR for research, Dr. Rio Hapera, during my first visit to campus in 2015 and was pleased to find them receptive and enthusiastic to support my efforts in that direction. After the report was released, my CBN colleagues and I worked closely with Dean Ray and the graduate, student, graduate school dean, Ron Larson at the time, to address the administration's concerns, primarily the overall size of the program. Between December 2018 and February 2019, we worked together to develop a detailed plan to increase both enrollment in the neuroscience doctoral program and the number of graduate level courses, course offerings over the next five years. This would directly address Provost Makwa's stated concerns. On February 19th and 20th of 20, 2019, Provost Makwa, Deans Ray and Larson, and representatives Excuse of the CBN. Excuse me, Mr. Major, if, if I will, you I'll, could uh, I'll wrap try to up wrap, your, up. wrap up your comments. Uh, we signed the new plan into effect. The CBN faculty and deans were excited to move forward with the plan and with the encouragement of both deans and Provost Makwa, CBN immediately accepted new students. And I'll, I'll give you guys a copy of the plan. Uh, yeah, Mr. Major, the um, uh, Ms. Unsworth here has a form that you could fill out and, okay. and provide. Uh, I'll do it. The rest I can do it after. I'll do it after testimony. Uh, so um, we have spent uh, about four minutes, and I want to be. Uh, I want to be. Um, I will try to sure that me, we have enough time for the rest of the folks that are providing uh, public testimony. Okay. Let me let me just let me just make a couple of points, and then I'll I'll leave. Okay. So. As I stand, as I indicated, today I stand before you as a member of the new merged microbiology and immunology department, a diverse biomedical department that includes microbiologists, immunologists, virologists, cell biologists, and neuroscientists, a department now responsible for teaching more than 800 MSU undergrads annually and for providing cutting edge research opportunities for those students, both in the lab and around the world. Although you will vote tomorrow on whether or not to approve the merger, for the remaining five professors from CBN and the original 19 MBI faculty, the 300 CBN students and 400 MBI students, this merger happened six months ago. Make no mistake, over the past six months, the faculty of both departments have come together to address the problems caused by the unplanned and prematurely announced merger. In what, despite what people might say or think, CBN and MBI faculty are excited about the opportunities this merger could bring but it's not all roses. CBN faculty are still stinging from comments made by Provost Makwa to our students and colleagues, and we are unhappy about the unfair and dismissive treatment of our majors, MSU's actual customers, 
that they received last spring at the hands of the Provost and President Cruzado when they respectfully expressed their concerns about the future of their major. Both CBN and MBI faculty remain concerned about the, the lack of transparency and process violations that occurred here, and we remain concerned about whether or not there will be a commitment to neuroscience and CBN majors moving forward in the new unit. I'll just summarize here and say that there is no going back. The merger happened. I believe I speak for most, if not all, my former CBN and new MBI colleagues when I say that I support this merger. I recognize its potential. But that potential can only be realized if the MSU work administration decides to work in partnership with the new department and invest in the necessary resources and support to ensure the long-term viability of the merged unit. I hope you will consider using this opportunity to encourage the administration to address this crisis situation in a timely fashion so that we as faculty can continue to provide the high quality and effective biomedical training and research opportunities Montana students have come to expect from MSU CBN major. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Major. Uh, it's actually Dr. Mazur. Dr. Mazur. Uh, I'd like to invite additional public comment and I will again underscore um, limiting comments to two minutes. We do have quite a few folks who are wanting to provide public comment. Um, I think we're gonna put a, a time, time up here on the clock so if you can uh, manage your time, that would be excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a copy of my statement um, in case I don't finish. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. My name is Ann Parker. I'm a current ASMSU senator here at Montana State Bozeman, representing the College of Letters and Science and a senior cell biology and neuroscience student. I want to first say that I'm here on my own volition. I was approached by Montana State student body Vice President Sophia Elias last week about providing some actionable suggestions to Regent Miller as to how the CBN concern can be represented at this Regent's meeting. First, let me express my gratitude to Regent Miller that he would even ask before I dive into how I think the merger could be supported going forward. Throughout the process of this tense matter last year, we as students felt that our voices were stifled, silenced and swept under the rug. That Regent Mel Miller would even ask how he can support us feels like progress, and we are very appreciative. I would like to begin by saying that we support the merger going forward. If it were to fall apart, the CBN program now lacks the infrastructure to survive independently of the microbiology and immunology department due to the number of faculty that re retired or are on leave. On a more positive note, it provides a promising opportunity for more interdisciplinary study and research and more overlap in curriculum from across the realm of cell biology and neuroscience and microbiology. A new upper division course, neuroimmunology, being offered for the first time this coming spring is a good testament to that. Further, CBN students appreciate so much the support and warm welcome we've received from the MBI department thus far. Moving forward, the program on the whole needs more support. Students are concerned and frustrated about the future of their studies and feel that the rigor and richness of the CBN program has slipped as a result of faculty departures. We were promised that the curriculum would remain strong and intact, and yet four upper division classes, cognitive neuroscience, human pathophysiology, gene expression, and global health and diseases are no longer being offered. Classes that many of my classmates and I looked forward to taking in their college careers. Further, global health and diseases is a required class for the popular global health minor. Many other classes are being taught by fac MBI faculty, and though they have the requisite expertise to teach those classes, it certainly puts additional stress on a program Hello, that was Parker. already stretched Parker, thin with existing teaching uh, obligations. If um, you wanted to wrap up your comments and provide the, the rest of the written testimony, we would, we'd sure. accept that as well. Thank you. Um, uh, these issues can be ameliorated, however, uh, we're, and we're hopeful for the future to replace some of the faculty that left and supplement the faculty from MBI. Tenure track professors that can teach upper division neuroscience classes with expertise and, dis and precision are desperately, desperately needed. Dr. Mark Judela has made requests for two neuroscience hires and thus far has been denied. I know that the process to get tenure track faculty is a long one, and so in the interim, um, hiring of non-tenure track adjunct faculty could help close those gaps, but with one caveat, these professionals' time and expertise is very valuable and must be treated as treated as such. So if there could be some impl implementation of a sliding scale um, to pay these individuals relative to their expertise and their quote unquote market value, I think that that could be very positive. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Additional public comment?
Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Colette Campbell, proud public employee for MSU Bozeman for 11 years now. Go Cats. And uh, also the president for MSU Bozeman's Federation of Public Federation of Classified University Staff. Um, I'm here today with an invitation, actually. Um, in 2017, the Board of Regents passed a policy uh, that said no employee would be, would be paid less than $10.70 an hour. And I stand here and thank you for that today. Uh, classification titles and wage bans on our website show 21 job titles that pay $10.70 at the entry level wage. 55 classified employee job titles pay less than $12 an hour. Those are positions that require some kind of experience, education, background, training, knowledge. At this same time, uh, Montana State University Alumni Foundation is advertising for students at $11 an hour. Dishwashers are being advertised for in the community for $15 an hour plus benefits. City and county employees are being advertised for $17 an hour, full benefits. Door dash delivery will pay $18 an hour. <laughs> It th some, th some people would say this is unique to, to Bozeman, that this is Bozeman's deal. UPS is advertising for positions in Billings, Bozeman, Kalispell, and Wolf Point, of all places, for $21 an hour. On our MSU Bozeman jobs page. Ms. Campbell, if, if you could wrap up your comments. Thank you. Thank you. On our MSU Bozeman jobs page, there are 86 positions open, but eight of those positions are pools of employees. They are asking for pools of employees, not just one employee for those positions. Our invitation is for you to follow along with our labor management committee, our statewide labor management committee, as they tackle their first task of studying these wage bans. And check in with our, check in with our cuffs committee when you meet later and, and see how that, that progress is going along. Complaining is finding fault. Wisdom is finding solutions. That was Ajahn Brown. Go Cats. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Hello, I have my remarks timed to three minutes, so hopefully we keep within that. All right. Hello, my name is Emma Folkerts, and I am a senior at MSU combining political science, economics, and sociology in the directed interdisciplinary degree program. First, I would like to thank all of you for being here. I'm sure it's been a very long day, um, so thank you for your attention. I pursue a career in human rights. I am the director of the Heart Initiative, which is a student organization that works to raise awareness and combat human trafficking in Montana and beyond. Human trafficking is exploitation for sex, labor, organs, through force, fraud, or coercion. I am here today to raise awareness and take action to address exploitation in MSU's supply chains. Individuals, consumers, the United States government, corporations like Patagonia, and universities face the risk of funding violations of human rights via the goods and services we use on a daily basis. My senior thesis addresses exploitation in MSU supply chains, and through partnerships with the Heart Initiative, MSU procurement services, and interviews with many stakeholders on campus, I'm identifying opportunities for more ethical practices. Harvard and the University of Michigan have recently funded reports examining their supply chains. They identify food, electronics, and clothing as major risk sectors for exploitation. Child labor, forced labor, human trafficking, child soldiers, withholding of wages, inability to unionize, harassment, document confiscation, excessive hours, unsafe working conditions, and other violations of international labor standards and human rights 
are known to exist at some point in the exceedingly complex global supply chains of universities. Even more, documents, uh, reports document abuses such as these happening even in the highly regulated supply chains of the United States government. Clearly, MSU too then faces a real risk of funding violations of human rights. In addition to teaching students in the classroom to lead ethically, universities must also respect ethical principles in the way they operate. Universities like MSU are thought-leading institutions and have a responsibility to create research that benefits humanity and furthers human rights. The benefits and work do not end at MSU. By extension, MSU has the potential to lead across universities. As a land-grant university, we Emma, teach... I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt, um, just to be making sure that we're consistent mm -hmm. with the previous folks that provided public testimony, if you could wrap up your comments. And again, yep, you'll be able to provide those to, uh, to Amy. So as a land-grant university, we teach, we lead, and we extend the benefits of education to change the world for the better. This is what we do. MSU has a responsibility to ensure that we do not contribute to violations of human rights and exploitation. We must operate according to our values. In your packet is a handout summarizing these issues and our goals, as well as my contact information. I encourage you to check it out, and I would love to connect with you moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Additional public comment. Hi, my name is James, and I've been a, a business owner in this community for almost 20 years. Back in the day, you people and those that sat before you begged the business community to support you and to support this university, and we did. Back when nobody wanted to live in Bozeman, back when wages were horrible, even worse than they are now, nobody wanted to live here. Nobody wanted to go to school here. Your enrollment was down. Kind of easy these days. You worked hard, and thank you very much. You've done a good job in bringing the enrollment up. But everyone, 10 people a day are moving to this valley. People are knocking down the doors to get into this university. You have still got to play the game fair. What Dr. Stower said, somebody's lying. Somebody is lying. Either Steve and his department is not standing straight, or you guys aren't giving us the straight. Something is causing a divide between reality and truth, and falsities and lies. I haven't heard the answer yet. But my question, although this will not be answered by you, who's in charge of finding out who's telling the truth? Not who's right or wrong. That's not what matters. Is what matters is are you people, are you gonna stand up for the truth and find out what the reality of that truth is? Who is telling the truth? Either people got pushed out, moved out, or left because the writing was on the wall, that their jobs were gone, or there was no jobs lost. Anybody have any answers for that? As a business owner, you owe this community to find out what that answer is. You owe it to me for begging me for support for 20 plus years. And now, you can't even get stand, get stand up and answer any of the questions. I haven't heard any rebuttals that are coming from you guys. And that's not saying that the department is right or wrong. And that's not saying that you are right or wrong for dropping this whole freaking program. That's successful. Let me ask you guys, you're educated, you have kids. Do you want your kids to go to pre-med at MSU? It's a broken department now. There is no pre-med program in reality. Are you willing to swallow that, take that home, and explain that to the public? Because I'm telling you what, if your kids want to go to pre-med, you're not coming to MSU. It's a broken program, period. I understand, and I'll stop here. Two parts to a good university, in a successful town, in a successful university. Student enrollment, you guys get an A for, thank you. Bozeman Town is building like crazy. I understand what you've done to do that. But you want to see a universal crumble, university crumble real quickly? You start eating away at the quality programs and getting rid of doctors. People who have their doctorate, for God's sake. You're willing to put them out on the street and say goodbye. I ask you one last thing. 
do the investigation before you make up your mind on this, on this uh, determination that you've already come to and give us as a community an explanation for who's telling the truth and who's not because somebody's not being straight. Thank you, James. Uh, additional public comment. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Colin King, and I'm a senior cell biology and neuroscience student at Montana State University. Six months ago, I stood before you with my peers, pleading that you take action to support our major. We warned that we feared and expected a decrease in the quality of our education and career prospects in the face of the proposed hasty merger of our department with microbiology and immunology. We described a widespread concern in our department over the lack of administrative support we were experiencing. We stood before you worried. We feared that again our voices would be ignored. Today I am again joined by my peers, pleading that you take action. It has since been six months. Looking back, our warnings and fears have been realized. There has been turmoil and anguish as we scramble to pick up the pieces of our education and career trajectories. We, the students, feel that we are undervalued in the eyes of the administration. We fear that our needs will again be ignored. I am speaking today in the hopes that this time I will be heard. I understand that the potential exists for students to benefit from this merger. Unfortunately, the way the merger was conducted does not promote the success of either department. Every individual from either department who has spoken up, faculty or otherwise, has stated the necessity of additional support and resources from the administration. I am not proposing that this merger be reversed. What I am proposing is that first of all, the administration be taken to task for the careless way this merger has been accomplished and that the administration be firmly instru instructed to rapidly mitigate the damage that has been done to the students of CBN. Mm -hmm. Then the process by which the merger took place should be carefully and critically analyzed in the hopes that Montana State University and the Montana University system as a whole can avoid going through such a damaging and poorly structured process again. Furthermore, I think that the records of those responsible for this upheaval should reflect that responsibility. Finally, I am proposing an amendment to the budget neutrality of the level two proposal and requesting that it be changed to include assurance that the merger will be given the resources needed to ensure success. This must put the highest priority on filling empty faculty positions with qualified professors and on replacing those current professors who as a result of unfamiliarity with the material they are teaching or inadequate teaching competence are degrading our educations. Our voices were not heard six months ago. Please listen to them now. We are the students of the Montana University system, as is your duty. Please support us now. And I have the rest of my comment to turn in. Thank you, Mr. King. Additional public comment. And how many more folks do we have um, interested in doing public comment? OK, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Alessandra Miller, and I am a cell biology and neuroscience student at Montana State University. I would like to address you, the Board of Regents, regarding, regarding the merger of cell biology and neuroscience into the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. But first, allow me to clarify myself. I am not here to contest the merger, nor beseech you to reverse the merger. I am not here to speak on the behalf of faculty, nor the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. I stand before you today to address the failures of the Montana State University administration to uphold promises to students in cell biology and neuroscience regarding the merger. On May 15th of 2019, we received an email outlining promises that would be upheld in regard to the merger of our department into microbiology and immunology. The rest of my comments describe in detail how none of these promises were upheld. These promises include that our experience as students would be enhanced. They promised us that our courses would be continued, research opportunities increased, our degree would, quote, remain part of the College of Letters and Science, and finally, that the merger would strengthen and stabilize our degree. As a student, I've experienced the realiz realizations of none of these promises. As a student, I'm astounded that the administration presents the merger as being successful and is still ad advertising it as such to incoming students when the degree and its students are clearly suffering. So I address you, the Board of Regents, a body that is supposed to act on behalf of and for the students of the Montana University system, students like me, to hold the administration 
of Montana State University accountable for the promises it made to cell biology and neuroscience students. The administration is not supporting the degree as it claimed it would. Thus, I ask you to ensure that my degree is supported. The degree needs resources, specifically cell biology and neuroscience qualified faculty, so that the classes and research can be restored and our decree continued. If these resources are not provided and the trend of this administration's decisions continued, the degree, along with its students, students under your supervision, will suffer. If no action is taken, Students like me will have to seek our education elsewhere at other programs, not at this university. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Additional public comment? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Austin Wyatt, and I'm a first year cell biology and neuroscience student here at Montana State University. I came to MSU because an introductory brochure, my first mail, show data that research opportunities would outweigh any other school I applied to, that the year of undergraduate research would greatly benefit me. I came to MSU because it was reported by the university that it had a medical school acceptance rate higher than the national average, and that I would learn at a more advanced level than other colleges. I was greatly anticipating all of what the school had to offer me and still have aspirations that can be met, but I feel as if there are some issues that need to be addressed before certain expectations can be reached. One such fear that I have is regarding the merger of CBN and MBI and how it will affect the rest of my years as a CBN student. It was claimed that the proposed merger would result in no cancellations of classes, yet classes such as gene, gene construction, a class essential to the genetics minor that I intend to pursue, is no longer, are no be, longer being offered. The removal of this class from my future education frightens me that the education I have been promised is lacking the structure I believed it to be founded upon. If the merger had less of an impact on the classes available to me as a student, then I'd have less of a concern. However, I feel as though student voices are not being addressed to the level that they deserve regarding this merger because the students are the people with the educational burden on their shoulders because of the lack of courses they can take in the future. The impact lies upon the students and their concerns seem to be overlooked. My greatest concern is relating to one of the introductory courses I am taking. The merger left a foundational course for CBN without a professor. This vacancy was hastily filled with a teacher whom I believe to be unprepared for the position which could damage the infrastructure for my future as a student. I'm worried about not just my own grade in the course, but the class average as a whole. Almost daily, I've observed several students walking up to my professor's desk before lecture to get a drop form signed. I understand that dropping a class is a common occurrence, but the rate at which it is happening at this introductory course strikes me as anything but natural. I find contradictions in notes and lectures and don't receive adequate clarification when I inquire about these issues, which adds to my personal confusion and that of my peers. This is worsened by the professor stating that the material that they teach is correct when information sourced from the NIH or accredited medical schools clearly state otherwise. This confusion is what I believe to lead towards the vast amount of students dropping the course. The knowledge I am to obtain from this class is foundational for the rest of my time here as a student at MSU in my designated major, and I can foresee the negative impact that I will struggle through in the coming years through the confusion and constant need for clarification that I desire. Um. I am worried not only about how this class grade will be seen in my future as a student, but also about the education that MSU has to offer me as a whole, and hope to see a resolution favoring the students of sub CBN. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wyatt. Additional public comment? Hello, my name is Chelsea Kessel, and I am another um, senior here at MSU that's studying cell biology and neuroscience. I also would like to discuss the merger that occurred um, this past semester. So as a lot of my colleagues have already said, there was a lot of issue. I felt like there was a lot of secrecy and I felt like the administration was not honest with us. I myself had met with Dr. Cherry several times last semester to discuss the fate of our department and I was told over and over that there would be no changes. Unfortunately, that was not true. Today, I come to you and I'm asking you to please consider, I'm not asking to, re or to undo the merger as I do see the possibilities that are associated with it. However, I do think that the way that it came about was unfair to the students and the faculty. I feel as though we were lied to and I would like that to be addressed. In the future, I would appreciate if something like this were, to go, or were going to occur again, I would like to see that the students were involved and the faculty were involved. Rather than telling us nothing was going to change and that everything was going to remain the same, I would like to be told the truth. I think that most of us actually would have been interested in learning about the merger and I don't think you would have gotten nearly the pushback that you've received if it had been clearly 
stated all along. Um, as many of my colleagues have said, due to the merger, there's been a rush to fill in some positions, and unfortunately, I feel like that's giving a lack in education. We do have a very rigorous course, and I think that's a huge um, reason why a lot of our students are accepted into medical school, and I don't want to see that lost. I've had a great respect for our school up until this year, and I'd like to continue that respect, so I hope that moving forward, we're able to fill the positions with people that are appropriate to teach the courses. And I would also like to say um, that I would like to have the classes that are being canceled because of this merger reemerge so that our students have the opportunities that we were presented before. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Kozel. Additional public comment. Board, Commissioner, uh, my name is Scott Killian and as of May, I graduated with a BS in Cellular Biology and Neuroscience with a minor in Global Health. I actually came to Montana from Wyoming because of the Neuroscience program. <coughs> While a student, I represented my college as an ASM senator for three years. Some of you might even remember me as we had conversations a couple years ago about adding the student recreational facilities fee and um, that ended up funding the turf field. Anyways, a lot of what I was planning to say has already been said, and so that's why I just rewrote some stuff on my phone. <clears throat> and so I would like to share my personal experience. Starting last fall, I started hearing from my peers that were considered the, uh, that the department, oh goodness. Starting last fall, I started hearing rumors from my peers about changes to my department. Then came the articles and the chronicles that everyone probably knows about, and I really wanted to try and find the, stu the truth as a student representative. And so a meeting was set up between me, uh, another student, the president, the provost, the dean, and the interim department head. At that meeting, I was assured that my department would not become a school, and I took that <coughs> as reassurance um, that everything would be okay. I ended up spending the rest of my um, spring semester finishing up working um, as a student senator, senator on various projects, like getting our teachers a $15 minimum wage and didn't consider what I could do to help my department. However, when I was in Germany in May, I heard word from my peers um, that microbiology and immunology would be merged with cell biology and neuroscience. I don't know if I missed something at that original meeting, but I now believe that students were misled about the future of the department in order to keep them from taking action. I don't, do not mean to say that student government alone or myself could have solved this, but I am frustrated that we were never able to have a discussion. I am here today to ask that you have that discussion to make sure that this merger takes place in a way so that my department can get the resources they need to be successful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Killian. Additional public comment? Hi, uh, I'm Becca Thurn, and I am a senior in cell biology and neuroscience. Uh, I came to the school because I'm interested in neuroscience, and I hope to pursue, pr pursue a PhD, which now I'm very worried about, because if I have a person try to call MSU, and this merger doesn't go through, I'm gonna be, they're gonna ask about a department that doesn't exist. And then they're gonna ask to talk to a teacher that is no longer there. And that's gonna look really bad for me. So I am funding my education and I'm about $30,000 in debt. I'm a commercial fisherman and I work every summer to make sure I can come back here. And if you do not approve this merger, I'm worried that my degree will pretty much be the equivalent of recycling. So please approve this merger and please fund this awesome program full of awesome teachers. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Becca. Is there any other public comment? Any additional public comment? One last time, is there any additional public comment? Uh, uh, thank you all. Uh, that will conclude this portion of public comment for uh, today's meeting. It's been a, a quite a busy day, and um, again, I want to un underscore what uh, what I shared early. We we do appreciate uh, public comment from all those that provided that to us today. Um, I want to take a minute, and I'm going to pass pass it over to President Cruzado to. Uh, provide some insights on what to expect uh, the rest of the evening. There are a couple of events, I understand, that will be available. Um, and then tomorrow, we'll, we will start again tomorrow morning uh, here in the sub at uh, 8.30. President Cruzado. Regent Lowe's are members of the board. Thank you so much for a very good and productive meeting. Um, you and the rest of, uh, of our audience here, uh, our campus affiliates and, and colleagues are invited to join us for a brief reception. 
Uh, I apologize beforehand. The reception is not taking place as uh, last uh, time you were here uh, by acclamation in the pool of Romney Hall. <laughs> because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's closed for construction now. So a second, uh, a second alternative, not as exciting as that option, um, would be for us to meet in the Inspiration Hall in Asbjornsen Hall. Um, we have students uh, in the College of Engineering ready to assist um, with providing you with some tours of the building if you're interested, any of you, not only our regents but all our campus colleagues. So we look forward to uh, seeing you at that reception that we have prepared with a lot of care. And if I may, I just want to recognize uh, the incredible work of uh, Emma Dykstra House and Maggie Hayes in making all these events flow so, so smoothly. Thank you so much. Thank you, enjoy your night, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.30.